methane. The inert gases, which are used in a lot of industries uh, to establish a non-reactive environment to do uh, very precise uh, metal working, that kind of thing, so helium, argon, xenon, um, those are all potential sources of, uh, of a simple exposure. Respiratory irritants, as I mentioned, these are the largest group of uh, chemicals. And this is just a listing over a, a number of years of exposures that have happened in the United States where or there have been releases, uh, and as unintentional releases to the air, uh, generally air for these compounds. Uh, and, and this, uh, in the first column, there is the name, name of the compound. The second is the uh, number of exposures over this uh, five to six year period. And in parentheses are the number of deaths that occurred uh, with those um, accidents or, or uh, releases. And the areas that I've uh, highlighted are all um, respiratory irritants. So these are the, some of the most common uh, agents that we have exposures to in an industrial basis, and the, then it gives you an idea of the magnitude of, of those exposures. But we'll go through a few examples of, of some of those that are on the list. And the ones that, or the way to differentiate them, most importantly, is, is on this, this slide. So the things that have high water solubility are going to cause symptoms early because when you are exposed to it at the mucous membrane of the eye and in the nose and in the throat, you're going to be irritated. They generally have a, a good warning properties because of that. Sometimes it's just the irritant nature, but often it's also the, the odor associated with them as well. And they will cause mostly upper airway injury because, uh, or irritation, because you're going to get out of the environment if you can. Now, if you're trapped or if you're unable to extricate yourself, then you will end up with delayed, or not delayed, uh, on lower airway injury as well because you'll keep breathing them in and out. But these are often agents that, that have uh, sufficient warning properties that people will notice them at very low concentrations and then get out, but they're irritated enough they'll come and seek care. But you want to know the people who you need to provide a lot of time and attention to from those that are just crowding because they're worried, because they've smelled a bad smell, or because their eyes are irritated and running, uh, and, and not get distracted by the, by the very large number of people that come with very mild symptoms. That's in contrast to those agents that have low water solubility, where people will often continue to breathe them in and out during an exposure, uh, during a fire, uh, during a workplace exposure, or a, or a, a common source uh, in, in a large uh, building, for example, because they, the agents do not dissolve in water very well, and therefore they're not irritating. And if they don't irritate, people won't recognize that they're causing injury or damage, and they'll continue to breathe them in and out. And as they breathe them in and out, they're carried down deeper into the lungs for a longer period of time, multiple breaths, and that will result in injury predominantly to the lower airway, so uh, more pulmonary injury. The, the clinical marker of somebody with, a, with an exposure to high water solubility, if they've had enough time to get uh, some significant exposure, is going to be the inflammatory response at those surfaces. So they'll end up with red eyes, tearing. They'll end up with uh, wheezing because of noisy lungs, because of the of the re response to the bronchospasm, as well as the, as well as the increased uh, airway water. The hallmark for people who come in with low water solubility exposures is that they've got hypoxic symptoms because they now are having a progressive inflammatory process in their lungs, which often is presenting with either pulmonary edema or fibrosis, depending on the delay. <clears throat> and they will show up with uh, decreased exercise tolerance, a uh, cough potentially, and, and then findings on auscultation and, and x-ray. So very different presentations. These are just some examples. So as a, as a school teacher, uh, this is a woman who came in to, to see me complaining of chest tightness uh, after she'd been cleaning up the classroom. She said that she'd mixed a couple of cleaning agents and scrubbed some desks to get rid of some graffiti that people had put on the desks. And when uh, doing her review of systems, she mentioned that she had some eye irritation. Now, normally when people come in saying to triage, I'm having chest pain while working, people are kind of 
channeling towards the idea that this is a cardiac complaint. I was working, I got chest pain, sounds cardiac. So she had an EKG, she had a pulse oximeter, she had her vitals taken, and then she was, she was in a room. EKG didn't show anything. And the, it was only when, um, you know, I actually wasn't thinking of a chemical exposure particularly, but I was asking her, well, if you got chest pain, and EKG look okay, you know, maybe this is a viral thing, uh, maybe it's pleuritis, you know. So you have any other symptoms, you know, been having a cold, a sore throat, your, you know, anything else? She said, sore throat, well, the throat bothers me a little bit, but my eyes are really stinging. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe something else is going on here. And once we asked uh, what she'd done, she told us that she had taken, uh, which two cleaners do you think she took in, in order to mix them together and cause a, an exposure to an irritant? Oh. Right, so she got exposed to chlorine gas, but, yes. So exactly, so she took bleach, you know, sodium hypochlorite, right? And then she mixed it with an acid and she liberated chlorine gas. So she was scrubbing while inhaling a, a war gas. You know, not a good idea, but that's what she did. So, and she did fine with just a, a, a little ventilator, a, a little albuterol. Uh, it, we irrigated her eyes because they were symptomatic. She didn't have any uh, you know, corneal injury, but she was uh, just mildly symptomatic. Can I uh, make a comment? Two. We had a case about two weeks ago. I was working a shift with Dr. Tarwat Zahran at the American University of Beirut. Uh, it was an Ethiopian woman, came in with severe respiratory distress and wheezing. So uh, she required immediately a BiPAP. So, she, and she was, so there was a language barrier, and now you have a mask barrier, <laughs> you know. And, but they could tell from her that she was not asthmatic, you know. Then we found out that she was cleaning. I said, what were you doing when this happened? And when she stabilized a little bit, she was cleaning, but that's not always, as, as, so that's not enough because we know we said, what were you cleaning with? <laughs> so she said what she was cleaning, we had to go uh, find out what the ingredients were. So we sent her uh, a family member to the supermarket to go get us the product that she was using. It's a famous product in Lebanon called Yes, Klitib Wahad. You've heard of it? And then the chemicals in there were not also the straightforward. It was, uh, it said anionic acid. You know, so it didn't tell us which acid. And the other chemical she was using contained uh, chlorxylenol. Chlor? Chlorxylenol. Chlorxylenol. So we assume that she released chlorine by adding an, an ionic acid with chlor-containing, chlor chlorine-containing yeah. xylenol compound. So, so, so it's not so always either, as simple as bleach. So either you can look up, you know, the agent and, you know, uh, call the poison center if you have access to look it up on, uh, you know, Google's almost always available, you know, try and see what the com chemical compound, or you can listen to the words, right, and we'll get into a couple examples of that. Chlorine, if chlorine is in the compound, it may, it is likely, not always, but likely to be liberated and then cause a irritant effect. Base, right? It's the potassium hydroxide. Yeah, and they mix it with the chlorine compound here. Uh, I've seen several uh, women coming in the uh, initiate uh, reaction, and they all come with this product that they did. So, yeah, so uh, I should mention. So, uh, so we've uh, just talked about so hypo sodium hypochlorite and an acid, right? Sodium hypochlorite and ammonia, that's chloramine, chloramine gas, which actually, in your airways, reacts with water, releases chlorine, right? But it also then reacts with the water to make hydrochloric acid, so, right? So, so at, the, the, at the end, you know, as far as the, your cells are concerned, you're being exposed to usually an acid, but sometimes a base. And just like with the skin, Strong acids and strong bases are not good, <laughs> you know, in direct mucosal or, you know, tissue contact. And to breathe something in that now is doing that right at the cell surface is a good way to cause, cause injury. 
Um, and, and you know, I should mention too that hydrochloric acid, right, sounds a lot like hydrofluoric acid, especially if you're communicating over a radio or if there's a lot of excitement going on about a potential exposure. And, but they're very different. Well, hydrofluoric, as, as Zian said, is, is a very weak acid. It doesn't dissociate much at, at low concentrations, but, but it will penetrate deeply to the tissue. Chlorine and chloramine are different compounds, but they act and behave somewhat the same. Um, there are others that we talk about that, that, you know, they just sound similar. So sometimes you can't even depend on the words that are being transmitted because they may not be accurate for what's actually going on. This is a little bit larger exposure, but the same kind of thing. This is uh, somebody who's getting the town pool ready and was now overcome by flumes. Well, getting a town pool ready is an important history to obtain because getting it ready means shocking it to to kill off the organisms that have been in over a period of time and when you come in when this person came in they have a noticeable odor because chlorine and its related products have a very noticeable odor and that odor is detectable well before it'll become an irritant but Trouble is, the staff are affected because they are seeing how sick the person is, and now they're also experiencing some of the same symptoms. <clears throat> Mild, but, they are, uh, but they're still experiencing. So the, you want to not only get the person out of the exposure, but get the exposure away from your staff. So taking off the clothes, doing a, a, a limited decontamination in order to uh, remove any uh, any uh, remnant is, is a reasonable thing. <clears throat> and that would be you know, this, this fellow. So coming in, he's got enough airway exposure that he's actually got edema at his face and eyes, which of course I've obscured his identity so he can't see his eyes. But airway edema also at the lips and the, and the throat. And you can't actually have people who actually asphyxiate because of airway, upper airway obstruction. And then if they have been trapped in an area long enough, they will continue to breathe in and out, and then you end up with a pulmonary edema pattern that, that's uh, depicted here. So this can also occur in large-scale events, right, because chlorine is, uh, is, a, is a major uh, uh, pr uh, production uh, chemical and is used in a lot, of, uh, a lot of industrial processes. So it's shipped by rail, it's shipped by tanker car, <clears throat> and then it's also put into storage vehicles, and this is just... Uh, actually, if you want to take a look at this, this is a, the uh, uh, Chemical Safety Board's reenactment of an industrial uh, accident that occurred when uh, somebody delivered a tank car of chlorine and then force fit the connection into the wrong tank and ended up mixing the, the chlorine with acid. These are just examples of the tankers, and, and this is what can happen from an explosion. This was a, I think these were 20. This is either a 20 or a 30 ton release of chlorine that was done with a, which, uh, an, an exercise that was called uh, jackrabbit to try and look at how these clouds uh, and plumes actually propagated and the effects they'd have. And this is a, immediate, a, shot, uh, a picture immediately after the release. And this is as the cloud spreads. And you can notice the color. So if people describe the colored cloud, as you were mentioning, uh, to you know, a yellowish cloud, it almost always means chlorine. As, as with the example of the mustard agent, though it might not only be chlorine if other things are mixed in with it, but that's a chlorine cloud and you don't want to breathe that in. Even by the time it disperses and the color lightens a little bit, that's still a, a lethal concentration of chlorine. <clears throat> so you would not want to be out in that. You know, it's actually, they have a monitor measuring on inside of that vehicle that's the roof that's shown there and uh, of, of sheltering in place in a vehicle with the windows up and the fence closed, it is a relatively protective thing, but it's all relative. You can still end up with an injurious concentration if you stay there too long. All right, so water-soluble respiratory irritants usually lead to escape because of the warning properties that you will experience in your upper airway, but it can get to be more serious than that. Treatment is pretty much irrigating the eyes, bronchodilating, but mostly getting people out of that area and ammonia, chlorine, sulfur dioxide, uh, phos uh, uh, formaldehyde, and methyl isocyanide, is, uh, as uh, Ziad was talking about with the Bhopal event uh, earlier in, in the day. 
So water insoluble respiratory irritants, they were also used as, um, as uh, chemical warfare agents in, in World War I, um, and that's the best example is, is phosgene. But it's also present in industrial processes um, and, uh, and farming as well. So you can end up, I'm mean, sorry, not phosgene, but you can end up with other uh, water insoluble irritants like uh, the oxides of nitrogen from a, a storage of wet, especially wet grain or, or silage. Uh, if, if, if farmers pull it in all quickly and then uh, are stirring it up to kind of dry it, the, the process uh, will lead to uh, oxides of nitrogen. And so those two different chemical compounds will also present somewhat the same way, which is a delayed onset of uh, respiratory symptoms. Um, again, I guess it's general rule, you never want to breathe things you can see. Uh, and this is a, is a, 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 a nitrogen uh, uh, dioxide exposure uh, from uh, a fire in the lower uh, um, picture, and this is actually a Russian, uh, everybody in Russia has, uh, you know, the, the dash cam, so you catch a whole, I don't know why that, well, I do know why that is, but that, so you catch a whole lot of video there, but this is a, a truck that was just um, leaking uh, nitrogen dioxide, and right behind that cloud is an apartment building. But you notice in the fire on the left here is people are not, you know, all uh, you know, running in, away from the visible cloud because it's not particularly irritating. And that you could see with, say, a, an old X-ray film uh, repository if that caught fire. And the reason for that is, and it's just a chemical uh, reaction that's shown here, is you do get some hydrolysis to hydrochloric acid from phosgene, but it's very slow, and it's not going to cause warning or, or development of, of irritant symptoms unless it's a very, very high concentration exposure. But what happens over a longer period of time is that that phosgene reacts to amine groups, which are present in all of your cells in things like DNA and RNA and, and proteins, and then they, they covalently binds them and then releases additional hydrochloric acid. So you not only get the dysfunction by your cell uh, molecules being bound together, but you also get additional hydrochlorine, hydrochloric acid uh, exposure. But because of that, the injury is uh, deep, and it's more slow in onset, and it's characterized by pulmonary edema over a couple of days time. And this just shows uh, one progression and kind of a poor x-ray, but the, uh, you know, the, 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 the development of additional infiltrates over hours that were not present earlier on after exposure. So summary for that is, is uh, just here. Again, bronchodilators sometimes have a role, but mostly it's oxygen supplementation, and steroids probably play a role if you give them early enough, as you would for other um, inflammatory lung diseases. And just to emphasize, this is the difference between the warning properties for the compounds and their actual uh, toxicity. So, the uh, listed uh, number down there, the acute exposure guideline levels, these are determinations uh, that, that uh, will identify time frames. So this is would be like 15 minutes before you would be exposed to a potentially life-threatening um, uh, dose at these given concentrations. So you can be exposed to 1,000 times more ammonia before it'll harm your lungs than you can for phosgene but you can't stand to be exposed to that much ammonia because it would be so irritating. Uh, so it's very, very noxious, but not as harmful in terms of uh, you know, lower lung injury, but phosgene is not gonna give you the warning properties. And that makes it a little problematic because people can get much more injury without being aware. So this is just a, a, a quick summary of, of some of those uh, agents we've talked about, ammonia, methyl isocyanate that uh, Ziad had mentioned with the Bhopal event. Um, and the difference, again, with, on this whole list is phosgene is a delayed onset, a delayed recognition, insoluble uh, irritant, while all the others are water-soluble, uh, more or less water-soluble. And then HF, or hydrofluoric acid, has additional systemic properties that Zia had already mentioned that, uh, that distinguish it from a lot of the others. 
And then Ziad had, a, had wanted me to include and, and actually provided many of these slides, uh, uh, some of the issues regarding other irritants that are unfortunately uh, a, a common source of exposure, a common source of, of uh, clusters of, of illness, and, and those would be the riot control agents. Um, or um, you also mentioned the smoke bomb. So, you know, so, and I'll, I, this would be important for, you know, again, the names of things. So, uh, Zia, this was a case report you guys had uh, put together with... Yeah. Uh, this with is a zinc chloride. And this was a uh, uh, person who was an illegal immigrant in the U.S., was running away from the police, hit in a stone drain, and uh, to smoke him out of the stone drain, the police used this uh, smoke bomb inappropriately. So he, went smoke to the, he went to the ER coughing and short of breath. They gave, uh, his x-ray was negative. They gave him steroids, antibiotics, and took him to jail. Came back within 12 hours in this, in this shape and form. Severe illness, 23 days intubated. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sm so smoke, smoke bombs, uh, you know, again, the, the importance of the names of products, you know, th those are usually uh, uh, zinc oxide uh, plus uh, a chlorinated hydrocarbon, so uh, hexachloroethane, right? So a very chlorinated hydrocarbon. Now, so you think, well, the chlorine, then maybe that becomes relevant. Zinc oxide is, I mean, that's, you can use that as a, as a protective cream on your skin, right? That's what could be the harm of that. Well, much like we think of, um, well, uh, for those of you who were here yesterday about the, the uh, lung injury associated with the cannabinoid uh, uh, vaping products, uh, you know, vitamin E acetate. Vitamin E is also just fine to ingest or put on your skin, but you probably don't want to be inhaling it into your lungs. So zinc oxide as well, you don't want to inhale grease into your lungs, but that's not the major issue here. If you combust zinc oxide and, and uh, hexachloroethane, hexachloro, now you end up with a chlorine exposure. So you end up with acute lung injury. Uh, and, and the combination is, is, uh, is no uh, better because you've now exposed yourself to zinc chloride. And zinc chloride is a very, is a very irritating product in a closed space. You know, in an open air, not so bad, but closed space, not so good. They use it for uh, smoking people out, for drills and for signaling. Yeah. So to, uh, to simulate like the fog of war, you know, fog of war, that kind of thing. It's, it's different than the riot control agents because it just, it's an obscurant. So it might be it will use it on the battlefield as an obscurant, um, but you could also use it, well, here, I guess. Yeah, well, so they're, the, uh, for, <laughs> we, we, uh, we prize our actors, so we try not to eat. In, injure them, I guess. So that's usually something, usually that's uh, something else. So uh, with you, or the stage scenes at, uh, you know, where you have the, the smoke, as it were, that's often, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember, dry ice can be used, so it can be carbon dioxide, uh, which again could be a problem if you had enough of it. But the, um, but the other, the smoke stuff that's used on uh, stage, I've forgotten what that is, it's usually not... Yeah, the pirate, well, not the pyrotechnic smoke, but the, just the stuff that's done for mood of, uh, or effect. Um, it can also be irritating insufficient concentration, and more so at the eyes. Uh, and we've had actually people who've gone out to dance parties and, and then have shown up with um, injuries to their eyes and, and skin where they've ended up, especially skin with a lot of, with water, you know, from tearing or, or in the creases. Uh, from from contact with with that agent. It's all a concentration effect, right? It's still dose. If you do that in the open air, it disperses, not much of a problem. You do that in a small space and people stay there, it can be more of a problem. So riot control agents, um, tear gas, isn't, it's not a gas, it's a solid, um, but it can be aerosolized or, or made into a more uh, dispersible uh, product. And these are just some of them. Um, the ones that we pay most attention to, well, the ones that we end up having most exposure to in our country are the, are the pepper sprays or the oleoresin capsicum, uh, which is mostly pretty well tolerated. I mean, it's an acute irritant, but it doesn't cause long-term effects. Uh, the CN and CS are a little bit more uh, problematic, uh, with CN being uh, more potent than CS but CS having a potential problem for a delayed onset pulmonary edema if there's been a sufficient ex exposure. Um, 
And uh, just, just, uh, this uh, paper, actually, if you want to uh, pull that, uh, the British Medical Journal from 2009 is, is a review of a, a number of these different agents and talks about the time to onset and the duration of, of uh, persistence or usual. Uh, sometimes that can be a little bit longer, especially if it's, uh, if it's in a closed space. Um, so again, the name, right, chlorobenzaldehyde malonitrile. Well, that just rolls off the tongue, but chloro, right? So it's got chlorine in it. That's the important part. At the end, other end of the word is nitrile, and uh, we didn't really talk about this, but you know, nitrile products have so that's cyanide. That's C-N. But this is not a source of cyanide exposure, right? It's it is a cyanide molecule in this compound but it doesn't cause the, the harm. But you can see that if people, if you just look at the name, people can carry a wrong, away the wrong message. But when you say, what are people experiencing? Then you're gonna say, well, they're, they're complaining about their, their eyes and they can't irritate, it's tear gas. Uh, after all, they're all irritated there, they can't see. In their nose, and their throat, they're coughing. Maybe if they've got asthma, they're gonna end up with more problems because now you've got a reactive airways condition that you've precipitated an exacerbation of. And there are people who are more at risk for some of these effects, as, as noted here. Contact lenses, that's an important one to remember. And if people have contacts, that those need to be taken out, uh, and then the eyes irrigated to prevent any, any uh, uh, more long-term effects. So the environment, the nature of the exposure is also important in addition to the dose. And management, I mean, is pretty much, if it's been a gas that they're exposed to, they probably don't need much decontamination other than, uh, well, actually no decontamination at all. If it's a vapor, they need to have their clothes removed, the external clothing at least, so that you don't have any trapped in the folds and whatnot that now uh, contribute to secondary contamination. Uh, wet decon is going to be needed for exposed surfaces like the eye, but may not be needed for the whole patient. And uh, supportive care is important. Oh, and I guess we've just finished with this. So the, the, you already mentioned that the vesicants can cause pulmonary injury as well as skin and eye. And the, the best predictor from my understanding, and we've been contracted to do a little bit of work to try and identify the risk of chronic effects following an acute exposure from a number of these agents is the degree of symptomatic exposure to the eye and the extent of skin uh, vesicles uh, if and blisters if they develop. But that can be so much moderated by the amount of clothing and protective gear that people are wearing. The eyes have become maybe the better predictor. But pulmonary and eye injury delayed and progressive, uh, especially eye injury, is related basically to what Ziad already mentioned in terms of the damage. So you're initiating damage immediately, but why is it that 15, 20 years later, people are developing significant keratopathy and corneal ulceration, and things like that? And, and some of the reason for that is that some of that initial damage that's occurring is taking out stem cells. And if stem cells are not there to replenish your retiring and apoptotic cells as, as ongoing injury occurs over life, you're going to end up down the road with a, a less, less reserve, less ability to uh, manage the daily issues. And those become now long-term effects of the, uh, of the acute exposure. And I think I'll end it with that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the participants before we break for lunch? Dr. Aaron. No, I, I think it happens with the, uh, with the chemical irritation that happens in the inflammation. You get the pneumothorax, and the, he had bilateral pneumothoraces and pneumogestinum, and he had chest tubes, and all the damage, I think, from the chemical damage to the tissues. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Masad? Thank you. Um, uh, because uh, recently, as uh, everybody knows that... Can you please uh, speak up? Yeah. Uh, recently, as we know, that there's a lot of demonstrations in, uh, in some of the countries, and they, um, they, a lot, uh, there's a, a massive use of uh, smoke grenades. Right. So, um, regarding the tox... Uh, the tear gas. Uh, regarding the uh, tox side, the toxicology side of these uh, smoke grenades, anything as a physician... 
as uh, first responders need to be aware about, especially the small grenades. Yeah, so, so most of those uh, riot control agents delivered by, you know, an explosive or, or under pressure release, yeah. then you end up with, the, the ideally, these, I mean, these were developed and marketed not because they cause permanent injury or death, but because they cause an acute onset. And the, the table, uh, that uh, Karen, the Karen, C A R R O N paper uh, from British Medical Journal is a good resource to go to to compare them and contrast them. But within seconds onset, but within half an hour offset, right? So short term irritant effects because they're very water soluble compounds. But if you now deploy those across a population that includes, you know, uh, we, and a lot of the demonstrations you described, you know, young children, you know, mothers, you know, the, the idea that with, if people go in mass to protest, nobody would hurt them, but maybe that isn't true. But now you're exposing populations that are not young military recruits, you know, that the idea was that's where it's going to be deployed. So, uh, so you can end up with people who have asthma. Well, they're going to potentially have persistent effects. Or people who, who just try and run away and hide or go off in a corner and stay in, a, well, say especially drop down into a, an enclosed space, they're going to have a persistent exposure. And persistent exposure to an irritant can cause injury. So I think it's more that, not, not that the compounds themselves are inherently uh, super toxic, they're, they're not, but you can expose susceptible groups and the circumstances Longer of duration. exposure. Dr. Othong, uh, who's actually now in uh, snake and venomation, uh, shared, he taught me one lesson. Um, in his hospital, was very close to the Prime Minister's uh, 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 location in Bangkok when there were demonstrations uh, protesting his, uh, you know, presence in that office. Um, they would come quickly to the uh, emergency department. And uh, before complete hydrolysis, so this is not a gas, it's powder, and it hydrolyzes rapidly. So if you get the victim real quickly, or the responder is uh, there quickly to, with the victim, there may be still ongoing hydrolysis and release of the, uh, of the irritant. So, so there's secondary exposure. And, and we've seen that even with uh, you know, pepper, pepper spray. spray is, yeah. You know, people will come in, and if they come in quickly enough, <laughs> and enough of them, you get a little irritated <clears throat> in the room. Right? So These, you have that, to do that. Pepper sprays are you know, way down here compared to CS and CN. You have to do CN. wet and dry. So you have, the idea is you have to do dry decontamination is not enough potentially, and you have to do wet decontamination, which is you know, so, lacking in some places. So while you're doing the wet decon, though, right, they may complain of more symptoms, um, but but that doesn't mean stop. It means you need to do more. You know, like just if you, you know, it's kind of, kind of like we're often asked uh, on chemicals. Well, aren't there some chemicals you should not, um, you know, w wash with water? And it's like, well. Technically, yes, right? You w should not take phosphorus or you shouldn't take sodium and lithium as a metal and dab some water on it. But turning a fire hose onto somebody <laughs> with a little bit of that on it was, is fine, you know, right? But if you've been exposed to pounds of this stuff, you know, maybe water shouldn't be used. Uh, so it's all a relative, relative thing. Persistence in a given area versus removal of it rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, in my country, many people exposed to this steel agent, my, many protests. And uh, so many people ask me, my friends, are there any rule for the Pepsi cane or baking soda to ameliorate the burning pain sensation? Scientifically speaking, I didn't find... I don't, I don't think so. No. So for yes. inhalation of chlorine, you know, sodium bicarbonate added into the nebulizer, if you've got people with persistent airway symptoms for that, there's a case report data that suggests it's, it works, and there's no reason to think it would harm people, so that's probably reasonable. Decontamination, if you're talking about of, you know, things you can mix in with water or add or substitute, the problem there from, from my perspective is that anything you do that delays application of the water is going to increase the time of exposure. And so even though it might be that some things, uh, well, like uh, C CN, for example, will hydrolyze better if its uh, pH is up, you know, nine or so, 
But if you have to go hunt around for stuff and then get a basin from somewhere and then pour the water in and the bike and mix it and it takes 10 minutes to do that, it would have been better just to put a lot of water on them 10 minutes ago. All right, so that's how it ends on that. People who have spoke to you guys in the last events in Iraq, they experienced Pepsi was very effective. Which one? Well, Pe Pepsi? So yeah. that may be readily they, available. That was a, a standard. Were they, were they drinking it? They had everybody had a bottle of Pepsi in his pocket. So they, it was effective, and they immediately washed their faces in with, Le with in it. In Lebanon, they're using uh, basal, onions. <laughs> Well, well, that's, is that's just to get the substance pee up and there. And charcoal. Some people have been bringing charcoal to the, yeah. to the demonstrations. Everybody in the United States carries a bottle of water because we're all in imminent danger of dehydration uh, all the time. A bottle, so, you know. bottle of water is okay. Yeah. But, but now they, Pepsi, they found out that Pepsi was effective. I yeah. think we're all in imminent danger of <laughs> hypoglycemia and dehydration <laughs> right now after a long morning. Uh, thank you for our speakers and participants. Let's have lunch. Uh, we'll come back here to start at 1.15. Uh, Dr. Waxson, um, but just in case it, we merge seamlessly, I'll introduce him now. So Paul Wax is the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology, and he's a medical toxicologist out in uh, Phoenix and also with uh, UT Southwestern uh, with a, uh, running the toxicology clinic and uh, practicing there when he's there practically, it seems, every other month. Um, so this is going to focus now on the, uh, uh, the cluster of uh, neurologic symptoms and again we'll try and keep that same format of, uh, of, of a broad differential and some of the importance of not only the, the, the compound, chemical compounds itself, but some of the other issues that can come up in the differential diagnosis and then how to sort all those out. So if I could have the slide set. Chuck, and uh, it's been, again, a great meeting, and I thank uh, Dr. Kazi for all the uh, speaking opportunities that he's provided me as well. <laughs> Hopefully you're not too uh, uh, tired of uh, hearing me speak at this meeting. It's been a great meeting. I've learned a tremendous uh, amount from everyone here, and uh, you know, the faculty is really to be commended. So um, um, we're going to you know, shift gears from uh, inhalational and pulmonary to neurologic, and, and um, what we decided to do is uh, uh, Dr. McKay was gracious enough to uh, put together uh, you know, part of this uh, opening talk. Um, and uh, so I'll just go over the goals and objectives and turn it over to Chuck for a few of the first uh, slides. But um, you know, there's a large differential diagnosis when it comes to you know, clusters with neurological complaints. I mean, you know, the brain is so uh, essential to uh, our, our own being, and many, many things can affect the brain. So we're going to recognize that um, there are many components to uh, someone that might present with uh, some sort of nervous system uh, perturbation. Uh, we're going to divide it into these uh, toxic syndromes, uh, as you'll see uh, and discuss uh, sedation and convulsions and, and hallucinations and go into that in some detail. But before we do that, we're going to uh, discuss uh, briefly uh, radiation syndromes that may affect the brain and also, um, in, very uh, importantly, infectious disease processes that may affect the brain. So. With that in mind, why don't we turn to the next slide, and, and Chuck, you can go over the, the next few slides if you'd like. Sure. All right, so somewhat similar to the respiratory issues, the, you know, although people uh, would ha necessarily have a lot of concern about a, about a radiation exposure uh, and people presenting from it because of their concerns about uh, secondary contamination or just the uh, issues of dealing with a, uh, a, you know, a, a patient who's been exposed to radiation. It is very, very unlikely that anybody who's had a radiation exposure is going to come in with predominant uh, CNS symptoms. And if you think about that, it, it, it sort of makes sense the way we think of radiation as interacting with our cells, is that cells that are very, very uh, rapidly dividing, cells that are very active in terms of metabolic processes are the cells that are more likely to be impacted by radiation. Now, I, I would hope that most of our brains are active, uh, some of the time anyways, but it, the sensitivity of the CNS to radiation is not the same as, say, the GI tract or the bone marrow. Um, and uh, I know Zia didn't really mention, but you know, the most 
uh, early uh, measurement for a radiation effect in terms of some of the common tests we might be able to do. You, what, do you guys know what that would be? What, what blood test do we depend on for early evidence of a whole body radiation exposure? No, so the lymphocyte, right? So you're looking for a depletion of the lymphocyte count. And, and if you think about lymphocytes, they are not an active, I mean, they do divide, but they're not the most actively dividing cell. They actually have a long residence time and circulatory time. But you think also of what the lymphocyte looks like, right? It's a cell that has 90 plus percent of its volume taken up by the nucleus. So it is with a, with a you know, a radiation hit, it is much more likely that that cell is going to be impacted in its nuclear content and therefore have an impairment in its function than a cell where the, where the DNA is all you know, tightly wrapped together within, within the nucleus and you're more likely to just hit water or something else within a cell. So, so the lymphocyte is a very early marker. The, the CNS is a very uncommon organ to be involved. And, this table is just a, a part of the presentation that's up on the radiation emergency medical management site, uh, like Ziad showed you with the chem, the chemical hazards emergency medical management. This is something that's housed at the National Library of Medicine, has an, a slew of information in it, but it's best to go looking for that before you need it because it's hard to navigate if you're in a stress circumstance. But they have a lot of charts and a lot of graphics. And, and one of the things that I just em will emphasize here is that, you know, uh, that the likelihood of a CNS component, so this neurologic um, issues showing up with uh, radiation exposure, is, is not till you're up in the 10 gray or, or even, you know, a little bit likelihood in the, in the 8 gray range, which is a, a radiation, whole body radiation exposure range that is lethal, uniformly lethal. So if people show up with CNS symptoms, it's because they've had a lethal exposure and, and they will be manifesting other evidence of radiation exposure by that point, it was significantly the, the drop in the lymphocyte count. So, it is not something we need to spend a lot of time with. Having said that, people who have had a potential radiation exposure are going to be very upset, nervous, and also they may have all of the sympathomimetic or other kind of features going on that might make them look like they're stimulated or otherwise uh, Im impaired, uh, um, you know, because of the issues. So they may have vomiting either because of radiation exposure or because they're very nervous. But vomiting and emotional status doesn't affect your lymphocyte count. So, you know, you still have that to go back to. Uh, on the infectious side, of course, it's a lot more complicated. You know, altered mental status is a, is a hallmark of bad in systemic infections, and, and it doesn't have to be a CNS infection. So, you know, sepsis is going to induce altered mental status. So it's always something to keep in the differential diagnosis. And, you know, whenever we're called on people who have altered mental status and some elevated temperature, you know, it's always a consideration, you know, but oftentimes, you know, we're, we're thinking of it when we have patients with, say, serotonin syndrome or a neuroleptic malignant syndrome from exposure to some uh, antipsychotic. But again, if you're talking about a cluster, it would be unusual for multiple people to show up with, um, you know, a, a simultaneous serotonin syndrome or something like that. Um, so keep it in mind, uh, usually you're going to have a fever and some prodromal symptoms like I was talking about with the respiratory issues, um, but, but keep it in mind, it, it can, sometimes, uh, can sometimes be an issue. And, and one of the ways to rule it out if you're talking about a large group of people is just comparing, you know, the, the time, you know, the epidemic curve as it were, right? A chemical exposure generally causes a lot of symptoms in a large group of people within minutes to hours and then it tails off over time uh, with very rare exceptions like as you had already mentioned earlier this morning like dioxin or methylmercury where you have a delayed onset symptom. But for the biologic agents where you have an infectious process, you need to have the latency time for organisms to grow and reproduce, produce their own toxins and cause effects. And so that's going to be days to weeks. And if it's a transmissible illness, that's where you're going to see a weeks long um, you know, uh, epidemic curve, not just an hours uh, long kind of curve. So uh, keep that in mind, that'll ho help sort that out. Oh, it really likes that one. <laughs> um, so the chemicals, and uh, you know, the, th the things to remember here is that, you know, if we say, well, it could be a chemical exposure, that, uh, that 
could be true, but how are you going to keep track of you know hundreds of thousands of chemicals? And the answer is you can't. Um, but when you're thinking about chemicals that have now exposures that cause CNS issues, and it's a cluster, this becomes a lot more manageable. Or we hope that it is more manageable. Because if, again, you're not likely to have a large number of people exposed to a chemical all at the same time, uh, so that's a medication. Unless there's been adulteration of the food supply, and in that setting, the most important thing is to kind of keep it in mind. And if somebody comes in saying, I think I may have been poisoned by something I ate, drank, a medication I took, you have to consider, consider the likelihood, but how likely is that? And, and one of the mechanisms or processes we use to think about that is, is the, uh, what's called the production distribution bow tie, you know, in terms of uh, looking like two triangles brought up together, uh, evaluation. And if something were affecting, say, a, a food contamination at the uh, production side, where you have a few ingredients that are put together and then distributed to a large group of people, then you would expect a large number of individuals to be affected. If it's tampering with a product after it's already been placed into the store, for example, then you expect a small number of people involved and in a very localized area. Whereas if it's, a if it's something at the production side, it's been distributed to many, many areas and then you'd expect multiple sites and multiple people. So th those kind of things, just kind of bringing it into the, uh, the realm of uh, what am I going to do and still take some action uh, helps with that. <clears throat> so if you think about this just in terms of, uh, you know, a, a, a what might happen when, when you're next on duty, you know, if five people are unresponsive at home and paramedics are in responding or they're being brought to the emergency department for evaluation, you know, think, you know, which one of these things is, is more likely. You know, they all have serotonin syndrome because they're all on antidepressants and then, you know, took some dextromethorphan. Well, sure, I, I guess maybe it could be, but probably not. Uh, actually, almost for sure not. Fentanyl analogs, well, that, that could be, right? If, if they were all using at a, you know, at a, say, a, a, a drug house and they all became overcome, that's how we actually recognize a fentanyl, a new fentanyl analog being introduced into the heroin supply because many people are affected all at once. So that's a possibility. But again, if you find out that it's five people that are all related to each other and they're multiple generations and it's a nice home, not a, you know, a drug using house, well then that's less likely. So circumstances, remember it's the, not only the, 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 the uh, toxicant, the toxin, it's also the circumstances and the nature of the patient, the host, those three things together. So carbon monoxide, you know, that actually would, be, would fit really well. You've got five people overcoming a house because of some problem with the exhaust of the, the heating system or the, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, the oil or, or, or gas burner, that kind of thing. And we've had this happen repeatedly enough so that it's a, it's a real concern, public health concern, in terms of keeping people safe by putting carbon monoxide detectors in, in their house. And the thing to remember is that if you have uh, many people involved like this, is that if you're responding as a paramedic, you do not want to be in that environment for very long. And we've had, unfortunately, people who have tried to resuscitate you know, sponsor parties in a home uh, and get overcome themselves because they were in that environment. So just a way of looking at it, and again, it's the reason to do it is because it allows proper care and protection of staff as well. Paul, I think uh, you yep. take over now. Yep. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <coughs> Can you hear me? I think so. Yes. Good. Great. Okay, yeah, thanks, Chuck. Uh, so as uh, described, the, the, the CNS is, is, is immensely complex, uh, you know, billions of neurons, uh, and uh, many things can affect uh, the brain, and we'd like to kind of clump them together to better understand um, how it affects the brain and also uh, how we will you know, proceed with the management of, of, of a patient or a cluster of patients who have been affected. <coughs> so 
Um, one way to look at this is look at the excitation and, and the in, 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 in inhibitory uh, influences. There's a you know, variety of, of neurotransmitters. Uh, uh, some of them are more excitatory, others are, are more inhibitory, and, and there's a, a balance between these two. Uh, so GABA, for instance, is in, in inhibitory, but glutamate is, is excitatory. And you take away GABA, you take away glutamate, you add GABA, you add glutamate, and depending on, on the uh, uh, cocktail, uh, will either lead to more excitation or, or, or more inhibition. Uh, so there are also other uh, neurotransmitters that you know, may not cause uh, excitation or uh, inhibition, but in some other ways uh, affect the, the sensorium um, and uh, modulate the thought processes. Such, and neurotransmitters such as uh, serotonin or acetylcholine uh, are um, major um, players in, in this sort of sense. And in this case, you may get neither inhibition nor excitation, but some disorganization or, or frank hallucinations. And we'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. So too much inhibition can lead to sedation and coma. Too much stimulation can lead to convulsions. And altered uh, modulation of thoughts uh, may uh, manifest it as hallucination. So those are kind of the, the three main uh, you know, subtoxidromes under the uh, CNS uh, alteration that we'll discuss with some uh, clinical examples. And we'll start off talking about uh, sedation and, 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 uh, and chemicals and drugs to sedate. Now, a prototypical uh, chemical, which may not affect uh, a cluster unless multiple people are drinking, which is not uncommon, is ethanol. And the important thing about ethanol is just to reiterate the idea of, of dose response. Um, you know, ethanol... Um, is a, is a toxin that it really requires a large amount to cause some sort of uh, alteration. I think I may briefly mention this the other day, but uh, we measure ethanol in grams, and you know, one uh, beverage, one bottle of beer or a glass of wine uh, is approximately you know, 12 grams uh, or 14 grams of ethanol, depending on how you measure it, which is 12 or 14,000 milligrams of ethanol. So it's a lot of uh, ethanol to. Uh, cause uh, perhaps a, a little bit of uh, intoxication with, with one drink. Uh, as you drink more, particularly if you drink it all at once, uh, you'll be much more intoxicated and then to a point of, of incoordination. And, and finally, with a large, large amount, uh, you may have coma and respiratory arrest ultimately. Um, and that usually requires a, a very large amount of ethanol. But depending on someone's uh, tolerance as well, someone who's not a drinker uh, may uh, succumb to much less ethanol than someone who's a, um, a tolerant uh, a drinker, and it may require quite a bit more to cause the same effect. So uh, the first example, and I mentioned this uh, earlier this week, I think it was mainly the, some of the students that I was discussing this with, but what, what happened in, in Moscow in October uh, 2002, and I think most of you probably recall this or have learned about this uh, at one point in terms of the effect of, uh, of some sort of gas on, on this whole theater. So as, as you may recall, the Chechen uh, terrorist you know, took over this Moscow theater, and the Russian uh, military uh, wanted to put down this terrorist event, um, and they attempted uh, for them was a novel approach, uh, which included the uh, installation of, of this gas into this theater. And unfortunately, uh, um, although they were successful in putting down the revolt and killing the terrorists, uh, many of the theater go goers were also killed as well, uh, which was uh, not what they were hoping for. And there was much secrecy about what sort of gas this was. Uh, initially, people thought it was might be some nerve agent, to, but you know, nerve agents cause seizures. They generally don't initially manifest that themselves as coma, but these people uh, fell asleep and had uh, CNS sedation, and, and uh, many of them had uh, respiratory depression, and, and those that died, died from uh, uh, hypoventilation and respiratory arrest. And as it turns out, it wasn't a nerve agent, it wasn't um, a benzodiazepine, it was an opioid, uh, but this opioid wasn't given through a needle parenterally or through a pill, it was given uh, as a gas, and that's what kind of surprised everyone because there wasn't a lot of uh, attention to the fact of using an opioid you know, through a uh, uh, gaseous uh, uh, route of, of administration. And the gas that it was was hidden in, in much secrecy. It seemed to be some sort of opioid. Folks suggested it was fentanyl because fentanyl is very uh, potent. But in this case, it actually was one of the fentanyl analogs, which was carfentanyl. 
and carfentanil is, is an opioid that works just like morphine, but it is much, much more strong at, at, the, at, a, at, the, at an equivalent dose. And as you can see in this table that I put together some years ago, um, uh, one uh, aliquot uh, of, of, of morphine um, is one uh, ten thousandth uh, the, uh, the, the potency of, of carfentanil, um, which with the same amount is, is so much more potent. And that's why these people in the, in the U.S. and elsewhere have been dying from fentanyl and the fentanyl analogs because uh, these drugs are just so, so potent. Uh, now, as it turns out, the carfentanil um, was uh, initially developed to be used as a veterinary uh, agent, and uh, it was used to uh, sedate very, very large animals, like uh, elephants, for instance, or, or bison. And that's how um, potent it was, because when you're dealing with a, you know, a three-ton elephant, uh, you need uh, something that will knock them down without you know, expending a, a tremendous amount of, of, of volume. And, and that was the, the, what was called wild mill, uh, appropriately uh, named the, the trade name for this uh, carfentanil. So if one came upon a scene and there were a bunch of casualties, uh, people with hypoventilation, with CNS depression, you know, one should think, you know, could this be an opioid? Uh, important to certainly recognize that because um, opioids you know, do have a specific antidote, and regardless of the potency of the opioid, um, if you give the antidote uh, soon enough, and if you give at, at the dose that might be required to you know, block the receptor, receptor you, can, you can reverse the uh, intoxication with the opioids. So using naloxone, which is quick on and relatively quick off, is, is the approach. What happened in the Moscow Theater is that the uh, healthcare providers and the first responders weren't informed that the Russian military w was using the carfentanil. So these people came out of the theater. Uh, they weren't equipped with the naloxone. They didn't know what they were dealing with, and, and that's what led to many of these uh, casualties. So uh, how else might we uh, recognize uh, you know, an opioid intoxication? Um, you know, the three cardinal features or CNS depression uh, at high doses, respiratory depression, and then particularly the meiosis that might uh, occur with the eyes. It doesn't occur with all opioids. So with some opioids, like meperidine, for instance, there, there may actually be some medriasis. But you know, classically, with, with uh, the majority of opioids, you'll see meiosis. Now, you also see meiosis with a nerve agent, uh, part of the um, uh, you know, part of, part of the cholinergic response from a nerve agent is, is meiosis. So it's not pathognomonic for um, an opioid, but uh, someone who has been exposed to some sort of cholinergic agent is going to act very differently than someone who's exposed to an opioid. That's why uh, the initial reports in the Moscow Theater that it could have been a nerve agent um, because they had small pupils, but didn't make any sense. Okay, so that's uh, you know briefly uh, sedation. Um, many things cause sedation. We'll use a couple other examples as well, but uh, there is an uh, increase in the inhibition and, and the naloxone helps uh, to reverse uh, that effect. Um, so um, other things that are important along with the naloxone uh, for the opioids is supportive care. And if it's a non-opioid where there's no specific reversal agent, uh, then uh, supportive care is, is the primary management. And supportive care includes uh, you know, uh, respiratory uh, support and then in cases with hypoventilation, uh, um, ventilation, and it's critically important. It may make a, a very big difference. Uh, you know, historically it's of, of interest that um, um, years ago, with a lot of stimulant poisoning, uh, oh, I'm sorry, with a lot of uh, barbiturate poisoning, which is a sedative, uh, the, the thought was the treatment should be to use a, a stimulant <laughs> uh, to reverse the effects of the barbiturate overdoses. And the morbidity and mortality from barbiturate over overdoses did not decrease despite the use of stimulants. And that was in part because these patients were then developing stimulant poisoning um, uh, and developing seizures and convulsions and, and dying uh, from, from the treatment while, while they should have just been given uh, supportive care and, and ventilation. And, and one of the major breakthroughs in the, in the history of, 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 of the treatment of poisoning was the so-called, um, what they called the Scandinavian method, which was to abandon the use of, of the stimulants to treat uh, the sedative patient and just to support them with airway and, and ventilation. Okay, so turning our attention then to convulsions or 
uh, and different, differentiate between convulsions and seizures. Uh, so inhibition of inhibition, if you take away the inhibition, uh, you may then have a seizure. And this occurs you know, pharmacologically in, in many uh, examples. And there's a whole list of, of, um, of chemicals and, and drugs, pharmaceuticals, that, that can cause seizures. Uh, and this is an example of a case of, of mass uh, poisoning uh, through this uh, rodenticide, uh, which uh, was used to uh, poison uh, some, um, um, to poison, uh, um, and, uh, and many people developed uh, seizures. And initially, uh, these first few cases that occurred in, in the U.S., in fact, uh, one wasn't sure what exactly they were dealing with, uh, but as it turns out, um, uh, they were dealing with a, a chemical with the abbreviation of, of tetramine, and this is a, um, very seizurogenic uh, sort of uh, chemical. And there was this fellow in, in China that was using this uh, to kill some of his um, competitors and, and led to killing o over 38 people in this, in this one event. So tetramine is a very strong poison. Um, it was used as a rodenticide but, but banned years ago. Uh, but, um, but it was still available and, and this caused this, uh, this mass poisoning. This is another case of 61 students uh, felled by this rat poison. One thing I should mention about rat poison particularly is there are lots of different types of rat poison. So rat poison is uh, not one specific chemical or one specific drug. Uh, many of the rat poisons used uh, historically were extremely toxic, like, like the tetramine, but they included uh, chemicals like arsenic and, and thallium. And you know, typically nowadays, uh, the, rat, the um, rodenticides uh, are uh, somewhat safer. Uh, um, um, we heard, uh, I think earlier this week, perhaps about um, the brodificum that was used to contaminate um, um, the uh, um, the um, um, <coughs> the synthetic marijuana in in Chicago and elsewhere in the United States, um, and that's one of the safer um, um, safer rat poisons. But it's a very potent anticoagulant, and if you take enough of it, again, dose response, it can anticoagulate uh, a person as well and lead to, to significant bleeding. But this is a, an older um, uh, rodenticide and uh, causes uh, seizures. So this is a list of some other chemicals that cause seizures uh, back to the uh, stimulants again and, and some of the uh, agents used for um, uh, nerve agents, uh, which are organophosphates, uh, the nerve agents or the pesticides, and we've heard a lot about that this week, organophosphates and, and carbamates uh, uh, at low dose uh, depending on, on the chemical, uh, seizures may not be evident, but as the dose increases or if it's a more potent uh, organophosphate, you know, seizures certainly could occur. Same thing with nicotine. Now, of course, nicotine is, is ubiquitous as a chemical within tobacco. People that use tobacco tend not to seize, but um, if they use uh, too much nicotine, um, uh, certainly this can cause seizures, and people have um, gotten into nicotine. Uh, young children can get into nicotine, or even adults. Nicotine has been used as a... Uh, uh, as a, uh, a pesticide in the, in the past, and if someone uh, deliberately ingests some of the nicotine, that can cause seizures. Uh, hydrazines are also chemicals that cause seizures. Hydrazines we find actually in some types of mushrooms, uh, and also we find hydrazines in, in rocket fuel, and if someone was exposed to the hydrazines, they can cause seizures. Uh, camphor um, is an old-fashioned mothball that it tends not to be used anymore, uh, in part because of its uh, toxicity, but is also very seizurogenic, as well as organochlorines and, and, and strychnine. Now, strychnine is interesting because uh, from a um, um, mechanistic uh, standpoint, strychnine you know, doesn't cause electrical seizures uh, in, the, in the brain, but because of its effect on uh, neurotransmission um, uh, peripherally, uh, patients become very stiff. Uh, they seem like they're having uh, seizures, but they're really not seizures per se, but uh, clinically they manifest as similar to someone who was having a seizure. Okay, so what is the management of, of someone with convulsions uh, is to sedate. So before we talk about sedation, eh, the management is not to stimulate, it's, it's to support them, it's to use an antidote if it's an uh, opioid such as naloxone. But with seizures, uh, uh, we don't just support them, we have to control the simulation, and so sedation is, is quite important. I think one of the major advances over the last thir 30 years is the recognition that this is really of, of critical importance, that one needs to sedate the patient. You can't just put them into physical restraints, uh, but you need to you know, chemically uh, sedate them if they're agitated or certainly if they're having a seizure. So a good you know, first-line approach is the benzodiazepines. Uh, 
it doesn't always work. It works much of the time, but not always. There are other drugs that can be used, such as barbiturates or uh, propofol, which is used in, in anesthesia. Uh, but you know, these chemicals are important to consider, uh, particularly if the benzodiazepines are not initially working, uh, because of the um, er, er, emergent need of, of controlling the of controlling the seizures. Uh, again, you can't uh, have someone seized for, for too long; otherwise, they develop complications, mainly hyperthermia and, um, um, and rhabdomyolysis from all the muscle agitation and acute renal failure. So a lot of significant complications if someone's not, you know, emergently uh, treated. There are certain circumstances where pyridoxine might be useful, uh, certain uh, drugs like, such as uh, uh, isoniazid, which is used in the treatment of tuberculosis and overdose of isoniazid, uh, doesn't uh, immediately respond to benzodiazepines without providing the critical cofactor, which is the uh, pyridoxine. Okay, and then finally moving on to um, uh, drugs that, um, uh, or chemicals that neither sedate nor uh, um, uh, cause stimulation, but may manifest it as hallucinations or you know, some sort of uh, alteration uh, such, as, uh, such as that. And, it, and as mentioned at the outset, there are a lot of different neurotransmitters that uh, come into play here, serotonergic, sympathomimetic, anticholinergic, um, and even uh, anesthetic. So uh, not one common uh, pathway, but, uh, but they manifest it, uh, manifest it as, as, as you know, an altered mental status, neither sedated nor stimulated, but more having hallucinations. And uh, uh, some of the drugs that have been abused uh, um, in the past and even today uh, at, at present, including um, drugs that affect serotonin, like LSD, for instance, or the, or the tryptamines, you know, this can cause uh, significant uh, hallucinations where um, the patient is just not, um, not there and is not interacting uh, uh, normally. Um, the military actually used uh, um, um, LSD in, in some experiments back in the 1950s. They thought it might be useful um, to um, um, use in, in the battle and, and put down uh, their opponent. Uh, a lot of that research was uh, done in, in secret and, and um, as far as we know, wasn't um, uh, continued after the 50s and 60s. But um, if there was um, a number of people uh, who were suddenly hallucinating, um, one needs to think about something like uh, LSD or, or similar chemical. Uh, and these chemicals are extremely potent. It takes a very, very small amount to, to cause the hallucinations. Um, we'll just move on to the anticholinergic hallucinations. Now, this is through a different mechanism. Uh, we've talked about um, the effects of cholinergically and uh, the, what happens with a, a nerve agent poisoning or organophosphate poisoning. Well, if you block the receptor, if you block them, you know, in this case, particularly the muscarinic receptor, uh, you'll develop uh, what is described as an anticholinergic uh, toxidrome. And, and one of the features of that anticholinergic toxidrome is a, what would be described as, as a delirium. Uh, and these people uh, are often awake, and they're, they just don't interact normally. They talk very uh, funny. It's kind of gibberish. They're making no sense at all. Um, and they can also get uh, somewhat agitated, but they don't even need to be agitated to be you know, very uh, symptomatic, and it's, it can be quite dramatic. We, we see most of this with, um, um, you know, with uh, pharmaceuticals that have anticholinergic properties, particularly diphenhydramine, but um, it also occurs in, in certain plants, uh, jimson weed, um, and if there was a mass, um, 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 you know, if there was a picnic or something and someone uh, inadvertently contaminated the flower with uh, something that contained uh, scopolamine or, or one of these uh, belladonna alkaloids, um, there might be a, a mass outbreak of what would look like an anticholinergic poisoning. And this is the mnemonic that we often use or, um, to uh, remember uh, the clinical effects of, of, uh, of um, the, the, the clinical effects of uh, anticholinergic poisoning. Uh, not only are, are they delirious, but they tend to be very dry and hot, and they may uh, be unable to, uh, uh, to avoid. Uh, so there are a number of features of anticholinergic poisoning, but the, the more severe uh, manifestations are usually the CNS uh, alteration. So back, this was hundreds of years ago in, in uh, Jamestown, uh, Virginia, in, in the U.S., but there was um, a, a, a picnic of some sort, and they accidentally you know, contaminated the salad with the jimson weed, and all these people develop um, what we would consider now to be uh, you know, anticholinergic uh, poisoning. And uh, um, this has not only been used historically, but in, in the uh, uh, Balkans War in the, in the late 90s, uh, these same agents were 
uh, potentially used, and, and BZ, which is an abbreviation for a long uh, chemical name, which is not a benzodiazepine, uh, is actually a, a, an agent that was developed for military use, and its, a, its effect is to cause an anticholinergic uh, uh, syndrome, uh, not necessarily to kill, but uh, to cause this uh, delirium. And uh, you can see the dose of BZ, uh, which is uh, effective, is a very, very small dose. So uh, theoretically, if you had a, a, a mass casualty event where there are a number of people acting um, uh, delirious, you know, one might want to consider uh, BZ. And that was uh, another agent that was considered with the Moscow theater event, but the patients, the, the, the theater goers w were not acting um, uh, they were not acting with uh, any sort of delirium, they were all sedated. So it didn't make any sense that it was BZ. So treatment strategy uh, for uh, hallucinations is kind of dependent on the, um, on, on the exact agent. Uh, if they're agitated at all, one would want to calm them down. Benzodiazepines would be a good first-line approach. If one knew that they were dealing with an anticholinergic agent, antimuscarinic, uh, if you use uh, something that will overcome the receptor blockade, that may uh, resolve the uh, delirium very uh, quickly and, and efficiently. And we often will use physostigmine. So physostigmine is a carbamate, so it's related to the pesticides. Uh, it's related to the carbamate pe pesticides. And in fact, it is a carbamate. And by you know, blocking acetylcholinesterase, it leads to an accumulation of acetylcholine. And, and the acetylcholine accumulation then can help with uh, overcoming the uh, muscarinic blockade. So if the patient is truly anticholinergic, and you have to be careful about this, because if they're not anticholinergic, uh, then you, you'll make them cholinergic, which is not what you want to do. But if they're truly anticholinergic, a small dose, one to two milligrams of physostigmine, may totally reverse the toxicity, while a Benadryl, uh, while, while um, this is not working. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we, again, the, the dose for pyzostigmine is, is approximately one to two uh, milligrams. Uh, we reserve it when we're fairly um, sure that it's an anticholinergic uh, poisoning. And uh, if it is an anticholinergic poisoning and if they are uh, agitated and hallucinating, use, uh, the, the judicial use of pyzostigmine may very rapidly, within three to four minutes, reverse the, uh, uh, reverse the delirium. So concluding uh, thoughts here that the CNS is a, a unique uh, target organ. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different uh, uh, presentations as just uh, described. Um, and the management uh, generally is, is, is symptomatic. Uh, there's a selective use of certain antidotes, particularly naloxone, uh, if it's an opioid uh, poisoning, and, and perhaps physostigmine if, if it's an anticholinergic poisoning. I think I'll end on that note and open it up for uh, questions. Thank you. Any questions? Let me go ahead and, and introduce the next uh, section. He has put together a, a, a group of speakers for uh, what he's uh, called a special topics area. Uh, just some uh, issues that for a cluster of illnesses uh, presenting over time, uh, other things that may not fit ideally within some of, uh, some of our organ system uh, uh, approach that we've used uh, uh, up until this point um, uh, today. Uh, and so first, uh, we'll uh, have uh, Dr. Bruno Megabain come to the podium, and he will be uh, talking about uh, ricin. Uh, I think we have... Uh, Megabain's presentation, um, coming to us from Paris, France, and I think we'll be able to see him. Okay. And uh, um, he's going to talk on uh, ricin. Ricin, yes. <clears throat> so, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you, and we'll talk about uh, ricin in a few uh, minutes. So the story uh, started in 1978, and you know that the first uh, person to have been poisoned with ricin, or supposed to have been poisoned with ricin, is Markov, uh, a BBC journalist, but uh, um, 
from uh, Bulgarian origin, and he was stabbed in the thigh uh, with an umbrella uh, while waiting for the bus at Waterloo Bridge in London. And he died a few days later from a multisystemic organ failure. And on his autopsy, uh, it was uh, found a, a, a metallic pellet of platinum iridium, and it was presumed to contain ricin. Then, a few years later, uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, the old regime, the previous regime of uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was accused to have prepared liters of concentrated weapons grade aerosolized ricin uh, made in Iraq uh, ready to be used. I don't know if they really existed or not, I don't know, but it was supposed to be. And of course there were many, many incidents involving ricin, and if you go to Wikipedia you see that there were at least 26 different events during the history where uh, ricin was supposed to have been involved. And the most recent episode in uh, Europe was in Germany in 2018, where an Islamic terrorist bought 1,000 grains of ricin and used instructions he received from uh, the extremist Islamic State group and was preparing a bomb, but hopefully he was stopped before uh, using uh, this bomb. So, ricin is a, a bioterrorism agent. It's, of course, a biological toxins. Uh, and you see that uh, bioterrorism uh, has uh, <clears throat> include not only bacterial, but also viral and biological toxins, uh, like botulinum toxins and uh, ricin. Uh, ricin is classified by CDC in the B category. That means that it is moderate, moderately easy to spread. It is responsible for moderate illnesses with a relatively low death risk. But when you look at the dangerousness of the different uh, uh, biological toxicants based on their median lethal dose in mice, you see that ricin is well positioned. Probably the most toxic uh, toxin is uh, botulism toxin A and more recently botulism toxin G, which is much more toxic too. Uh, ricin is toxic mainly if it is inhaled or injected, while if it is taken by oral route, it is less dangerous than cyanide. So it is still dangerous, but less than cyanide. What is uh, ricin? <clears throat> ricin is a component of the seed from Ricinus communis, uh, and it is found in the castor oil, which comes from this plant. It is produced uh, in the world with 1.3 million tons per year to produce lubricants, cosmetics, and even pharmaceuticals. It has been, for instance, experimented uh, to treat pain and prevent uh, uh, graft versus host disease and also as cancer chemotherapeutic agent. So it is easy to find. Its uh, toxic properties were identified in <clears throat> Uh, the uh, last part of the 19th century by uh, this uh, German uh, scientist, uh, Stillmark. And now, of course, uh, its mechanism of action is uh, more uh, known. And you see that ricin is a lectin with two uh, glycopeptides uh, bound with uh, a sulfide uh, a bridge. And uh, one uh, uh, part, uh, the subunit A, uh, allows the ricin to uh, uh, link to the membrane, uh, while the second uh, uh, subunit can go through the cell till uh, the <coughs> endothelium, the, the reticulum, sorry, and then it will inhibit in the cytosol uh, the um, uh, ribosome activity. Uh, so it is uh, glucosidase, and it inactivates uh, the uh, ribosome subunit, 
by modifying an adenosine, by removing an adenosine in the RNA ribosomal 28S. And then the protein production will stop and the cell will die. So that is the mechanism of action. So there are three routes of uh, uh, exposure to uh, <clears throat> ricin. The first one, which is not so rare, uh, it is the ingestion of castor beans, generally uh, for a suicidal attempt. So uh, symptoms occur about within four to six hours after the ingestion, up to 24 hours. Normally, this, the seeds are relatively bitter, but to have toxicity, you have to masticate. So it is not so easy to masticate uh, the seed. Uh, and it is estimated if you masticate the seed, then three seeds are enough to kill a child and eight to 20 to kill an adult. So the toxicity has two phases. In the first phase, you will have irritation of the oropharyngeal mucosa, uh, rarely more severe corrosive lesions, and then colicky pain in the abdomen with vomiting and important diarrhea. In the second phase, you will develop fluid losses, dehydration, hypotension, electrolyte imbalances uh, that may lead you to hypovolemic shock and multi-organ failure, mainly renal acute renal failure. There may be also a risk of hemolysis, seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, and in case of fatality, uh, patients will present diffuse intestinal hemorrhage. But this is relatively rare. In case of injection, which is more rare, <clears throat> but still possible, then you will have more severe features, initially non-specific, like fever, headaches, abdominal pain, and then rapidly hypotension uh, with intravascular hemolysis, acute tubular necrosis, and of course, multi-organ failure leading to death. You may have also local tissue damage, and death is relatively rapid within two days, like it occurs with uh, the Bulgarian journalist. And finally, uh, exposure after airborne, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in, uh, intoxication after airborne exposure. So this is a very rare situation. There is no case report with airborne exposure, but it is supposed to be the way uh, by which uh, ricin could be used as weapon, as bioterrorism weapon. So symptoms will occur rapidly within four to six hours. And it started by cough, dyspnea, arthralgia, fever, then rapidly respiratory distress, multi-organ failure, and death. The patients will develop profuse sweating and uh, then uh, he will have pulmonary edema, necrosis, uh, bleeding, uh, tracheobronchitis, and of course, interstitial pneumonia leading to the deaths. Uh, it has been estimated that possibly a few people were contaminated by ricin by this route in the uh, uh, Soviet Union in a factory that was supposed to uh, produce ricin in the 50s, but there's no case report. So all the data coming uh, from this uh, route of exposure are only in rodents. And by extension, it is supposed to be like that in humans. So when you, uh, you look at the review of all ricin uh, poisoning reported in the literature, and this is an interesting uh, study, so it is like one century of cases. Uh, you have, uh, you see a total number of cases of about 875 cases. Most of them are accidental and by oral route, but there are some intended cases and some cases by injection. And you see that in the majority, the accidental uh, oral uh, cases are uh, 
Benin without deaths, while all, almost all the fatalities occur uh, if the patient inject the ricin and mainly uh, in, in a voluntary uh, situation to suicide. <laughs> Diagnosis is difficult because as you uh, understood, there is no specific manifestations. Uh, generally, the patient will come with a cardiovascular failure and hypovolemic shock or multi-organ failure. So it's difficult to diagnose. Uh, uh, if the history is not clear, uh, it is difficult to diagnose ricin poisoning. But if you suspect the diagnosis, then you have several methods of diagnosis. The immunological methods, they are very sensitive. Uh, they are relatively rapid. Uh, they could be used as multiplexing uh, 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 methods. Uh, they are fast and on, uh, they allow fast and on-site detection. Uh, there are spectrometric identification that are uh, with more limited sensitivity. They are relatively rapid in eight hours. Also could be multiplexing. Uh, uh, but they are much more uh, specific. And finally, uh, you have the functional methods. Uh, that means that you have to assess uh, the ability of ricin to depurinate, uh, 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 to, to, to depurinate uh, ribosomes. So it's a real-time cytotoxicity assay. It's sensitive and specific. Uh, and it is mandatory to determine uh, the biological threat level uh, of a sample. So normally you have to combine an immunologic or spectrometric test with a functional method. Because as you understood, ricin could be uh, present everywhere. So you need absolutely to show that you have a functional positive method. But all these methods are not available uh, routinely and only in very specific laboratory. For instance, in France, only in two or three laboratories in the whole France. So <clears throat> you can use uh, surrogate methods. And this is uh, the case of ricinin. It is not ricin, ricinin, which is another compound of, uh, 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 that is present in the seeds. Uh, it is an alkaloid found exclusively in uh, these seeds, but it is by itself not toxic, of course. Uh, so it can be present in different castor oils, cosmetics, and medical products. So if you use this test, you may have some false positive. Uh, uh, <clears throat> And of course, you can also uh, found some false negative if the uh, toxicant was uh, a synthetic ricin and not uh, castor seeds. Uh, so its use is still questionable, of course, but it is easier to use and it is uh, uh, available in more laboratories, uh, possibly uh, in MENA region, I don't know. So what are the management of these patients? First, of course, in case of severity, the patient should be admitted to the ICU. Uh, and this is the case uh, following an exposure by ingestion or uh, inhalation in the presence of severe diarrhea, cardiovascular shock, respiratory distress, hypoxemia, massive hemolysis, and of course, uh, organ failure. The patient has to be transferred to the ICU. Treatment is based on decontamination, and of course, if the patient ingested the seeds, uh, you have to use activated charcoal, uh, as usually recommended. There's no specific recommendations here, and you understood that normally, by oral route, it is not dangerous. No role for cathartics and whole bowel irrigation. Then, of course, in case of symptoms, you have to provide supportive care, <clears throat> based on fluid resuscitation, vasopressor supports, oxygenation, mechanical ventilation in case of pulmonary edema, and of course, 
hemodialysis in case of acute renal failure. Are there specific therapies? To date, there is no available antidote for ricin toxicity. However, some treatments have been suggested to be active on ricin. Sorry. No, it has this one. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> an acetylcysteine and liposome encapsulated an acetylcysteine showed promising results in uh, rodent models. Milk, milk, lactose and galactose seems also to inhibit ricin B subunit to bind to the cell. So these are experimental in vitro studies. Uh, dexamethasone and vitamin E sh seems also to have shown some extensive survival uh, in experimental studies. But of course, none of these therapy is systematically recommended in humans. Are there specific therapies that could be more effective? Possibly. There are, of course, antibodies. Uh, this is, this have been used in animal studies and have demonstrated the possibility of protection against inhalation and parenteral administration of ricin. There are several methodology of, ad, of administration, passive immunization, and this is, this method show a protection before exposure to ricin using humanized animal derived FIB and recombinant antidotes. And of course, much more interesting, active immunization by inducing adequate levels of ricin neutralizing protective antibodies. This could be useful as a vaccine therapy in people like military at risk of uh, ricin exposure. There are also non-antibody small molecules that could be effective to inhibit protein-mediated effects of ricin. But to date, all these therapies exist only in mice and rats. Nothing in humans, of course. What to do in humans? Of course, rapidly, uh, you have to use the adequate personal protective equipment on the scene. Normally, you should use level A, uh, especially if there is a risk of contamination by respiratory route. So you have to protect your skin, your respiration, and you have to use a breathing uh, system. You have also rapidly to decontaminate the environment and to decontaminate the, the dermal surfaces of any patient by removing the contaminated clothing and by washing the skin with soap uh, with water and of course putting uh, the clothes in a double bag uh, that is labeled uh, as contaminated. And you have to clean all the surfaces and clothing with a solution of sodium hypochlorite for at least 30 minutes that will inactivate uh, ricin. So in conclusion of this presentation, uh, you understood that, that there are development uh, in biotechnology that allows to date probably the obtention of ricin easily from the seeds, but also by synthetic production in a laboratory by a possible terrorist state or organization. So these create very aggressive bioweapons. Um, and uh, to date, some states or terrorist groups are accused to try to obtain such biological weapons, despite prohibition. Ricin is active in the absence of any producing organism. It is highly toxic at extremely limited doses, and it represents a challenge for clinical diagnosis and detection. Uh, immediate identification is recommended to contain any further dissemination. And of course, as you see, the treatments are still difficult. That's why WHO is urging all the countries to strengthen preparedness plans uh, to prevent uh, such uh, contaminations. Thank you.
I don't know if there are any questions about RICI. Of course, all our experiences are limited <laughs> in the field. Uh, but recently in Europe, following uh, the, uh, the uh, production of a possible bomb in Germany, it rising become uh, on the top of the issues and uh, uh, the states and the governments try to reactivate all the specific uh, diagnostic means, laboratories, possible, possible therapies to fight against this possible risk. But to my opinion, it remains limited risk. Bruno, you'd mentioned the, the difference between the, the castor beans themselves and then the, the ricin isolated from that as a water-soluble product. What, most of what we've had in the U.S. has been people who have uh, obtained castor beans and then uh, ground them up or sometimes ingested them whole, which often is they're asymptomatic. But uh, we've had events in uh, Las Vegas and a few scattered events elsewhere where people individually have uh, done preparations either in their home or in hotel rooms. Um, and, and it has raised a question about the level of response uh, often after the fact because sometimes people aren't told immediately uh, what's happened and then after the fact somebody goes in to try and clean uh, up the, 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 the site. Um, do you have any comments on, on that other than the general uh, recommendations as far as if people have disrupted the shell and in terms of responding to those events? My experience is limited, of course. <laughs> but uh, normally you, you, you see uh, you, you need a, a big amount of seeds to extract uh, the ricin from them. Uh, then it is not so easy to uh, produce an isolated bomb. Uh, possibly, and that was the case in the U.S., they put it in envelopes or they put it uh, on, on doors or on the shoes of people that they want to, to be assassinated. But So they suppose that the person will contaminate himself uh, by because it doesn't cross the skin, so by, by uh, oral contamination, thinking that the, the, the ricin is sufficiently concentrated to allow this. Because if you swallow a, a seed without mastication, you have no toxicity. So I don't know really uh, if these means are effective to, to, to go to, uh, to allow a fatality, because it's more frightening, I think, and in many such situations, such people use this uh, uh, rising to frighten the people. I don't, I, I'm not sure that this really result in a fatality. Uh, the only way is to inject or to, to inhale. And, and as I as explained, if you use the seed to, to have the rising, then the ricinin is present, and you can use ricinin as a diagnostic tool. But if you use synthetic ricin, but this is only performed by a state, not by a private person, then ricinin is not a useful tool. So you have to measure the ricin directly. Uh, and you need, in both cases, an analytical or immunological test and a functional test. Because, as you understood, if you use only an analytical or immunological test, you, they may be false positive because ricin or ricin could be found in different situations in a market. Uh, so uh, there is a study uh, that tested for ricin and about 2% were falsely positive. So you need a functional test also. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank again the um, uh, Scientific Committee for inviting me here. My name is Robert Hoffman. I'm a pediatric emergency physician and uh, medical toxicologist. I'm the medical director of the Cutter Poison Center. 
I'm going to um, discuss a topic that, that there's a high chance if you're a toxicologist or an emergency physician, you might have seen uh, some of this information previously. Some of these slides are actually slides that I just presented here at this conference. So if you attended uh, the previous lecture, you'll see some uh, similarity. <clears throat> I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, I will disclose that some of these slides are actually um, uh, from a World Health Organization template uh, that, that I've used before and that's widely used to discuss the same topic. So some of these slides are not my original slides, they're actually WHO slides that uh, um, are freely available for people to use and I've used in training previously. Um, but basically I'm gonna discuss um, some unique aspects of uh, um, anatomy, physiology, uh, and uh, development as well as behavior um, that uh, poses some specific issues with regards to children in uh, RIMIC situations. And then a, a few specific details of exposures that are unique. Um, and then discuss um, uh, um, how this relates to pediatric, pediatric cluster illnesses or how it would impact our, our management in pediatric cluster illnesses. So this is a, um, uh, these are just a, some, some older paintings. And uh, the reason it's included in these slides is if you look at the older one from the 1300s, you see that the child is actually just a miniature adult. Uh, and um, the, the exact purpose of this uh, discussion is to explain why that's actually not the case. So kids are not just, uh, you know, miniature versions of us. There's significant uh, differences. So, um, uh, so some of the differences relate to um, uh, exposures. So there are different pathways of exposure. So some pathways of exposure are actually, you know, antenatal. So antenatal or postnatal. So uh, transplacental as well as breastfeeding. Uh, more likely to occur on a, on a larger scale uh, is uh, our children's uh, behaviors, so exploratory behaviors, hand-to-mouth behavior, uh, putting things in their mouth that uh, aren't food items or you know, aren't made to be ingested. Um, uh, their location, their physical location, meaning uh, uh, you know, being on the ground, uh, so either crawling on the ground or just being closer to the ground, even if um, standing. Uh, higher uh, um, surface area, so relative to us, uh, um, surface area to volume ratio. Uh, and then uh, kids are preambulatory, and most kids who are going to be exposed to something, including in the U.S., if they're not pre-verbal, they're poorly verbal. So if you think of, you know, kids who are four years old or less, they have very limited ability to um, speak or give their own history. And then if it has to do with adolescence, uh, high-risk behaviors or, or kind of behaviors that might result in uh, exposure or dangerous exposure uh, that could have been avoidable. So I have a few slides about breathing because this is one of the key things that that's, uh, uh, differentiates younger children from adults. Uh, so I won't go through all of them in detail, just try to give you the specific point, which is uh, minute ventilation. So children's uptake of toxins uh, is faster. Uh, and that's kind of specifically related to their position uh, uh, close to the ground and minute ventilation. So this is actually from a, um, a pretty cool study that was um, uh, uh, exposure uh, to chlorpyrifos. So chlorpyrifos sprayed on uh, carpeted floors and toys and uh, the uptake, uh, uptake by children. And uh, you kind of see the, um, uh, you kind of see the peak uh, has, uh, the peak is kind of right there in the center. Uh, as opposed to, you know, older children or 10, 10 to 25-year-old uh, uh, patients had very little uh, exp uh, uptake of chlorpyrifos. Um, this slide is a, a, um, a size and surface area slide, so relates to what I just mentioned. So smaller, uh, smaller children, especially a baby, uh, has a very different um, volume to surface area ratio than adults. This, ha this is more significant when it comes to dermal exposures. Um, but it is one of the key things that, uh, that we consider when we consider pediatric exposures uh, in uh, poisonings or mass casualty uh, situations. <clears throat> so uh, one thing about children has to do with uh, behavioral differences. So younger children uh, either you know, can't recognize danger or maybe older children like an adolescent recognizes but ignores something that's dangerous. Um, and I won't read through all of these, but uh, um, younger children can't specifically remove themselves from a dangerous situation and actually won't necessarily know that a situation is dangerous. And like I said, adolescents have risk-taking behavior. So, um, so xenobiotics are handled differently by younger kids as opposed to older. 
Uh, and, and again, I won't read through the slide, but just there, there are some significant differences when it comes to both uptake, uh, uh, metabolism of poisons, and then excretion of poisons. So uh, minute ventilation, which I mentioned before, is uh, significantly uh, different. So the younger the patient, so the closer to infancy, the much higher the minute ventilation. And uh, um, uh, an analogy to this would be, um, uh, you've heard the term canary in a coal mine. So, uh, you know, an infant literally is like a canary in a coal mine if you were thinking about something like CO or uh, a, a toxin that's going to be up t uh, taken up specifically by the respiratory route. Um, so uh, some other considerations have to do with in-hospital uh, care, staffing, and resources. Um, so lack of pediatric EM specialists is pretty universal throughout the world. It's not, not common that a child would reach an emergency center in most countries and actually encounter a, a specifically pediatric EM physician. They're typically going to be seen by a pediatrician, a uh, general practitioner, or maybe an EM physician. And there's a little bit of a difference in each of them. There's maybe some advantage and some disadvantage to each, uh, but there's some distinct uh, differences in what they're capable of providing for the child. Um, the other uh, kind of specific issue faced is when children do get to a hospital, it's not really, it, it, there's no guarantee that hospital actually has uh, specialized services that are able to care for critically ill children, meaning it's, it's very possible that the hospital doesn't have a dedicated PICU or a neonatal ICU. And besides being able to manage those as inpatients, it might not have other things that are necessary, which, which might be uh, um, uh, people, able to, uh, um, people able to do ECMO uh, for children or respiratory services able to um, keep children uh, ventilated. Uh, this is from my talk yesterday. Even some simple things like just uh, uh, um, supplies. So uh, the reason I show that blue top tube, it's not, not specific to a RIMIC situation, but it's uh, um, that blue top tube, is, you'll recognize that's an adult vacutainer tube used to uh, check uh, um, coags, co uh, coagulation profile. So uh, to fill that, and it's necessary to fill that tube specific to a specific uh, volume to ensure the anticoagulant inside is exactly the right amount. Now the difficulty with these tubes comes in, it's very possible if you have a, um, a young child, an infant or neonate, you won't be able to get enough blood to fill that tube and, and resulting in a, um, a lab error. Uh, so there are a lot of simple things, things that you would think are simple but actually can become problematic when we're managing children uh, in these situations. Another consideration has to do with um, developmental or, or cognitive capability of the child. So typically, children have to remain with the caregiver. So if you're talking about or considering a, a mass casualty event, uh, you actually have to consider, so is our children gonna be transported without an adult? And then if decontamination is needed, who's actually gonna take a child who's alone through, the, through, uh, um, through their wash, through the decon? And then you know, further considerations would be, well, if there's an adult there who wasn't exposed, but they could go with the child, does the adult go through the decon and potentially get contaminated? So there are really a lot of uh, um, uh, kind of developmental or cognitive questions that come up when managing kids. Once the patient's inside the hospital, it's, we face the same thing. Who's actually gonna stay with the patient? Uh, it's not really feasible to have a one-to-one -one nurse for every unaccompanied child. And then other issues, issues of consent, uh, capability of consenting to, to procedures, consent to a hospital to a, a level that provides higher care. Um, specifically, it's uh, uh, issues come up with, with regard to antidotes. And it's mostly not availability of antidotes, more familiarity or unfamiliarity with the antidotes. Um, so for any, given, for any given poisoning, it's likely that an ICU relative to a PICU is, uh, probably has more experience applying that uh, antidote. Um, so anyway, this is, a, this is the second of the pictures that I just showed you. And this is a more realistic picture of a child, which is, uh, you know, a child is kind of like an adult, but a distinctly, uh, distinctly different uh, entity. It's actually the last slide I have. Um, happy to take questions. Thank you. I hope you are still awake. 
So uh, uh, I've been asked so to give an, a talk about paralytic uh, syndromes uh, related basically uh, to uh, toxins exposure in general. And so I'm going to talk uh, in brief, basically. I'm not going to burden you with all of uh, the information related to all of this, but we are going to speak a little bit about Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, Libarium toxicity, botulism, and we had quite extensive talk about botulism in the uh, last workshop. Uh, tetanus toxin, uh, tick paralysis, uh, sac uh, saxi toxin, and then tetrodotoxin because we had an outbreak of tetrodotoxin and we would like to share that with you. And then Konzo if we have time. So Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome is basically the most common cause of an acute uh, generalized paralysis that we see uh, in the uh, um, uh, emergency department. It's usually commonly missed uh, diagnosis because most of the time we don't know what's going on with the patient initially and it is associated with significant morbidity. And uh, um, it's basically happened due to inflammatory peripheral neuropathy, which is, could be related to virus-induced, bacterial-induced, uh, or toxins. There are four main uh, phases for this disease. They usually start with the, the interval um, um, of an uh, uh, infectious prodrome that happens uh, initially, and patients usually die does not know that they are going to develop, or there are no signs of symptoms that they are going to develop this kind of uh, paralysis. But then eventually they progress into weakness, which manifests as a, a symmetrical limb weakness, uh, diminished or absent tendon reflexes, and then, but they have a minimal loss of sensation despite uh, the paresthesia. So that one of the things that you might put in your mind when you are looking at the differential diagnosis. And these symptoms usually last for about uh, four weeks or so. And then they have the plateau phase, and then after that, the recovery phase. The, the, the main challenge in this is the clinical diagnosis. So if you have a high suspicion of Guillain-Barr syndrome, you will be able to pick this as early as they come in the uh, initial presentation. But they might have also abnormal nerve conduction study in uh, the assessment. And when you do a, C a CSF analysis, you will find a high protein uh, analysis and a low WBC. And the treatment most, most of the time is supportive. Uh, you can use uh, immunoglobulin, and that's with high efficacy, especially if it's administered within the first two weeks of starting the symptoms. And there are being uh, uh, trials of using uh, plasma exchange as well um, in such cases. Barium toxicity. So barium basically used as a pesticide or insecticide. The, uh, the feature of the barium makes it a li little bit... Um, um, you know, it's, it looks like a, a, a powder, a white powder, like, like a, a, a flower. And then uh, most of the time, people might miss this with, an, with, an, uh, with uh, the usual flower and that ends up by an unintentional uh, poisoning. The uh, barium by itself, it can cause competitive blockade of the potassium uh, rectifier uh, channel. So it will decrease the uh, potassium efflux out of the cell. So most of the time, the potassium will be built inside the cell, and there is a decrease in the level extracellularly. And this will, ha will cause an increase in the vascular resistance, leading initially to hy hypertension and reduce the blood flow, leading to uh, metabolic acidosis. It also indirectly affects the potassium by increasing the membrane permeability to the sodium, and so increase the sodium-potassium bump activity, leading to the further influx of the potassium inside the cell, and so decreasing the, uh, the potassium level extracellularly. And usually, uh, the, the, hall the hallmark of diagnosing uh, barium toxicity is the hypokalemia associated with it which will lead into overall result, cellular debolarization and paralysis. And that's the main reason behind the paralysis is because of the hypokalemia rather than the direct effect of the uh, toxin. The clinical presentation, it can cause fixed proximal weakness, uh, also abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Uh, the hypokalemia can lead into ventricular dysrhythmias and then death may be related to it, associated with hypotension. And, um, the, uh, the main thing is that w they develop a flaccid uh, muscle weakness and respiratory failure as well, which can also lead to the uh, death in such cases. Uh, diagnosis is uh, clinical, and also there are some um, um, centers that they can do the blood level 
or um, you know urine level of uh, barium the treatment is mainly supportive with aggressive correction of the hypokalemia and mechanical ventilation for the respiratory failure uh, there are uh, um, evidence that enhanced elimination like hemodialysis and C uh, CFFH might help in uh, such cases. Botulism toxin, again, we spoke about this earlier. Botulism is quite an, um, you know, a nasty uh, toxin that if happened, it will can cause uh, great fatality. It's the most lethal toxin known. You need only a small dose of this, like a human oral lethal dose will be one microgram per kg, which is quite, you know, uh, scary. Uh, the mechanism of toxicity, probably you know this, it's um, usually, you know, we need um, acetylcholine in the neuromuscular receptor agent. Uh, so what will happen is that you have at the nerve or at the neuromuscular junction vesicles that contain the acetylcholine and then you have proteins. I don't know if this will show but you have proteins uh, at the end here. Transmitter. What will happen is the, with, the, uh, with, the, um, with the botulism, they are going to affect the, the protein there. Okay, so that will end up by having the vis vesicles flowing up there without reaching the acetylcholine will not be released. And that will end up basically by decreased level of acetylcholine and causing paralysis. So clinically, they will have a, a decreased symmetric paralysis, descending sorry, symmetrical paralysis. They will have normal sensation, and that might be a clue to diagnose botulism. Normal reflexes compared to the previous uh, two, and they might have early uh, cranial nerve palsy um, uh, or cranial nerve involvement. And eventually, the cause of death is basically because of the respiratory compromise and uh, respiratory failure. Diagnosis, we talk about this, but toxins are detected in the serum stool and the food. And also you can grow the bacteria by itself in the stool or uh, in the stool culture. And the treatment is mainly supportive. You can use botulism antitoxin if you have it, and that will shorten the duration of the illness and the morbidity as well. Or you can use also IV uh, botulism immunoglobulin. Tetanus is another uh, cause for paralysis. Uh, tetanus by itself, it's an extremely potent neurotoxin that produced by the Clostridium tetani. Uh, in an anaerobic conditions. And usually it presents with an acute onset of hypertonia, painful muscular contractions. So you can see that, you know, the, the classic posture of uh, such uh, patients. And it can cause generalized muscle spasm and increase reflexes. The diagnosis is mainly clinical and the treatment is uh, supportive. Uh, using the tetanus immunoglobulin uh, might you know, shorten the duration of the illness as well. And of course, the main thing is the prevention with vaccination. Tick paralysis, again, it's, an, it's, it's basically peripheral nerve uh, effect due to the, uh, the uh, uh, one kind of, to, uh, of ticks called the mesentor uh, tick species. And these are basically cause uh, ascending symmetrical paralysis, ptosis, again, normal sensation, and respiratory failure leading to death. Mainly the diagnosis is by identify, identifying that these symptoms related to the tick, you need to look for it and try to remove it. And of course, you know, there are certain techniques that you need to apply in order to remove this tick. And uh, usually the other investigations are within normal, including the CSF. The treatment is by uh, tick removal and supportive care until the effect is completely resolved. Saxitoxin is, uh, is a paralytic uh, shellfish poisoning and is uh, basically formed by the uh, dino uh, flagellates in, um, in the shellfish. It can cause ascending uh, symmetrical paralysis. So you can see is almost all of them, they can give you a similar clinical picture, uh, which might, you know, a highly suspicion of a certain diagnosis uh, will give you the clue ab about the, what, what is the exact cause for uh, these symptoms. Um, for this patient specifically, they will have burning and tingling sensation, 
around the mouth and the lips and maybe in the, uh, in the foot at the beginning of the illness and this can be used to differential uh, between it and the other types. It can uh, cause altered mental status and respiratory failure. So in this way you can see it's different compared to the botulism and the, um, the tetanus basically. Diagnosis is again is a clinical suspicion uh, can, the toxin can be detected in the uh, food, water, environmental samples. There are certain centers that can send and test even the urine sample for, uh, for uh, saxitoxin. And um, the main treatment for it is mainly supportive care and, until complete recovery. The trodotoxin, uh, this is basically, um, I mean, we had an uh, outbreak of six cases last year of the trodotoxin uh, related to uh, fish ingestion. They didn't know that it was a, a buffer fish. And so uh, the trodotoxin by itself uh, depresses the action potential generation by the fast type sodium channels in the neurons and the skeletal muscles leading to that kind of uh, paralysis. So they usually the patients will have, an, I mean the initial presentation in our cases was uh, initially GI symptoms uh, nausea and vomiting, little bit of dizziness, and very oral uh, tingling sensation. And then after some time, they started to feel this ascending paralysis. And that happened within 30 minutes after the ingestion. You usually expect the paralysis to start within one hour to three, to three hours from the time of the ingestion. And we feel that this presentation was quite quick, maybe because they ingested quite a good amount uh, of the toxin. So they, they develop ascending uh, symmetrical paralysis uh, with cranial nerve involvement. And then eventually they started to have respiratory failure and then they lost their consciousness. So, and this is one thing that you might also consider in the differential diagnosis that these cases, they will develop eventually altered mental status and coma. Again, the diagnosis was clinical. We had to, to say that this was the trodotoxin based on the history and the examination, uh, but we were able to send the urine samples to be tested, and it came positive for the trodotoxin. Uh, if you have the facility, that's okay. Otherwise, you know, it's mainly clinical diagnosis. And the treatment uh, was mainly supportive treatment. We, we did a trial of using new stigmine, to overcome the effect of the uh, um, the trodotoxin on the um, you know the neurojunction and neuromuscular junction also, and we also considered dialysis, but we were not sure whether this intervention was the cause for the quick recovery. We, most of them recovered within 48 hours. The last one is uh, Konzo, and Konzo basically is a highly dietary uh, uh, caused by highly dietary uh, cyanogenic. Uh, 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 cyanogens, uh, substances in uh, what is called cassava roots, okay? So these patients whom they ingest cassava without being processed in a certain way to degrade this toxin, they will end up by developing symptoms, uh, which is basically upper motor neuron um, uh, symptoms. So they will have abrupt, irreversible, non-progressive, and symmetrical spastic uh, tetra uh, baresis, increase in the reflexes, and then um, tropical ataxic neuropathy. So that's very classical for uh, Konzo. Again, the diagnosis is mainly clinical. They, you can detect the cyanogenins uh, uh, through the food sample if you have that uh, facility. And the treatment is mainly supportive with higher education on a prevention of, you know, um, higher education basically on the way to prevent the development of this disease and maybe the uh, control of, uh, uh, control the way how this kind of fruit being uh, prepared. So I guess that's, that's the end of my uh, presentation. No questions? So, uh, 
Dr. Nelson is going to be coming up, and I don't know that all of you have heard him uh, over the last couple of days, but uh, he's going to be uh, presenting from uh, Sandia Labs and uh, the systemic issues uh, re regarding an emergency response. All right, I realize it is the last series of talks at the end of the conference, so we need to wake up a little bit. All right, everyone has a pad of paper and a pencil. So I'd like you each to take a pad of paper and a pencil, and everybody stand up. All of you, stand up. We're gonna, we're gonna do some artwork here, right? The art of medicine now. So take your paper, put it over your head, all right, and draw the biggest circle you can with your pencil. All right, congratulations, you just drew your face. So now, as physicians, I'd like you to draw your eyes, your mouth, and some hair in that circle. All right, let's take a look. Very nice. Okay, that has no meaning in life whatsoever, <laughs> just to wake us up. So, um, as many of you saw on, on the first talk on Wednesday, um, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, I represent Cyndia National Laboratories, and um, this is science. Well, uh, kind of art, I don't know, a little of both. But I'm here to talk about security principles. And um, I acknowledge that as, as physicians, most of what I'm talking about today um, you won't ever actually uh, probably do on your own, but know that there are resources out there to help you if you ever see a security problem in your own, your own hospitals. So we at Sandia teach a comprehensive risk assessment approach. We typically offer courses that are about um, anywhere from three to five days long on all of these topics, primarily, again, with scientists, but um, I think there's a lot that we could offer to physicians and, and hospital settings uh, which I'll talk about now. So we, we usually teach five questions. What do we have? Meaning, what dangerous substances, be them biological, chemical, radiological, we have in our, in our hospitals or our patient clinics? What can they be used for? Again, it's kind of a heavy topic, but what, um, what could someone use these for to hurt someone else with? Um, what could bad guys use them for? How badly does somebody want it? Why would someone want to come steal it from you and um, how can we protect against um, these bad actors? Um, so again, in the, the patient setting, we, we find chemical substances. Um, this could include fentanyl, chloroform, um, a lot of the dangerous uh, substances we talked about today. Uh, biological agents, you, I mean, of course, you have patients coming in that are exposed to Ebola, uh, maybe, hopefully not Ebola, but you know, various uh, um, dangerous viruses, and then radiological, many hospitals have cesium-137 in their blood irradiators. Um, you might also find TEC-99 and various other uh, radiological substances. So question for you. If I told you I wanted to work with a flammable liquid, an extremely flammable liquid, or a combustible liquid, which of, you, which of these three do you think is worse? Which, which is the most dangerous of these three? None of the above? So as, as a chemist, I think of the difference between flammable and combustible. Um, and th these words have slightly different meanings. Um, and then the word extremely. Well, the challenge of this is that depending on where you look, which reference you look at internationally, you, you get a different response. Um, and there are some chemicals that if you look at US-based regulations would classify as flammable. And then other, even other US-based regulations would, would call it combustible. A perfect example of this is acetic acid, or um, commonly referred to as, as vinegar. Now let's take it to, to poisons. What if I wanted to work with a poisonous liquid, an extremely toxic liquid, very toxic liquid, packing group one, or a hazard category four liquid? Which of these is worse? I have no idea, right? And, and that's, that's the, the, the point here is that it depends on where in the world you are. Um, so some chemicals could classify as all of these. So um, you know, if you have a very poisonous chemical, 
it could be classified, depending on where you are in the world, as extremely, uh, extremely toxic or packing group one. So because of this, this is why we, um, the international community came together to develop the global harmonized system. Um, because within certain countries, the US is a great example, and then between countries, so if I were to ship a package from the US to uh, Turkey, we had different laws, different regulations. So in the US, we would label a toxic chemical differently than here in Turkey. So this system was developed um, by a lot of input from around the world, um, along with the United Nations, to try to minimize some of those, uh, those problems. Um, so this has now been implemented in, in many countries, but the Middle East still has a long ways to go with this. And, and many countries are, are starting to implement, such as uh, Egypt is, is in the process of implementing GHS, um, but they haven't fully integrated it into their, their processes. So one of the really cool things about this global harmonized system is that it standardized what we call a safety data sheet. How many of you have worked with a safety data sheet before? Conversely, how many have never seen a safety data sheet before? So I met a couple, a couple of your colleagues here this week that had never heard of a safety data sheet before. Um, so what this is, is for any material, it has known hazards. And what, what the uh, Global Harmonized System did is it standardized these hazards. So it makes it easier for people around the world to identify the same concerns. Now under all safety data sheets, on the second line, you find hazards. And this will include toxic hazards, uh, chemical hazards. And so they've come up with a very systematic approach where anything, if you see the, the word H300, or the, the letters in the code H300, means fatal if swallowed. So that would have an LD50 of less than five milligrams per kilogram. Um, fatal if in contact with skin, it's code H310, and then H330, fatal if inhaled. Um, so these values are all available online, so you, and they allow us to quickly attribute toxicities to various chemicals. Um, the way that this is determined is, is by a lot of mechanistic, deterministic uh, toxicology, which is really the field that I come from, um, where there's a systematic approach where you do an animal study or various other studies, you find the toxicity of a chemical, and then if you find that it has an oral toxicity of less than um, five milligrams per kilogram, you call it a category one toxic. And, and so on and so forth. Um, so what, what this does, what this means for you is it makes your life easier. Now there are pictograms or these pictures that are associated with all of the, the hazards that we need to be most concerned about. Um, for instance, if something is acutely toxic, you'll have the skull and crossbones. So that means it has very high toxicity. So this helps you in your labs. You can go around or your clinics or wherever you may be, you can walk around and if you see that picture, you immediately know this is a safety concern. It also could uh, be a security concern. The issue with security risk assessment and security management is that some chemicals may not have, they may not present as acutely toxic originally, but they're very easy to convert in, in, in simple chemistry to extremely hazardous chemicals. Case in point is mustard, which we heard about earlier today. In, in one step, you can convert a very simple chemical, dimethylamine, into, um, into mustard gas. So dimethylamine is not particularly dangerous, but if you convert it into mustard, of course, we saw today, it is quite dangerous. So there are many resources out there to help us identify these chemicals that are known to be precursors. Um, for example, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has lists that they have published that help us identify these chemicals. Turkey is a member of OPCW, as are most countries in, in the Middle East. The only country who is not a member um, is, is Egypt. Um, switching gears a little bit to uh, biological hazards. Um, for something to become a, a hazard, it's gonna depend on one, its transmissibility, its lethality, treatability, latency, a lot of these different factors, which I, um, it's kind of outside the scope of what I wanna to talk to, about today. Um, but uh, the reason I bring it up is secure, the security we have around it is the principles are all the same. Radiologically, um, the, the hazard associated with a radiological material is going to depend on its half-life. How long is it present? So if you have a compound like um, um, fluorine, radioactive fluorines for FDG imaging, 
cancers, the half-life of that is in the order of about an hour. So if someone were to steal a large source of fluorine, they'd have to have a very well orchestrated plan to actually do anything wrong with it, because by the time they got to their intended target, it would be gone. Similarly, with a compound like, uh, with a radioactive isotope like uranium, uranium-238, is a half-life in the order of billions of years. So in order to be a radiological hazard, you would have to have huge quantities of it, at which point the, medical, the, the metal toxicity outweighs the radiological hazard. So the half-life is important in determining this. It, it just so happens that cesium-137 is one of those um, radiological materials that is a security concern. Um, the physical form of it is important. If, it, if it's a gas and it just disappears like uh, krypton, um, we're not, not so concerned about it. Or, or radioactive argon, not so concerned because it disperses very quickly. Um, and then activity level. Of course, if you have a very small concentration or, or um, activity, it's not going to hurt someone, we're less concerned about it as opposed to these high activity. Again, this leads us back towards cesium-137 for blood irradiators in hospitals, um, which here's a picture of, of those. So next question we would ask is how badly does someone want to take this from us? And um, th there's unfortunately a lot of different types of bad people out there uh, with a lot of different motivations. Some are opportunistic, some are very motivated. Um, we have individuals all the way up to state governments that could um, have very localized all the way up to very widespread impacts. Um, you know, we've heard about a lot of these today. This is uh, World War I, chlorine gas exposures, um, with Syrian uh, exposures, um, and then with organized groups such as ISIS that we heard about earlier today. So a lot of this makes sense to us, um, which, but what it means for us in the clinical setting or in our own laboratories or wherever we may be is understanding why us? So that leads us to a discussion about why, why us in the patient setting. And really in hospitals, you're, you're relatively vulnerable in the sense that your mission is to serve patients. You have to be open to the public. Your mission is to take care of people, so you always have people coming in. Um, whereas in my institution, I can shut the door and keep people out, so I have much fewer people coming in and out. Um, we know that you have toxic chemicals in hospitals. Certainly the quantities are smaller than you'd find at the chemical industry. Um, we know you have radiological materials as well as um, infectious agents, though, again, most of the infectious agents, you don't have a lot of control over what comes into your clinic. Um, so that's a little bit harder to predict from, um, from a threat perspective. And of course, equipment is, is always important. So if we wanted to reduce the vulnerabilities in the, the medical setting, we have a number of different tools to do that. Uh, physical security, so this is adding more doors, more locks, more gates. Uh, transportation security, so this can include protocols on how you package materials to ship them. Inventory management, which I talked about on Wednesday. Personnel management, um, this could include wearing things like badges. How do you um, ensure that the people that are coming into your hospital are entitled to be there? And then lastly, information security. Um, just random question, how many of you have changed the passwords to your email in the last year? Yeah. Last six months, three months, one month, last week. Okay, so it says impressive. A lot of places we go, people have never changed their password before. I guarantee you that your password is out there on the dark web. And, and actually, there's now, there are now tools, a lot of uh, banking applications will search your credit history and tell you whether your passwords have been hacked or not. And that actually just happened to me a couple weeks ago, so I quickly changed my password. Um, so anyway, there's really four principles that we need to think about when we're trying to improve our security. First is balanced, second is layered, third is graded, and fourth is hierarchy-based. And I'll go through each of these briefly. So by balanced, we mean you don't want to make your facility into a nuclear security facility. It wouldn't work for your needs. So you need to balance the mission of your institution. Again, you need patients to come in and out. And also, the other aspect of balance is that we need to think about our facility in 360 degrees. For example, there was a famous case in Brazil where there was a, a large bank that had built extensive security around their, their, uh, their vault. And they, but the problem is they built their vault in the basement, the very bottom of the building. So some uh, criminals 
bought a house within a, um, about a kilometer. We set up a, um, a landscaping company and then started digging out dirt over about a period of a year. And they were slowly digging a tunnel, a kilometer underground, and came out underneath the vault. Now it turns out the vault had no security looking downward. So you have to think about the vulnerabilities all around your facility. You don't want to put all your efforts on the front door if you've got an open back door. Um, with layers, this is the onion principle. Um, I don't know if you've ever received a, a package, like a gift from a friend, and it's a box, and you open it up, and inside's another box, and you get really frustrated, and then you get another box, and, and eventually you get down to like a piece of trash or something. Yeah. But it, the point is it takes forever to get to that present in the middle because there are more and more layers. So the more layers you have, the more difficult it is to access um, something that's higher risk. And layers is not necessarily doors or gates or locks. It could be a number of things, such as um, um, having security guards that walk around or having badge systems. So we're making things more and more complex. So uh, just to look at a clinic setting here, this is uh, looking at a blood bank. Um, down in this bottom corner here, we have a, um, a blood irradiator. And if we wanted to really look at the security of this, we'd want to think about how many layers do we have. So if we, if we break this down, we see that there's three layers of physical security um, in some regards. But we'd really want to know what's um, window right there, we really only have one layer of security. So we've got to think about this, these layers in 360 degrees. Um, and then we need to think about uh, this idea of graded or risk-based protection. Um, these are just a few examples of chemicals. Certainly there are other things out there, but, um, and, and this will depend on the situation in your own country, your own region. Um, I recently went to a laboratory in Kenya, and they had chloroform in the laboratory for many years, but then there was a, um, a trend where people were stealing chloroform from laboratories around the country so that they could then um, kidnap people. So they made the decision that this was too high a risk and they got rid of it. Um, but you know, that could be in that setting, obviously a high risk chemical, whereas saline, come on, it's not high risk. So you don't want to protect saline unless of course there's a theft of situ situation for it, but that would be a different, uh, different discussion. Um, and then the last major concept is hierarchy-based. So this really comes from the field of industrial hygiene or occupational hygiene. Um, I'm sure in most of your countries you have access to occupational hygienists. So if, if this concept is of interest, please do reach out to them. Similarly, um, I'm happy to discuss with you further. Um, but really it's this idea, I, I like the stop principle, the stop sign, this comes from the Germans. Um, substitution, technology, organizational measures, and personal measures. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by this. So if we're looking at radiological hazards, um, the, the most effective thing you can do is to substitute the radiological hazard. So if, if you have a blood irradiator that's based on cesium-137, that is a pretty high-risk material to be, be taken. But there are alternatives, right? You could use an X-ray-based system that doesn't require radioactive material. So you've immediately reduced your risk. Um, you could also put in administrative controls or badge access controls. That would help lower your risk. And then lastly, you could protect the actual individual blood irradiator. Uh, similarly with chemicals, um, you could choose different types of chemicals that are known to give similar medical effects. Um, substitute the higher hazard chemical for a lower hazard. Um, you could um, also, eventually, the last thing you want to start doing is putting in personal protective equipment like goggles. I'm not, not saying they aren't important, but they are the last barrier. So you want to think higher if you can. And then biologically, if, um, say, in your, this is more for a research setting, but if you're studying uh, typhoid fever, you could use uh, a surrogate, a, a, um, a different lower hazard bacteria like uh, um, typhi, Salmonella typhi instead so on. So the idea is to really think about getting rid of the hazard if possible, substituting it, um, and then thinking about administrative controls, um, 
engineering controls, and then lastly, PPE, personal protective equipment. So again, there's really five questions we ask with security. It's what do we have? What can it be used for? What harm could come from it? How badly does someone want it? Why us? So this is a really important question. Think about what, what weaknesses you have in your facility. And then lastly, how can you reduce them? Um, and when it comes, particularly when it comes to this last question, how can we reduce our vulnerabilities? Um, I wouldn't suggest that you start designing your own systems for that. But certainly these, these first four questions, you're, you're very capable of doing. All of us are capable of asking these questions. And then reaching out for help. Um, reach out to your security personnel. Reach out to Sandia. Reach out to Ziad. He can put, it, put you in contact with other people as well. Um, so the main point is it's like you're in the clinic and you, see, you can see these problems arising. So speak up about it. Ask for help. Um, there's plenty of resources out there to help make your work environment a safer place. So any questions you have, please feel free to email me, write to me, WhatsApp me as needed. Yes, Ziad. No problem. Finishing up some administrative stuff, but have you talked you about the? You missed our uh, artwork. Did I miss? You missed the artwork session. Oh, okay. What about the video? Did you play the video? No. Oh, I did not play the video. Play the video. But... Have you talked about the role of uh, emergency physicians and the role of um, emergency responders in detecting chemical or biological or radiological incident breaches? Not exactly. No, can we be a great bring that up? Can yeah. you bring that up a little bit? No, yeah, or? but it'd be a great time to bring it up. Sure. Okay. So. Um, we have a role as healthcare providers in this area. Can someone tell me why we have a role? Why do you think that we have a role in detecting a chemical incident breach or a biological or radiological? Because we're the first responder. Nobody will know if we don't recognize it. It comes to us as a first, guys. And if we don't raise the issue, maybe it will be missed. Very good. That's the one point. So, that, so detecting the actual illness. Tim, are you trying to answer? Go ahead. It takes a long time for a hazmat team to sit up and do entry. They got to do vitals, get in level A suits, get down range, get back, sample, that kind of stuff. And typically, I'll tell my guys to call the hospital and ask what the syndrome looks like before they go down range. Because typically, the medical people have an idea long before the hazmat team makes entry on what they're dealing with. And, uh, and what about our role in detecting something suspicious? Can you imagine a scenario where we actually enter the scene and see something, not we, the, the first responders enter the scene and find something suspicious on the scene. And many times the paramedics are there before the criminal has concealed the evidence. So if a criminal is doing something, uh, they, can, they, can, uh, they don't have time to conceal it when they get injured and the paramedics arrive there. Uh, in the emergency department, we also should be suspicious about, you know, presentations that are odd, uh, something that doesn't fit, an explosion at a home, why was there an explosion, a uh, chemical burn that is from a weird chemical, or a chemical that's not supposed to be in the, as a household chemical. Yeah. A group of, group of people exposed to a chemical together and, and if they're working on something. Can, so can all of these are reasons why we can potentially play a role in this chemical security or biological security or radiological security uh, ring. And I, I want to expand on that point that um, with most terrorist attacks, they're, they're more predictable than you might think in that they don't just happen overnight. There's always a planning phase, a testing phase. So if you think about the process, First, someone has to acquire, let's just choose a chemical example, for instance. First, they have to acquire some knowledge about what chemical they're going to use. Then they have to actually acquire the chemical. And then they have to develop some sort of, de of a delivery system. So in this process, there are many opportunities for them to be exposed themselves. So there's always the possibility that they might splash some chemical on them. And if they come into, the, into your emergency room and they have some weird chemical burn that doesn't make sense, uh, especially in line with their occupation, that's a red flag. Uh, we, we'd call that a red flag in, in the US, at least. Um, but that's you know, a suspicious warning sign. Then, most of the time, these, uh, during these attack cycles, they also test it. 
a small scale test. Again, another opportunity to see people coming in that have some sort of a strange exposure. And, and, and this always happens before the large, uh, larger planned events. So there are many opportunities that you as physicians are uniquely um, situated for to actually identify big attacks before they happen. Thank you for expanding on that. And also, uh, the other uh, thing that we need to know about is who to report it to. We did a survey uh, of, of emergency responders in Atlanta about this, these topics that was being published in a journal issue that Andy is editing, yeah, I believe. It's, it's actually available online right now. It's already now. available, mm -hmm. correct. And you can look it up. And you can use that survey, if you like, in your own community. That would be nice to do that. So a um, couple of things came out of that survey. The first thing is that people were um, uh, responders did not know who to contact. We were surprised to see that. Mm -hmm. Do you know who to call if there's something suspicious? You know, if you, if you see something suspicious other than the police, you know, who do you call? Yeah, sometimes they didn't know. No, what if you did know and you suspected something? Our responders didn't know who to report this to. The other thing that we noticed in the study is our responders felt a little bit ethically undecided. Is it ethical for a responder that goes to save someone's life or take care of somebody in their home to report on them, even if they suspect the criminal activity. The, 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 if you see something, say something, moral. Is that ethical for a paramedic to do this who is already awarded the faith, the, the, the faith and the uh, you know, confidence of the, uh, of the community? Are they violating that faith? That was the second thing that was, yeah, I thought was I mean, interesting. That's a, that's a really tough problem, too, because you could also look at it the other way. By not acting, you're potentially harming other people. other people. So it's, and, and, and no one can make that decision for you. No, for example, in, in the US we have the, we have some joint, uh, joint, uh, we call them like, um, like joint uh, uh, hubs of law enforcement and uh, fusion centers. We call them fusion centers. But not, pe people are not trained in this, you know, responders and, and we ask them, you know, they're trained in hazmat maybe, they, they can recognize toxidromes or they train in toxidrome recognition, but they don't train in chemical security. So chemical security training is lacking for responders and physicians, certainly, and nurses. I have the video with us so we can watch it after the break. Yeah, maybe we'll watch it after the, after the, during the, uh, the discussion. Sure. And don't worry about the being a little bit behind. This is part of the discussion that we're going to have. So let's go ahead and take a break right now for 15 minutes. And come back at 3.30, or 20 minutes, come back at 3.30 for the uh, uh, final uh, PPE session. We have Dr. Anwar Awadhi, who is one of our disaster medicine experts from Kuwait. He's going to uh, talk a little bit about chemical uh, hospital preparedness. Dr. Abdilhal Attas from Saudi Arabia is going to talk about biological uh, hospital preparedness and biological transpo uh, transportation of biologically infected patients such as Ebola. And then at the end, we're just going to do an open forum together and maybe show the video. Yep, perfect. We'll try to get you out of here at 5.30, if not 5.15, hopefully. Thank you. Koenig and uh, Dr. Schultz. He is now in Kuwait. He actually went back to Kuwait right away after he graduated to contribute to, uh, to, his, con <clears throat> to his country. And he currently is the um, uh, uh, advisor for the um, emergency medical services and HIMSS for the Ministry of Health of Kuwait. And he's actually uh, in the Department of Emergency Medicine at uh, Mubarak, uh, Mubarak General Hospital. He is going to share with us the perspective on the uh, hospital response or hospital reception of a chemical, uh, chemical emergency victims. Uh, and then he may show us some, some videos, I believe. Yeah, so cool. thank you, Dr. Anwar. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and um, welcome. I know it's the end of the conference, and you guys are tired. It's the afternoon. I, I promise I'll make it short. Um, so, so basically, you know, the talk was, uh, is about hospital management of chemical incidents and the reception of you know, the victims of, of either industrial or warfare or uh, you know, might be like terroristic attack. So, so the, this is, you know, I want you to imagine if you have a facility and you get called in today that something happened at the facility and you are actually you know, either the medical director or the actual disaster manager thing. Um, this happened at one of the oil field refinery just two days ago, which is on February 20, 20th. Uh, we'll watch like really short videos. Uh -huh. and 
So this is actually the CCT camera of uh, one of the sites. This is actually two days ago. And this, this oil refinery is due to, next video. So this oil refinery actually is due to, we, you know, this is all taken by individuals. I'm sorry, no. Yeah, so this is all taken by individuals. Uh, actually, some of the videos might be uploaded already on the internet. Uh, you know, regardless, the good, the good thing is this facility is not functional yet. So it's not up and running. So there wasn't a leak. It was all major, like, you know, structural damage. And, um, and um, thankfully, nobody got injured. You can go, third video. Not sure why it's not projecting. But anyway, that's fine. Um, that's it. You get the idea. That's fine. We can go to back to PowerPoint slide. And something with a projection. Okay. So, yeah. So, imagine yourself. This is actually another refinery. This is in Philadelphia many years ago. But anyway, so the, 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 the actual um, uh, thing when you start is actually you get a notification. The regular channel for this, so, for example, Dr. Ziad just mentioned if you're at a chemical incident, just, just before the break, what would you do? Are people are aware how to manage these, you know, type of incidents? Are they trained? To a specific role in a specific agency. So the idea is, if you get something like this, you obviously you call the emergency line. Uh, usually, all companies run their own thing unless it goes, you know, out of resources, which is by definition is a, a disaster event when you have requirement and resources. And um, you make a call to 112, which is the dispatch for many countries, or 911, the United States. And by the way, 112 is actually international. So if you call apparently 112 in the United States, it, it, it goes to 911. Um, you know, and you, you report the incident. And the, the 912, whether it's, uh, you know, the emergency dispatch, it, it contacts your EOC, Emergency Operations Center, at the EMS department. And the EMS department asks a few questions. They're trained. They know how to scale up and down. And then they activate hospital or multiple hospitals under HICS, Hospital Incident Command System. And if they think the, the event is actually really large, they activate the ICS, the Incident Command System, which is a multi-agency approach to certain incidents. Now, you can always activate it, and if the incident is really small, there are no people are being harmed, it's only fire or it's only like, you know, building collapse, then you can, you know, downscale. But if you do not, and something gets leaked, like, you know, gas or oil or chemical uh, or fire, uh, so to speak, it's very hard, you know, to catch up with the event itself. So the main thing, actually, once you activate all of the system, is patient safety and your staff safety. If you miss on these two, it's actually, you're multiplying the effect. So uh, let's say we go back to our incident, you have to establish your zones. So hot zones, warm zone, and cold zone, you can mobilize or demobilize as much as you want. If you don't do that, something might happen to what similar happened in, in, in sudden gas attack in Tokyo. Remember? The, the average was 200 at the event in 1995, but by, by the time they reached the hospital, there wasn't a proper, you know, people are not used to that kind of scale. The average number was 5,000, including staff and, and, um, and, and patient and uh, relatives also. Some of them actually taxi drivers who transport those people. So you, staff and safety security response to the objective. What kind of incident? This one is hazmat, hazard material. And then you activate the incident management. And then once you manage uh, the, the role, let's say it's only fire, then you transfer of command to the fire department. And then obviously incident recovery, which is you learn, you know, lesson learned, incident action plan, and everything that goes after it. So, we go back, so HEX activation, Hospital Incident Command System, you need as much as intelligence, you need to know as much as information, because actually you can manage more in the field while en route, and you, you actually can, you know, reduce the effect of all of this to your hospital. So one of the things, if you think this is like really, you know, something that could be contaminate your hospital, you can go and activate the hospital lockdown policy. Now, HEX hospital lockdown policy has many objectives. It has for active shooter, um, you know, threats, leak of, let's say, you know, radiological material from your nuclear department, many, many, many reasons. But in, that, in this scenario that we're going to talk about specifically, we're not talking about biological or radiological, we're talking about chemical incidents. So you can activate lockdown policy. The other thing is you always, if you need, ask for help. Remember, we go back to the incident command. If you think the scale is large, then you can ask for fire department, uh, National Guard, whoever does hazmat too. So you can have a field 
zones and decontamination at the site if your decontamination units at the hospital will be overwhelmed or people will flood your hospital being affected. So, so once you activate the de decontamination unit to the hospital, w um, whether it's in the field or mobile units, you also want to know more about the agents. Is it liquid? Is it, uh, is it uh, vapor? Has it been, you know, what type of contamination? Was it inhaled, ingested? Was it contact? Was there a spill? All of these, um, obviously, you know, make a difference in the management. But you go back to the basic thing, which is ensuring patient safety and staff safety and security. So PPE, personal protective equipment, and you scale it up and down. So if you think it's, it's really, you know, one of those uh, that needs level one, then you go level one. Uh, our colleagues will probably demonstrate, you know, the type of suits and the scubas and how you use it. The basic for hospital staff, if you don't know, you can go to level D, the basic, which is, you know, goggles and face masks, mask and apron and gloves and all of that, right? Uh, now, uh, luckily enough now, um, you have like, you know, uh, to detect, let's say, chlorine or other, uh, you know, leaked gases, you have many companies that provide chemical kits for that, which is, that's, that's good enough. However, there are many chemicals um, that's out there, and the majority, they don't have the antidotes, and the majority of the management for these things are actually conservative which is, you know, supportive, supportive care, uh, basically. But one thing stands, so if you're, if you're in, if you're, let's say, you're in your PE, PPE, and you activated your decontamination unit at the hospital, but many patient comes in, so you actually go to, this is MCI, like mass casualty incident, which is more of a disaster event. You go to reverse triage. So you wanna go through, you know, green, yellow, red, and black. So for example, if a patient comes in, at the hospital and you have resources and you're not overwhelmed, so priority resuscitation goes to the top priority before you look at, you know, you decontaminate him totally. I mean, you can do both at the same time. In the decontamination unit, you expose the patient, but if the patient is cardiac arrest, you absolutely jump to resuscitation. Uh, make sure resuscitation comes first as, as long as you are having your basic protective uh, equipment. Now, there are actually some of the list uh, out there, like Kim Intelligence Syndrome list, which goes actually through the major thing when you ask the paramedic in the field or if the patient arrives in the hospital. So you ask for vital sign, mental status, pupil, mucous membrane, lungs, and skin. Those are major parameters, and if you link them, you will find a way of, okay, I'm dealing with, you know, opioid uh, toxidrome, or I'm dealing with anticholinergic. So the Kim uh, list helps you to do that. So what are the major lists that we are looking at? I'm sure like all of your colleagues have gone through all of these, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna repeat them, but we'll, we'll mention them, um, you know, uh, briefly, knockdown syndrome. Classic in where an industrial site. People walk in, a guy, you know, drops, the other guy wants to help him, he drops and before you know it, you have a lot of people, you know, dropped at the site and you cannot help them because people don't know what kind of agent. The other agent, like pesticides, people work on farm, but also naval agents when it comes to warfare and specifically now, um, you know, a fourth generation, which is orderless and you cannot detect it. Then solvents um, and uh, um, anesthetic and sedative. The anesthetic and sedative is commonly what we use in the department like halothane, propofol, and benzodiazepine. And then you have irritant gases. Irritant gases commonly now, it's actually in, in riots. You have you know, people go, going riots in many countries, unfortunately, and then you define them between upper and middle and lower airway according to their volatilities. Then opiate syndrome, we all deal with this um, in our facilities every day. Uh, the unfortunate part is, you know, unfortunately some terrorist attack might use some of the opioids for terroristic reasons like carfentanil, right, which is probably like more than 250 times more than opioid, uh, and they can vaporize it, in, and, and presumably it happened in one of the terrorist attacks uh, in Russia. The anticholinergic syndrome also, and then convulsant uh, syndrome. Um, so, so now we go with the initial assessment. So you want to make sure that resuscitation is your priority. So airway, breathing, circulation, but D is actually not disability when it comes to ABS, it's actually de uh, decontamination. And the drugs, you need to know, do, you, do I have the antidote for this or this is conservative managing, management? If I, if I have the antidote and I'm receiving many patients, I probably need to ask for the, uh, to stockpile those agents. Now, 
you can go through the asbestos mnemonic. Now, agent is what type and what's the, you know, um, the LD50, and what's the status? Is it liquid, vapor? What's the type of contamination to the body? How severe is it? The time, of course, is it delay or is it acute onset? All of these actual parameters, and obviously synergistic and combined effect or delayed contamination, right? People were not you know, exposed properly, they can have the de delayed contamination for that. Then you can, you can go through uh, poison, which is you know, what type of it? Is it outside? Is it internal? What's the you know, sequence of event for that? Do we have other differential diagnoses? Right? And the net effect for both the patient and actually for cross um, interaction between chemicals. Like for example, this facility, if it had multiple towers, one is chlorine, the other one is H2S or something, or ammonia, you will have probably a mixed you know, uh, range of, uh, of victims. So, so we go back, so, and now we're gonna go through them really quick because I'm sure my colleagues have covered all these syndromes, but knockdown syndromes is, as we mentioned, it's usually in the industrial side, people walk in, they drop down. The actual mechanism behind that is usually, you know, um, for hydrogen cyanide and hydrogen sulfide. The, the, the major mechanism is actually toxicity to mitochondrial, so they cannot utilize, um, you know, the use of oxygen. So it could be simple, a cellular asphyxiant, or hemolysis that goes into hemoglobin, hemoglobinopathies or anemias. Now, the other one is pesticide or what, what, what's known as cholinergic or nerve syndrome. I mean, most of you have dealt with this, um, especially if people work in rural areas and people still use pesticide, you know, for farming. Um, and the only thing that we all know that you need quite, you know, large amount of atropine. And if you're lucky enough that you have 2-PAM, paradoxime also. Uh, and then obviously for muscle spasm, people, people have spasm for a long time. So think about rhabdomyolysis, think about renal failure if you need dialysis. Um, and obviously, you know, you can work on that. The other is, you know, ag uh, aggressive supportive measures like cir circulatory and respiratory measures. And uh, obviously, de decontamination when indicated, which is probably uh, most of the time it's the case. The other one is organic solvent, aesthetic and sedative. So industrial will be like, you know, the gasoline, uh, the toluene, the carbon uh, tetrachloride, and freon like used in uh, freezers. And the medical will be nitric oxide, you know, in anesthesia department, halothane, isofluorine, the stuff that we use every day, like atomidate, uh, barbiturate, and benzodiazepine. So the, again, um, there are specific drugs like benzos, you have flumazenin, but all the others, most likely you will end up doing supportive measures like aggressive ventilation, um, you know, oxygenation and circulation um, uh, measures. Irritant gases, the, the major categories will go probably upper, middle, and lower airway. So ammonia, chlorine, and phosphogene, and it's, it's all divided according to their volatility. So if somebody inhaled, was it only inhalation, or is it actually skin contact? We go back to our, when we were uh, doing differentiation for that, right? And some of it actually industrial, and other, unfortunately, could be used in riots, or actually just household leak, like, you know, chlorine, for example. Now, ammonia, um, you know, if you have, it's actually erosive, so we know that, especially with mucosal membrane. So, irrigation, people could inhale it. Specifically, they end up with massive laryngospasm and actually respiratory arrest. Uh, the treatment, again, is like decontamination when needed, hydration, and obviously supportive uh, measures. Chlorine, on the other hand, might have a yellow to green um, color to it. It's non-combustible with a, with a very specific uh, odor. Again, yet again, it's, it mainly um, affects the middle airway and it can cause respiratory spasm, which is acute at the respiratory failure. The treatment again for it is actually supportive and aggressive uh, measurement, but there is no specific antidote. The other uh, irritant, which is uh, uh, has low volatility is actually phosphogene, which, which settles in the lower alveoli. Uh, it's colorless, it's non flammable and it can also lead to suffocation. Now again, uh, you need to decontaminate when needed, but aggressive supportive measures. 
so this covers basically the um, <coughs> the, er the um, uh, uh, pulmonary irrit irritants. We go back to tools for identifying uh, th these agents. Use them if you have them. If your facility has, you know, the, obviously the funds to to get them, that would be great. If not, just use your basic parameters that we discussed in the field. That you look at the vital sign and the names to, to identify which one of those seven or six toxic drum that we talked about. Now, opioid is another one. You guys are very familiar with this. If you have a, uh, you know, the, um, um, you know, we have antidote for that, which is nalox naloxone. However, if you experience a patient coming with ramifentanyl or just fentanyl, now, uh, unfortunately now, fentanyl is being sold everywhere over the internet, or carfentanil, which is much worse, um, um, then you probably won't you know, revert that person, person with few naloxone antidote. You have to watch, you have to ask, you have to get collateral histories, but it can be challenging, even with the um, availability of the antidote. And obviously, you guys are the expert uh, when it comes to opioid toxidrome. Anticholinergic, obviously, it's the uh, sympathomimetic without having a wet skin. It's rather dry. Um, but basically, what really bothers the patient is actually the altered mental status and hallucination. And what you need, what you need for that is actually aggressive, um, you know, hydration. You need benzodiazepine. And if people go into uh, rhabdomyolysis, they probably need uh, dialysis for that. So, but the major um, mainstay of treatment for the anticholinergic is conservative uh, management. Convulsant, on the other hand, um, now it affects the central nervous system. So you have, you have uh, glycine and GABA uh, antagonism, which is they desensitize the, neuro, uh, the nervous system. But if you have something against that, then it's excitatory effect. And the opposite, the same. Glutamate is excitatory, because if you have antagonism to that, then you have depression of the um, central nervous system. So it's actually, to, the, the toxic drone for that is the opposite of what's the, uh, the available physiology for these things. So where are they found? They're actually found in the industrial um, uh, chemicals and they can be in chemical warfare or ter terrorism attack. And what happens actually, again, aggressive uh, measurement, hydration, supportive measure, and respiratory support. And remember, for people, because they go into excitatory phase, they might end up with status epilepticus with unknown cause. But what you need is conservative management, benzo, barbiturate. And if you suspect something like INH toxicity, you, you probably add uh, pyridoxine to that. So in summary, um, how you have to have, I mean, when you receive a, a call for these type of incidents, you need to have a high index of suspicion. Gather as much as information as possible because the only way that you, you can actually ma manage these events is you can scale it. So let's say you're at that facility, that hospital, and they called you about the incident that we saw a few minutes ago. You can actually make a call to the EOC, say, even though I'm the closest to the facility, I need the support of the incident command center and divert the cases like green or yellow triage to other facilities, right? And even if you know the, um, the, the chemicals and you have stockpile, you can share it through your incident command system with the other facility, especially if they're receiving the lower acuity one. Now, this request for support is very important. If your fire department or if your National Guard or if your civil defense use hazmat team, use them because that means probably the lower cases, you know, uh, that not severe, they can be treated at the field by going through the hot zone, warm zone, and cold zone. Identification of the patient, if you go through the parameters that we discussed about those seven uh, toxidrome, then you probably have a good chance of managing these events. If you don't have the tools like kits to, um, to, to test them, that, that'll be fine. You just have to do the basic conservative management, fluid, aggressive hydration, and, uh, and circulatory management and manage per incident. So if this incident that we saw just now was a fire, and then you activate the incident command system, you can deactivate it. But if, if it's a fire that led to you know, structural collapse, and you have victims, trauma from structure, and then you have victims from toxic inhalation, 
obviously you're gonna run the full incident command scale for that. The evaluation of the incident is extremely important. A lot of people mention this is like lesson learned, but it's more than the scientific word, it's experiences gained through incident action plan. So when you demobilize, you sit down and you look at things, and how did we do, and this is probably one of the most important thing to, to learn and how to manage that type of large scale and complex um, event. And I, I would like to leave the last few minutes for, for questions. It's, it's a little bit of a complex topic, but you know, um, thank you for your time. It's the, the end of the afternoon. <laughs> thank you. There is. Let's, let's have uh, Dr. Ibtihal do her lecture, and then we can just have, yeah, sure. have the discussion. Maybe that will stimulate more. So Dr. Anwar will stick around with us so that, until we do this. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Ibtihal Atas. Dr. Ibtihal Atas is currently at King Abdulaziz uh, University in Jeddah, and she is deputy director of EMS in, uh, at that hospital. Uh, Ibtihal completed a uh, residency in emergency medicine at Emory University, followed by a fellowship in emergency medical services uh, at uh, Emory, and then moved back a couple of years ago, and uh, is here with her lovely family, her husband, Dr. Sultan Waji, and her, and her daughter, Asil. So, uh, Ibtihal is going to talk about the biological side of things. Uh, yes. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're just going to switch gears and we will concentrate on biological, on the biological incident. Um, so the biological incidents, we have many, either it's man-made or actually uh, was done by the nature. Uh, we have the incidents in 84 where like a couple of uh, salad bar restaurant in Dallas was infected with salmonella because of like some uh, political group. Then we had since 2000, uh, 2001, the anthrax. After that, we have the SARS, uh, the outbreak of coronavirus, all the, and lastly, uh, recently, the, uh, corona, the other coronavirus, the novel one. Coronaviruses. Yes, the viruses, actually. So when we want to think about the biological attack, it's really similar to the infectious disease outbreak. The only difference is like the scaling of the surveillance and how you're going to act uh, with the uh, public health authority will be just more, uh, more skilled. So how you can identify the incidents if it's biological? We have like mainly two sources of the, uh, to identify that. Usually the 911 centers or any call center in the country you have, they have their like geographical mapping of where is the call is coming from. So usually the program that they have or the mapping will show them if multiple people have like presented with the same symptom and this will alert them that okay, there is a possibility of like an outbreak here or a biological incident. And usually if you have a call uh, for a one patient, it's a regular day, two patient, it's a little bit suspicious. If you have three patient, like on the same, on one hour or two hours, this is uh, usually activate the uh, hazmat or like like husband response or something like that. So the authority will be just at least notified of it. The second uh, place, it's the ER actually. And that's why we're saying that the emergency physician are the first line. They are the most important people to identify if there is an uh, incident because you can have increased scale of the number of patients presented to you. Um, and all the infection control in the hospital, they will notice that, okay, from the surveillance of the disease, we have this month, couple of people presented or in this week, we have a lot of like respiratory symptom or gastroenteritis more than what we usually suspect in this time of the year. So for chemical, like for the biological wise in the community, um, if what is the sign that make you suspicious that it could be an attack? If you have a bombing that didn't make a major um, destruction for the place, you can think that, okay, maybe it's a dirty bomb. If there is in the neighborhood unscheduled spraying for insecticides, it's like a different, like a weird time, uh, weird place that they usually do not do the spraying, then people have to be suspect, uh, suspicious. If there is some, if they found anything like throw it in the floor, like a discarded PPE, uh, any biohazards bag, this is also suspicious 
suspicious because it shouldn't be in the community. It has its own way to be discarded. And if there is also like multiple insects in the same place that it shouldn't be, like if you have like a lot of whatever fly, whatever, it's like in none, uh, a place with, without plants, then this is, could be suspicious. If there is a lot of dead animal from different species, so if you have like a lot of like birds that getting sick or dying in the area, you need to take this in consideration. And lastly, the outbreak of the respiratory symptom, if it's in the winter, this is, could be normal. But if it's in the summer, then it has to be suspicious. For, uh, for the epidemiological part, uh, the clue usually that if you have a disease in multiple people, multiple people are dying, uh, sorry, it's a little bit small. And if you have a single case of uncommon disease, like if you have one patient with anthrax, one patient of smallpox, this is like a smallpox, this is well, uh, activate the, uh, the incident. And then lastly, if you have a zoonotic disease that shouldn't uh, infect the human, uh, but it's now in the human, this might be uh, a biological attack. Uh, for the CPRNE, uh, the scene management, as uh, the, uh, the doctor before me mentioned, you usually isolate the area, control your axis, establish your communication, and this is how you kind of go in the scene. Um, you start communication and you have your risk assessment, but then you implement your treatment doing your triage and try to do the victim evacuation. Uh, and this is how you kind of controlling the, uh, this is how you set your control zone where you have your hot zone, warm zone, and cold zone. Unfortunately, for the biological incidents, all of this is like not gonna happen. It's, all, it's most likely for chemical or if there is a bombing or something else uh, because most of the biology, most of the infectious disease have an incubation period. So the patient will actually come to the ER with the symptom and they already expose, like anybody exposed to them and you don't really have to do all of this stuff. So what's, how are you gonna think of the, the bio stuff in, in your response plan? You have to put a plan, how are you gonna recognize if there is an attack? So you have to have a, like a plan for this. Um, like you put a syndromic uh, uh, syndromes specifically, you uh, educate your staff about that. How are you gonna get your prophylaxis? If you want antibiotic, if you want a huge amount of antitoxin, how are you gonna re get that? If there is a lot, uh, large number of dead people from infection, how, what are you gonna do with them? And how are you gonna deal with the public? How are you gonna control the area of the attack? Like these days, wh what they are doing in China and how they like isolated most of the areas and how you limit the access to the area of the attack and you have to have a plan how you gonna quarantine the possible exposed patient like the possible exposed people actually because not everybody gonna listen to uh to the quarantine order um it's not isolation because they didn't show the symptom yet so you need to have a plan for that and most importantly the safety of your worker uh, Adding to all of that, for the bio incident, you need to add for yourself more stuff. So it will be how you're gonna transport these patients, and if you transport them, you need to prepare your vehicle, and what special equipment you might need to do, how you're gonna disinfect the, your equipment, what you're gonna do with the waste management, and lastly, post-mission surveillance, which you need everybody who transported the patient, you need to put him under surveillance for, a possible appearance of the symptom after that. And it's really, basically, it's the infection control if you think of it. It's very simple. If you are doing your hand hygiene, you have your precaution appropriate and your PPE and you have your prophylaxis and the vaccine, then things gonna be easier. Just a little quick about the mode of transmission and precaution. We have, as we know, the droplet and the airborne, and in the droplet you actually have like more than five uh, millimeter uh, of the uh, droplet itself, and it's enough for it to do uh, a face shield, a mask, and a regular gown. But when it's airborne, you actually need to have like N95, HEPA filter, and all of that. For your, for your standard contact stuff, you need your, uh, your gown, gloves, your face shield again, and your regular mask, hand hygiene, it's the most important, and don't forget that. So if you detect an outbreak after that, what is the appropriate response? So you have to, um, 
notify the authority. They're going to start their epidemiological investigation. They're going to look for how many patients is affected, what is the sign and symptom of the syndrome that they are developing, what is the exposure route that they have, and they will do a rapid lab identification. Then they're going to release for you what is the treatment, what is the antibiotic or the antitoxin you need to use. If, area, if they suspect that this area is contaminated, authority have to map this area, and you, they need to answer many questions. It's usually the answer, get, they get the answer after they have like multiple sampling from the place. Is the uh, incidence was spread by liquid or powder, or it's uh, any change in the physical or biological thing of the, uh, of the bacteria or the virus, make it more virulent or make it resistance to treatment? They have to answer this. After you have this answer, then as a medical provider, you will issue your correct PPE, you start your uh, first aid and treatment for the patient, implement the decontamination. And remember, the decontamination here is different because you have to include the building from inside and outside, especially if there is a gas or air stuff, and for uh, your vehicle. So, like really in conclusion, if we think about decontamination, it's really needed in, if, if there is a chemical exposure or a nerve gas agent or whatever, and we don't need it if this chemical is gas or if it's biological incidence, and we can actually delay it if we have a radiation incidence after we treat the patient and save the patient. And there is multiple methods that you guys know, the dry and wet, but for the biological, we're gonna add like the normal sterilization stuff that we do in the hospital and the autoclaving. So I'm going to talk now about the Grady experience. Actually, Grady EMS, uh, they are the hospital care provider, the pre-hospital provider for Atlanta City in Georgia, USA. So they developed this team, what's called biosafety team. It's mainly made um, after the attack of 9, uh, 9, uh, 2000, September 11. And um, they actually, initially it was like a SWAT support team. But after the SARS attack in Canada, uh, they start thinking, okay, what if we had to deal with a SARS patient and we have to um, transport an infected patient? What are we going to do? We need to protect our staff and ourselves, and we need to help the patient at the same time. So they developed this unit. And um, the leader for the unit is Dr. Uh, Alex Izukov. So actually what they do, they train their paramedics, a couple of them, and uh, they teach them the nature of the disease. They're going through courses and they teach others also in the area. Uh, their experience with the Ebola patient, uh, basically in 2015, they transported uh, the two uh, Ebola patients to Emory University Hospital. So what they did actually, they have five steps in their plan. How they gonna prepare their ambulance, what is their PPE, and what is the role of each one in the team, and how they gonna prepare the patient inside the ambulance. And here are some pictures and of their publication. This is actually the inside, the, the ambulance from inside. So what they did is, they are using the regular ambulances that for the daily operation. They didn't buy like an expensive unit or like wasting a lot of money. So what they did is the ambulance and they have like a plastic, very thick plastic draping and they actually wrap the ambulance all over from inside as a capsule. Uh, they remove everything out, the suction, the oxygen, anything the patient might need it and they wrap it up in plastic so they can use it. <clears throat> And this is the ambulance from inside. And actually, if you notice from the top, this layer also can, like when we close the door, it covers the door completely. So there will be no contamination for the ambulance whatsoever. Because even if you didn't do that, the ambulance have a lot of small spaces and the infection will get somehow, it will get contaminated and it will be very difficult to uh, disinfect. Okay. After that, how they prepare the patient. So they suggest two things. If the patient can walk, he can actually wear the Tyvek suit because for the Ebola patient, the patient, some of them, they're having vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and some of them, they were very, one of them was very weak to walk and the other one was fine. Um, so if the patient can walk, they can wear like the suit, which will be, which will be easier to transport the patient on and it will make the uh, transmission less. If the patient cannot, they actually grab up the patient with a cover 
and uh, they covering him completely, as you can see in the picture. Also, for the mask kind, if the patient have no vomiting, they actually can put a surgical mask. If the patient is vomiting, they are actually giving them uh, like a very thick bag so they can uh, vomit in it and they're not contaminating everywhere in the ambulance. So they're trying to keep the ambulance inside clean. The PPE that they use, actually the Ebola was, as you guys know, it was a contact mainly. So they use the Tyvek suits, double gloves, the hoodie. It was actually felt that the uh, googlies and the mask, the N95, were more than enough, but they choose to use the paper. Uh, the only reason they use that because it's make it's environmental thing because Atlanta is very hot. So if you think about it, when you are putting the googlies in, you will have the vapor, and then you cannot see. Then what's gonna happen with the paramedic if he wanna move the sweat? He will do like this, and then he might be infected and he will infect himself. So they don't want to have this movement from the staff at all. That's why they use the paper. It makes the environment cold for them inside so they don't have to touch themselves at all during the transport. The last thing is the staff. So the staff of the unit actually for each transport was four healthcare worker, two paramedic and one a supervisor and the EMS physician. The two paramedic, if uh, so the first one will be uh, fully uh, in the PPE full with the paper and everything, and he's the one who's going to take care of the patient. The other one will have the same without the paper, just the mask and the googlies, and he will drive the ambulance. If the patient need two paramedic, then the supervisor will don his PPE and he will drive the ambulance, and the two paramedic will be inside the ambulance. If not, then the supervisor and the EMS physician will actually follow the ambulance in the supervisor car. And mainly the reason for having the supervisor, he's acting as a safety officer. So they have this checklist when they are donning and doffing their PPE to make sure they are following the protocol specifically and they are not missing anything. And that's how they, like, they transported the patient successfully without getting infected. So lastly, uh, so rem just remember that the biological incidents, it's really like infectious outbreak. You need to be just cautious, always maintain a high suspicious if you have a multiple patient with different symptoms. Think of chemical versus biological. If you have a patient with abnormal rash, with respiratory or neurological syndromes, all the syndromes that they describe in the morning. And remember, first responder is not the first one usually who uh, counter these patients. You, you are the one, the physicians and the nurses in the hospital. And decontamination is really not necessary initially, but after they know the attack. And any questions? Andy? First of all, I want to say thank you for your wonderful presentation. You, you highlighted a lot of really important topics related to uh, what I would call biosafety. And I just wanted to point out to the, the audience that um, biosafety is a very complicated area. And uh, although we're all capable of understanding this, we all, we're all trained in the concepts of, of biology, many of the topics that were listed there, um, there are full courses on waste management, full courses on PPE. And um, I just wanted to point out a resource for all of you there is um, a website, it's the internationalbiosafety.org, internationalbiosafety.org. And on there, there's actually a list of certified biosafety professionals. Many of uh, your countries are represented. Turkey is on there. Um, I believe Jordan is, is well represented. So you can actually go to this website, find the people that are already trained in that, and call them or email them so you don't have to recreate everything yourself. So, Thanks again thank for you. Your thank you, Andy. Um, I, I was interested in the um, ambulance, so I'll ask this question to Dr. Tihal and Dr. Uh, Anwar. Have you seen or heard of uh, a special ambulance for chemical? I mean, I know for biological, you've you know retrofitted this ambulance, and I know in Los Angeles actually they actually made a, a biological ambulance. What about for chemical or radiological? Have you seen or heard of anything like that? Tim, maybe, have you? Yeah. 
So, so the, the, we, yeah, we go back to, to the basic decontamination site and in the hospital. If you do your contamination outside, it's more than 90% done. What if you don't? Well, what if you don't and they jump in the ambulance? Then you have to, first of all, identify the agent, the offending agent. Is it something that's only inhaled or is it actually skin contact? Or is it actually, as Dr. Tial mentioned, like airborne or, or um, you know, uh, like, um, uh, like droplets or something? So it depends on the actual, uh, you know, agent. To what about you, Tim? Have you heard about the ambulances? If we only have one or two patients, um, some of the ERs in the Chicagoland area, especially DC, et cetera, have preset decon rules. So if we can notify the I mean the ER? With, with PPE. What about the ambulance? Yes. Um, so they have the decon rooms, and they can set up faster than we can pull a hazmat team to the scene. So we drape the animals very similar to what they, we, she demonstrated for Ebola. We drape it like that, and we can do that faster, put them in the ambulance, and decon them faster at the hospital than bringing, especially in the winter, and then bringing out a full decon team and trying to decon somebody when the temperatures are below freezing outside. So it's primarily uh, contact protection. Yes. Not, nothing else, just con so basically yeah. just drapes. Yeah, so what we'll do is then, if we, typically we'll only do that if we know the agent, right. as the doctor said. So we know what level of protection, because you don't want to be in an A suit in an ambulance. Absolutely. If you can work in a C suit, I'm all good with that. I've worked for four hours in a C suit with a cooling vest. Cooling vest. Right. So we'll put the, the transport medics in a C suit, drape the ambulance, and then decon them inside at a hospital in a preset decon area. And it's much better for the patient than trying to decon them in the ice in the cold. Right. I think uh, for radiological, you know, if somebody's contaminated, you don't necessarily have to do that. They can just you can just wash the ambulance, you know, because of the just kind of a bunch of dirt, basically. But it's interesting for the chemical. Uh, Mark, were you going to say something? Uh, more directly to your question about a specific ambulance, specifically for a chemical incident or a radiological or a biological. <clears throat> the answer is yes. There are. Uh, specific units that have been designed for this purpose. Uh, they're marketed by various manufacturers, uh, but there is no standard. Uh, so each, each unit is, is, uh, is designed per the subject matter experts that that particular manufacturer was reached out to or worked with. Um, and most oftentimes, it's for a specific jurisdiction that came to the manufacturer and said, this is what we want, this is what we would like it to be able to do, this is uh, you know, the features that we want in it, and then they customize and build the unit and sell it to them. I know they do exist in the US, they exist here in the MENA region, I know that uh, Abu Dhabi has actually a fleet of them, um, both domestically and for the military. Uh, so the answer is yes, they do exist. Can you just order one? The answer is no. Yeah, they're going to force you yeah, for I wonder if they're necessary. Reasons. You know, yeah. Mark, I wonder if they are necessary. You um, know, for 99% of all events that we are aware of historically, I would say no. And are they meant to protect, uh, are they meant to protect the drivers in a plume, or are they meant to protect the patient from or the I, staff again, from the patient? You know, it's based on the request. I can tell you that yeah. the, because I was part of the, the, the team that helped design some of them, I know the military ambulances, for example, that UAE has, and this is public information, um, they do have uh, special filtration systems for the engine and for the cab so they can drive into contaminated areas. Yeah. But the civilian, uh, Civil Defense and EMS units, they don't have that particular capability. They don't need it. It's all internal. Thank you. Actually, actually Dr. Ziad, I, mean, I, will, I will add just one or two points. It, 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 at the end of the day, it depends on the budget. So if your agency has you know, quite a bit of budget, you can do whatever you want. For us, we have like decontamination units for the EMS department, but the, our turnover number, let's say, Per, per hour is no, no match to the fire department, and the fire department is no match to the National Guard, at least in where I'm from. But in other agencies, probably the military has much more resources. So we go back to the presentation is ask for help. Ask, that's why you run incident command system. You ask all these agencies 
to buffer because the last thing you want is you contaminate few ambulances and you still have to run day to day and actually minute to minute operations. So yeah, that's uh, it, dep point. it depends on resources basically. I'm All fine. right, big hand of applause to our speakers. <laughs> oh, did you have a question, Mazda? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Go ahead. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the last part of our uh, day with Mark Chambers and Tim Conley. Both of them are um, long-standing colleagues and partners with Minatox through the company Response Systems International. They are uh, very active in the MENA region, actually, and uh, do a lot of training on PPE, on uh, decontamination, disaster preparedness and response. And actually, in the U.S., they do participate in disaster response uh, for the federal government when needed. The, their objectives are to uh, show us the, some of the PPE that they have. Uh, level C is what we're going to do. Uh, we'll, we'll go through all okay, very good. Do you want a microphone? Yeah. You have, uh, would you like the one that you put on the ear? Yeah, that about the, the suits. We'll actually start with the level A suit and then the B suit, C suit, etc. Explain a little bit of the, each suit, but then focus on the level C. Uh, level C is most common in the first receiver field. Um, or in the hospital setting, well, there's a big difference in where you come from on your resources. Where I work, if you ask for a fire department hazmat team, you're waiting for an hour and a half. They're, they're not fast. In most cases, the hazmat team will be committed to the scene. So now you're waiting for a farther away team. So our hospitals have to have their own decon capability and have to have their own teams. And Mark and I have actually taught a number of hospitals together um, to, to build that capability. So we'll start with the suits. This is a level A suit. And Mark, you want to hold it up? Level A suit is one of the safest and most dangerous suits at the same time. And it's safest because it completely creates your own, your, your own ecosystem. Nothing can get in, nothing can get out. It requires you to wear an air pack, a self-contained breathing apparatus with pressurized air. The, so the benefit is you're safe from nothing getting in. The downsides are your core temperature is going to go up fast. You know, you are your own ecosystem. Nothing escapes. There's no air movement. You know, so your core temperature goes up. The humidity builds up. Your vision is off. So, and you have a very limited work time. So if you're wearing a, what they call an hour bottle, which means if you were sitting in a chair perfectly still in 100% shape, you could work for an hour. It's not true. Because you're moving, you're working, you're sweating. You, I mean, you all know as physicians that with your core temperature goes up, your tidal volume increases, you're burning through more air. All right? You also have to allow for decon time because you can't run out of air while you're being deconned. So you have to watch your air carefully. And I've seen people run out of air in the decon process and it does not go well. Okay? So it takes a lot of practice. In order to wear this suit, you have to, in the U.S., you have to go through almost 100 hours of training just to be able to wear the suit. And then in the states that I work in, you have to do 20 hours a year of continuing education to be in, work in this suit. So it's not something that you can just jump into. Additionally, it's twice a year, Mark, you have to pressure test the suit. So two times a year, you have to test the suit, make sure it's, it doesn't have any holes in it. Now, when you test the level B suits or the JS list, it's pretty simple. You can use flashlights. You can use other tricks. These actually have to be pressure tested. So that's a complex process in itself. Um, it depends on your resources. Um, some part, larger, larger organizations have the ability to pressurize it and test it. Some places do have to ship it out. But it's not something you can just do. You have to be trained in that process, too. Okay? Again, the suit's fully integrated. You have gloves. You have boots. You're still required to wear the over boots that have the basic chemical protection and the over gloves that, require, that have the basic chemical protection. Also, where we teach people is to wear medical gloves and then like a silver shield glove under that and then a medical glove over that to help with dexterity a little bit under this. And then you'll have another glove over this. Wow. How many gloves do you wear? Well, technically, you only need to wear three. I always wear extra medical gloves over it. Reason being, the silver shields is what we call them. You have no dexterity. You I mean, it's really hard to work in those. Where if you take a medical glove and put those over the silver shield, it helps with the dexterity, and you can work a little bit better. I kind of do the same thing in level B suits, is I take the medical glove, go over the top of everything, and because that helps with the dexterity also. The silver shield gloves are not fitted, so they're kind of sloppy yeah. on your fingers. So that's why I said... I'm going to ask a question here. 
I was in uh, I was in Abu Dhabi at the uh, Ruwais Medical Center. Maybe I, I believe you all worked there a little bit. Ruwais. Yeah, in Ruwais. Is that one we talked about? In Ruwais, and they have um, they actually put I, they want to insert IVs with these suits on and mm -hmm. and intubate. And yes. is this realistic to insert an IV with these three four gloves on? Not to do an IV, but to do an IO, it is. So what we typically teach is you can do, I, I've intubated in level A suit. I would prefer to put an eye gel in because initially that's just as effective. You can do tourniquets, you can do countermeasures, you know, Mark ones or dual kits. You can do IOs, you know. If somebody needs an IV, they're gonna, they're gonna take an IO in that situation. So you can do IOs. Um, you can, we've done, we train people to do bleeding control, rotate tourniquets, so if somebody has massive arterial bleeding, put a tourniquet on, bring them into the decon process, decon them, apply a second tourniquet, remove the first one, decon them again, and they're good to go. So you can do a lot of treatment, and actually, that's one of the things that we really push hard, is by the time, if you have a number of patients, by the time they get through the decon process, they're going to be dead. So treat them before they go to decon. That's actually one of the principles Mark said when we was teaching in Abu Dhabi, was triage outside. So you're getting the right people to decon first. You know, don't try to treat everybody, use common sense. But stabilize the patient best you can before you get them into decon, or you're gonna have a lot more fatalities. What are some of the more common indications for the use of the level A suit? So level A suit, I hate a level A suit. Everyone loves to put an level A, a suit on because it's cool. It looks hot, it's cool, you see it on TV. Um, I hate level A suit. Level A suit I only wear if I have to make entry and I don't know what the product is. Or the, as uh, Dr. Nelson talked about the SDS sheet says, this is really bad mojo. You need that level of protection to go in. If there's any way I can bump down to a B, especially a C, I do it as quickly as I can. Um, just because of the work time and that kind of stuff. So level A to answer your question is you don't know what the stuff is or it's so bad and that what, you can't What are some examples, in. some chemical examples of so bad? Uh, well, off the top, if you know, I was making entry into high concentration parathyroid on a marathon, yeah, okay. something like that, or... Nerve um, agents. What's that? Nerve agents. Nerve agents, absolutely. Or the simple trick is, and this is what I call common sense hazmat, if you look in a room where there's a release and everyone's dead, it's immediately dangerous to life and health. That's a clear indication. <laughs> well, you gotta go in eventually. But if you look in and they're still alive, that room's not an ideal H environment. So you can, like, you can go in a B or you can go whatever if you don't have the A resources available right away. And what is the cost? That one I'm gonna turn over to Mark because I don't know that one. Uh, so the cost varies, <clears throat> and PPE in general, um, like Dr. Nelson said, it's a whole other world of, of uh, details and intricacies and references. So a level A suit, for example, is called a level A um, because of the respiratory protection uh, as designated by OSHA standards, not necessarily because of the chemical protection. Um, so it's completely self-contained, has an element of chemical protection, uh, and that's why it gets the level A designation. Now, however, the suit material itself can be a number of different materials. Uh, this particular one's a training suit. I think it's made by Kapler, maybe DuPont or Lakeland. Yeah, it's DuPont. It's DuPont. So there's several manufacturers that use proprietary uh, materials to make their suits and then they publish the breakthrough times of some of the more common chemicals that hazmat, hazardous materials professionals use uh, would use the suits for and that's kind of how you pick so back to your question when would you need a level A I'll give you th uh, three scenarios one will eliminate hospitals there's there's virtually zero scenario in which hospital staff would need a level A. In the field medicine and responder world, we can get into this, but number one, it's a completely unknown agent uh, with suspected IDLH levels of some sort, that's your level A. And number two, you know the agent and the concentration dictates the use of a level A. 
Uh, so those are those are the two times you would want to use a level A. Yeah. yeah I No, agreed. And just to reinforce that point, the, the, you don't need it. You don't need it. You know, there, there's and, and and the only way you would need a level A at a hospital is if the incident occurred at the hospital, and in that case, still the hospital staff would not be the right. ones responding to the incident. It would still be an outside agency that that does this coming in. The hospital staff would be more in a uh, reactive isolation um, avoidance uh, mode, you know, protecting the area, getting, getting you know, people out and making sure that the contamination was, was controlled as much as possible so that these guys could come mitigate the actual event. Yeah, just to reinforce that point a little bit, there's two scenarios where you get patients in the air. They're going to they're gonna self-transport to the ER, which is what 90% of them do in an emergency or a disaster. 90, I think it's 93% is what the average is. If they were exposed to something, no matter how bad it was, and they were able to self-transport or get to the ER, how much exposure do they really have? Okay, they made it to the ER. They're still alive. They don't have a tremendous amount. They're not going to off-gas. They're not going to sing. So a level C is absolutely appropriate. For that. The other scenario is they go down on scene, the fire department or the first responders or whoever are going to show up and decon them and then bring them to the facility. So again, you're only doing a secondary decon in level C. So I agree with Mark and, and Dr. Um, Kazi, there's absolutely no reason to have anything more higher than level C at a healthcare institution. And you do not need a level A for a radiological That's No. I would go in radiological, I personally would go in level C with a PAPR. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever you're do, talking about hazmat suits, you can always decon at one level lower than whatever the suit is. So if Mark's in a level A suit, I can be in a level B suit to decon him. Thank you. Okay. All right, so any other questions on the level A suit? Okay. So level B suit is, um, his splash protection is a suit. Would you mind, Mark? Sure. Okay. But you can see it does not have integrated gloves, boots. Good. It could, but not all of them do, that kind of stuff. So it requires a little, a little work or a little love to put it together. So there's gloves, you would wear medical gloves, and then the silver shield typically is what we would wear, and as Mark described, and then and the outer glove, which is, I'll hold this, Mark, if you want to show them the outer glove over there. An example of an outer glove. This is a butyl rubber. This is not butyl, this is another type of butyl. Butyl is um, butyl's the gold standard for chemical. So if you know it's chemical and you get a choice of glove, then butyl is, is what you want to choose. This is your standard hazardous material glove. Okay. So you're going to have those gloves. Because it's not a fully sealed suit like a level A suit, you're going to need to tape the gloves, um, the boots, that you'd wear over the suit, you need to tape those on, and you use chem tape. And a lot of people say it's duct tape, but it's really not. The chem tape has been rated for chemicals, just like the suit and the, the boots, because you can't just buy boots at Ace Hardware or at the hardware store and put them on. Those are rated boots, and they meet federal standards or for... Go ahead, Mark. You well, I was just going to say, the, there's only two types of boots, at least available in the United States that meet, you know, the chemical standards for chemical response. One is manufactured by a company called OnGuard, and the, these will always be yellow or green with a yellow sole, so they're easy to recognize. The other is a, a, a boot called Tingly, which is an orange boot uh, with a white or eggshell colored sole. So you can, you can spot the, the real boots a mile away. I didn't realize you were into fashion, Mark. A little bit. A <laughs> <laughs> little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the chem tape, um, I guess typically, the ones I've always seen have been yellow, and they say chem tape on them. And if you, you, if you, if you know the chemical, take a minute and research the breakthrough time on the tape, too. What Just about don't the rely biological? on the suit. What hmm? tape for the biological? So biological, um, and feel free to jump in, please. Biological, the chem tape will cover it. Um, if you've got if you a um, Ebola patient or something like that where decon is appropriate, the chem tape, all the same procedures will cover it. And I really, I've never seen a biological agent that had a breakthrough time. 
So. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So for but, for bio, yeah. it, it, any mm. any tape that can um, stop airflow is uh, is sufficient. Uh, duct tape is going to be the main one you're going to see in bio. Yeah. I don't stock duct tape on mine just because I don't want people to get confused on game day at three o'clock in the morning when they haven't done this in a while because then they might accidentally grab the duct tape and use the chem tape. Um, it's kind of like train how you fight kind of deal. I made a mistake once. I was teaching somebody to operate a fire pump and I didn't want to pull all this hose off. So I was showing them a lever to pull, you know, so water would go out a different spot. Then we had a really big fire with people trapped and he couldn't get water because he was pulling the lever he pulled in training and not the one he was supposed to do. So I kind of believe train like you fight. So if we're going to train, let's use the real stuff. So on game day, you use the real stuff. So this tape, by the way, is the only tape in the world made specifically for chemical response um, with ratings. So if you, if you look, and we can pass this around if you like, right here on the label, it gives you the chemicals that it's been tested for, and uh, it's a minimum breakthrough time of 480 minutes. Um, so it doesn't, there are a lot of other chemicals it's fine for, um, but it just lists the, the main ones that's been tested for, and it doesn't make the list unless they can hold for at least 480 minutes. Okay. So you, you can yeah, one more point on the level B suit. Um, that one requires a self-contained breathing apparatus to be considered level B. So you have to wear an air pack for that. And go along with that, you have to do fit testing and physicals. And before you put any suit on, you should do vital signs measurements and that kind of stuff before you put the suit on to make sure the patient's healthy to put the suit on. Um, the funny part is, though, everyone sets a level of tachycardia. <laughs> and on game day, everybody's tachycardic because something bad happened and they're putting a suit on. So, all right, so we'll talk about level C. Level C actually is the same suit. The difference between level B and level C is respiratory protection. So for level C, you can have two different types of respiratory protection. You can have an APR, air purifying respirator, and this is an APR, okay? This is actually my deployment APR, the one that I bring with me when I'm deployed, okay? And then this is a filter. It screws in here on the side, and we're actually gonna address some, some uh, sort of volunteers up in a minute. They kind of, well, you were voluntold. So um, but this is a filter that you screw into here. And this filter is a CBRNE filter. It, if it's dry, it's rated for seven hours on most chemical agents. If it's wet, that cuts it down to an hour. So if it gets wet, you, your, your evacuation time is a lot faster. Um, it's not comfortable. No, with the product. Yeah. So this is, I mean, I've worked in this for probably 45 minutes to an hour comfortably. The difference between this and a PAPR, is everybody familiar with what a PAPR is? Is anybody not familiar with what a PAPR is? Okay. I can work much longer in a PAPR than I can in an APR. Because in an APR, I'm pulling air through the filter with, with my respirations. So you, without realizing, you're going to fatigue faster. You're going to dehydrate a little faster between that and the suit. Um, so it works, and it's very safe. And I'd rather be in this than an air pack because I still have more work time, and I don't have to worry about running out of air. But I'd much rather be in a PAPR. I mean, I've worn a cooling vest. So in the USA, I have a training facility, CDP. In a few years, I go there every couple of years just to keep my skills up. And a couple of years ago, I went to the hospital training program. And I worked during an exercise in four hours in Atlanta in August in a level C suit. And I was okay because I had a cooling vest on. And, you know, and the air is moving in the suit and all that. So I would much rather be in a PAPR than an APR. But again, my deployment one, because something happens, I can put it on very quickly and, and I'm good to go. Okay? All right. And we'll go through more of the, the level C when we bring our volunteers up. And show, and we'll go through this soon. We'll have Mark be our trained observer. One of the practices that I like, and it was a big topic during Ebola, is a trained observer. Um, somebody just standing back and just watching and make sure we're doing it right. You know, simple things with the chem tape. You know, if you don't put a tab on the chem tape, you can't get the suit off. 
And people make that mistake at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Have you ever made that mistake, doctor? <laughs> Thanks for being honest about that. All right? So simple things like that. You know, if you're doffing your suit, did you just make a mistake? Stop. Because a lot of times you make a mistake, you can fix it if you, before you go to the next step. You know, it's, okay, we're going to change the order of things. So the trained observer for biological chem, I think, is a really good idea. Okay? So this is JS list. This is military protection. Okay? JS list, Mark, do you remember when you switched from um, MOP gear to JS? 04. 04? Okay. JS is a joint service list. So all the U.S. military got together, and they wanted a common system. So this is it. This particular one is missing its suspenders because it's kind of a teaching one and actually not a real one. But it's an absorbent kind of protection, which is a little bit different than how the civilian systems work. It's, it's charcoal lined. So yeah. it's a completely different approach to protection. It has a barrier like the other suits, but it doesn't have a, uh, the same type of chemical materials. It's designed to breathe. So air can move in, uh, but liquid has trouble, and liquid gets caught um, with the charcoal. I mean, you, you can wear this, actually, uh, with VX. Yeah. If you had the appropriate uh, uh, CBRNA filter, you can... Yeah, if you were in an APR, I'd be very comfortable. To be honest, I'd be as comfortable in this as I would in most of the other hazmat suits. Um, this is actually reusable. You can wash it six times and keep reusing it. You can wear it for 24 hours in a contaminated environment. So it's actually one of the, it's very safe. It's got cinching, so you can cinch up under your boots. And actually when you wear the coat, there's a strap. Would you mind showing them the strap, Mark, that goes on between the legs? There's a strap that goes between your legs to pull it in tight around your waist. It's actually, if you think about it, it's one of the best designs. Um, it's flexible, it's easy to use, it's reusable, you can take it off, you can put it back on, okay? Um, anything to add on the JS list, Mark, you can think of? All right. And then, Mark, would you mind showing them this, the vacuum pack? Uh, sure. So, while we're talking about military, you know, these guys... They often have bigger budgets than the rest of us do, so they come up with a lot of things. They also have the luxury of uh, plenty of experiences to test things. Andy. So they, they teach us a lot. And one of the things that they've taught us is, you know, the, the bare minimum uh, grab-and-go PPE. Uh, they've done very well with that. And so have a seat on stage. This is an example of a, of a little bag that they use uh, for their grab-and-go PPE. Uh, you would put an APR, which is a mask and a filter, an FR57 from 3M, a, a C-burn filter, something like that. You would have your inter inner gloves, a pair of basically hospital you know, health care gloves. Throw your outer gloves in there. A vacuum-packed suit, um, rated however you want with chemical protective fabric to whatever degree you want. Uh, maybe level B, maybe level C, whatever you want, but your suit's right here. You can use your regular shoes that you have on, and you throw these booties, rubber booties, over the shoes and then tape, and you're ready to go. Uh, so all this fits in a little nice little bag. You can keep it, um, you know, wherever you, wherever you need to keep your emergency supplies or in your vehicle or uh, at the Starbucks. nurse's station, Starbucks, <laughs> wherever you want. Um, you can do that. And before they do the demo, I wanted to talk a little bit more just for a minute on the selection of PPE. Um, so you've got the A, B, C, and D, and, and the good doctor earlier talked about D. D would simply be um, any level of outer protection you desire, but no real respiratory protection. Uh, possibly a mask, but not a fit-tested mask. Um, so it's just a very rudimentary level of PPE. Throw on, a, throw on a rain jacket and a surgical mask and some hospital gloves, you're in level D PPE. So you know, it helps, but it, it's, it's not a real solution for anything. So when you select your, your PPE, you have to know that there are dozens and dozens of suits that are level B. 
uh, and you have to select the one you know that works best for your application which is very difficult when you don't know exactly what your application will be and so that um, that presents a problem a lot of times um, Tim talked about the trained observer each piece of PPE has its own very specific donning and doffing procedures. Every single suit is different from the other suits because mm -hmm. it's based on the way that it's manufactured. Maybe it has uh, integrated gloves, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it has a D-style hood instead of a Q-style hood. Um, maybe you use chem tape or duct tape. They're, they're different procedures. Maybe you use these orange booties Maybe you use these boots, uh, depending on your application, maybe your gloves go, maybe your, your, your arm goes over your gloves or maybe your gloves go over your, your arm piece. So you guys have to know this in hospitals, based on your selection of PPE, you have to produce, you have to put this together, this is not commercially available, the donning and doffing procedure for your specific PPE, for your filter, for your mask, for your suit, for your hood, for your boots, um, all of that. And that's very difficult. We learned that in the, uh, we learned it long ago, but we relearned it during the recent uh, Ebola crisis. And thankfully, one of our flagship uh, universities, Emory, um, has a stellar uh, interdepartment group that put together a very specific um, set of PPE that worked with the proper donning and doffing procedures. And they went several steps further, and this is available through Emory. They have a scenario-based um, chart or matrix. If we have this situation, we use this PPE, and this is the donning and doffing procedure for that. They furthered that, and you talked about earlier, the trained observer. The trained observer came out of Emory's effort in better preparing the, donor, the donning and doffing of PPE. So now there's an actual position in the process that has the, the procedure in front of them that watches you specifically and says, okay, step two, you do this, and then make sure it's done correctly. Okay, step three, you do this. This way the wearer of the PPE isn't burdened by having to do all this mentally on their own. So the takeaway from that is be very specific and selective on what you choose for PPE and also understand you have to generate procedure and policy based on that decision that you made. Uh, otherwise it won't, it won't work for you. It won't protect your employees or your staff from what you want to protect it from. I'm going to go over putting a level C suit on with the, with the APR. So before we put the suit on, a couple things we want to do. We want to get his vital signs, you know, make sure he's fit for the suit. You know, if he's got a fever, you know, tachycardia is one of the things. If they're grossly tachycardic, don't put them in the suit. But to be honest, who's not going to be a little tachycardic when you're putting a suit on? So unless you do it every single day, you're going to be a little tachycardic. You got the stage fright going, exactly. Um, you know, make sure that he's not dehydrated, he's not hypertensive, all those kind of things. Hungover. Hungover. Not that that ever happens, okay? We're also going to want to make sure, at this time while he's getting him dressed, we're also going to want to be looking at the patients, and we were talking about this a little bit last night. When you have an incident, the fire department or whoever's on scene is going to take a long time to set up, to get down range to meet her. If they're coming to your hospital, look at the syndromes. You know, does it look like a nerve agent or organophosphate? Or let's get our Mark 1s or our Duo Note, or Duo Note, Duo, say that for me, Peter. Duo Note. Duo Note, thank you. Get that ready. Those kind of things. There's a lot that we can do, you know, especially as physicians, standing back a little bit and looking at the patient that the caregivers might not see because they're focused on getting suits on, all these kind of things. So kind of look at the people you're dealing with and get an idea of what you need. Okay, so first thing, you never want the person in the suit to dress themselves. Okay, I've dressed myself in an emergency before. But ideally, you don't want the person to dress themselves because they're expending energy, those kind of things. And if you, who's had these suits on before? How warm are you in these suits? 
Even level C, you get your sweaty fast. Okay, so you want to try to do as little as possible while they're getting you ready. And in fact, he should, Andy should be sitting here drinking water. He should be pounding water to try to hydrate himself. And we all know it takes longer to get in your cells, but at least get some water going. So there's many names for it. Some people call it angels. Some people call it everything. I like the angel thing. So Peter's going to be his angel and help him dress. All right, so we're going to kick your feet off. Shoes off, I'm sorry. I should put the APR on now. Sorry, man, I saw this. Yeah. All right. So he's going to help him do that. While he's doing that, Peter would be putting, I mean, Andy would be putting medical gloves on. The bottom layer is always a medical glove, so when you, it makes it easier in the a, in a doffing process, and in the decon and doffing process. So he's going to slide those in. You notice he took his shoes off because we're using this boot. As Mark said, if you're using that boot and that suit, you would leave your shoes on and this all goes over it. But because we're using this one, we're gonna take the shoes off. I prefer myself to use this type of setup because when I use this one, I don't have that big of feet, but when I use this one, every time my feet or my shoes get caught in the suit, just for my thing. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and stand up. Okay, we're gonna slide the arms in, but we're not gonna zip it up, okay? Go ahead and sit back down when you're ready. Okay. And you can see why it takes a little bit of a help. All right, so go ahead and sit back down. So we're not going to zip it up. The reason being, once we zip it up, he starts cooking. He starts getting hotter. And we got to do some work before he's ready to go. So we'll go ahead and put the boots on. What's that? Headstand's going to be hard. <laughs> Andy wants to try to do a headstand in the suit, handstand in the suit. It's a training suit, I promise. All right. But that can happen in real life. It's time to change suits. What size shoe do you have? 12. Yeah, those are 13. You go... Usually you want to go two sizes up on your outer boot from your natural shoe fit. Unless you want to be like this the entire day. All right. So if you got more than one person helping him, he's got his medical gloves on. You can be sliding these gloves over his medical gloves, as Mark talked about with the several shields. Where did the duct tape go, Mark? The chem tape? We didn't have, oh, we're not I'm not going to open it, but I'm just going to show him. Oh, there's some in here. Okay. So at this point, we're going to put the chem tape around the boots and he would have the gloves on, he would have medical gloves, depending on the chemical, the silver shield, and then these gloves over. So why don't you throw these gloves on, Peter? Okay. So again, depending on the application and the style of suit, so for example, if he had a suit that did not include the, the footies, the feet in the suit, he would have the option of putting the legs over the boots. So for example, he was working in a, in a very wet environment that, that that contaminated material would run on the outside and not so much risk going inside the boot. So because he's wearing a footed suit and his, his boots are over, we have this entry point there. And so when we tape that, we wanna make very sure that nothing can get get in that. One of the major pitfalls that we see in people as they start out in the hazmat business is they tape too tightly and there's a circulation issue. So you want to make sure that, that you do that correctly. This is not something anyone can do without a serious amount of practice, a serious amount of training. Virtually everything that you do here uh, can can cause injury or, or even death if, you, if it's not done correctly and those stakes go way up when you're dealing with some certain chemicals like VX but more importantly biological agents. Okay. So the next step is we'd start taping the boots, the gloves, all those kind of things. Again, we're not zipping up until we have to. So when you tape, which we're not going to tape that kind of stuff, but when you tape 
you want to make, people make tabs like this, you have to remember, in most cases, he's going to have to try to take that tape off himself as part of the decon process. So when you make a tab, unless you don't like them, that's a tab. Be generous. Be generous. Something they can grab with their whole hand and pull, so they're not trying to grab the little thing. Okay? So you would tape here. What's that? Death is not part of the demo. Exactly. <laughs> and I'll even ask, the, if, I'm, if I'm the angel, I'll even ask the person, are you right-handed or left-handed? You know, because that way I know where to put the tab to make it easier for them. You know, put both tabs on this side, put both tabs on that side, whatever is going to be easier for them. Also, don't wrap it 12 times. Okay? Just go around so you can seal it and leave it at that. When you wrap it 12 times, then I have to get a seatbelt cutter out and cut myself out of the suit, and I don't enjoy that, okay? So, which again, we're not gonna actually tape. So at this point, we would go ahead and stand up for a second. We go ahead and zip them up to about here. All right. So, so again, this is the APR, and then this is the filter. These filters have a little tab right here. I've watched many times People put this in the mask and they're, when it's on, and they can't breathe and they wonder why. Make sure you pull that tab. This particular APR, and some of them are different, are designed to have a cap on one side and screw in on the other. Okay? So when he puts this mask on, before he puts the filter on, you want to do a safety check to make sure you have a seal, which we'll do. So he'll have the mask on, he'll cover this filter and then suck in, and the mask should collapse to his face. If air leaks in, it's going to leak in when he's breathing it, so we have to readjust it and make sure that he's got a good seal. So you might want to lose your glasses yeah, for the part. Challenge people, what you? So there's, what the, there's, colder, there's a couple of things you can do. If you've got lots of money, you can actually get the, the, the masks with your prescription. For everyone else in the world, they make little things that will hold your glasses in place without the, the side portions. Okay. So, and that's what most people do, is they just get the holders within their mask. Uh, okay. Tim, before you put him in the mask, Dr. Bashat has to catch a flight. Mm -hmm. He wants to say just goodbye. Tomorrow. Okay, absolutely. Because he may take more than 15 minutes. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We are uh, rich, uh, together since four uh, days. Uh, we are very pleased from uh, our side, uh, from Turkey side and the uh, EPAD, and also Iminatox. Thank you very much for all speakers, for all participants. Please forgive us for lax and uh, deficiency. Uh, as for EPSIS, it is our. Uh, okay. I kind of uh, ask you if you can send what does go done good, what needs to be uh, improved. Uh, it will be our pleasure if we get. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, just one sentence. There is a very famous uh, from India. He is one of the past uh, president of the India. He is not just a politician; he is also a philosopher. His name is uh, Abdul Abdul uh, Abdul Karim, uh, I think. Abdul Kalam he has a very very good suggestion. Just one of them. He said, "The dream is nothing that while you are uh, uh, you, you see while sleeping you do it, you see it." Dream is the thing that me. doesn't make you to, to sleep. Yes, I think as a Turkish emerging physician, we uh, come over one, one hour dream. Thank you very much. Thank you. You are welcome, everybody. I wish you to uh, wish your family in safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Sorry about that. No, no problem. <laughs> he wants to see the handstand. All right, so we're going to go put the mask on. And again, he's not doing it himself. He's having somebody help him. Okay? So once he gets the mask on, we'll put the hood up. We'll check the safety. We'll duct tape, screw in the filter, and he's ready to go. This will be type C because it's air purifying and not an air pack on his back. So, so the major difference in B and C is... B, you have your own air in a bottle. Or, or, yeah, it's like a vest with it, like the firefighters have. That's, that's B, or they have what they call supplied air, which is a big hose that right. goes into your suit that runs to an air generator. Level C is, is an air filter of any type. Pepper, this type, there are other types. 
If you're filtering the air, it's level C. If you're bringing your own air in a bottle, it's level B. If your own air in the bottle is inside your suit, it's level A. All right. So this particular one has tape here that you can peel off and secure. Check his tape. Just do, you know, the train observer, as Mark explained, we do a safety check. Make sure we didn't miss nothing. You're good to go? Yeah. All right. And then he's off to do, to decon or do whatever his mission is for the day. Okay. What? Ask Dr. Kazi. <laughs> so we're, we're not going to go through the doffing procedures, but you guys get the idea. Just like there's a very specific... Oh, he's really going to do it. <laughs> Please get a picture of this. <laughs> no, no good. No dice. All right. Um, so just like there's a very specific procedure of how to put it on, there's a very specific procedure to take it off. The doffing or taking it off is actually more important than putting it on. As we learned in the Ebola event as well, most of the healthcare providers' infections were caused by improper doffing of the PPE. They took it off wrong and infected themselves. So it's very, very important. Yeah, and just to reinforce it, I think Mark hit it, but I just it's such an important point, is that's the importance of that trained observer. Because when he comes out, he's hot, he's tired, he's sweaty, he wants water, he wants air conditioning, he wants to sit down. Would you agree after being in this right now? Those are the things you want. You want out of this suit. So if you don't, like Mark said, if you don't have that trained observer, mistakes are going to get made. Okay. Any other questions about this, or do we want to let him bake for a little while? We can get him out of it. All in favor of baking them? <laughs> uh, we do get cases occasionally where we have given antivenom and there is refractory coagulopathy. For us, uh, for me, I rarely uh, found like uh, the antivenom is not working. I cannot remember like maybe few cases. And then, the, although we are sharing the same, uh, and that's the, the, the other point, though we are supposedly sharing the same species and the same use of the antivenom. And oh, we give way more doses than how, how much... Maybe you have a, a new species which are not covered. That is, uh, so that is what is... Uh, 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 so uh, I'm sure in, uh, if you like uh, in Oman, do you know which uh, types of snakes are available in each area? We know. It's available there. Uh, I don't think you know exactly know what exactly is there. Nobody knows exactly what is there. What? I mean, I mean, we know historic data, university is total data. I think in universities, they think they have, have data. We have uh, good data on the type of species that we have in the country. Not published. It is there. Maybe not published, but it is there. The WHO don't, don't, don't have it. Yeah. Even as gray, they call it gray data, which is unpublished, I mean, governmental data. It's not there. It is. It is available. But, okay. But there isn't any specialized herpetologist in the area? There is. Yeah. So they know. They would know. Yeah. Okay, like in Lebanon yeah. also, there is one only few published, yeah. but there is a good. Herpetology. Yeah, I saw this is another problem in the uh, main region. So the data are there, but not published. Yeah, and we do not have access to this data. No, but, but I'm sure if you will look, you will find them. it. I will show you the slides. No, they show published. They have everything. Yeah, because they will check from where they will have their data. Governmentals. They go to the, they go no, the WHO, no, I don't think they, don't they will have it. From. So WHO, let's be clear, WHO, they don't go governmental. WHO, they go to Ministry of Health. And no, Ministry have, of Health is the government. No. no, 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 it's different there. So the one who's taking care of this, and responsible for this, is Ministry of Agriculture or Ministry of uh, Education or Environment or, education, or, 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 or Universities. It's so universities, it's next? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it is not the Ministry of Health. It's the it's okay. the College of Science in the universities usually, yep. and that's the situation we have there in Oman. Yep. And so WHO are basically reaching their own agency to get the information from. And most of the time, there is no much uh, collaboration, collaboration between the two. So even if you are approaching the Minister of Health and assuming that the Minister of Health will get you the information, they will only provide what they have, but not what the others have. Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, so you cannot rely even on the, I mean, the village will send the guidelines about the, uh, the management of snake inflammation, 
We don't use it at all because Cause that's African. Reflect. Yeah. It does not. <coughs> yeah, that's that's African. Mm. Uh, well, at least I t talk from experience in North Africa. We don't know what's going on. See, in in today's <laughs> no. date and time, if we say that I'm talking from experience, mm. which is unpublished, nobody doesn't, would believe. Yeah. Doesn't stand anywhere. Yeah. So the first, I think the first step, forget the collaboration, go back to your own hospitals or your institutes. If you have a poison center, start making a local snake bite registry. What you can do at Minatox is make it similar. You know? Yeah, th so that's what it should be. And then you, you, then you have that collective. If you, if you say that Minatox has made a, a, a snake uh, bite registry, then you will have to go through the whole ministry set up and get permission. Uh -huh. We're not going to do it that formal way. We're just trying to What I'm trying to say is that you as start meeting. doing it individual levels, start collecting yeah, the know. similar kind of data, exactly. and but then that's share the it at we're talking about. this. Yeah, that's the collaboration we're talking about, is to have it in, in different area, whatever, uh, whichever way it's going to be, and just try to start to collect. And, and it won't be a bad idea if you are making a, a, a workshop on envenomation to invite your herpetologist who has actually seen the snake. Because they would have a reasonably good idea what are they dealing with? Take, uh, so, so the hepatologists that you have in Oman, uh, the Daria. Yes. So do you, do you use them a lot? Do you? Uh, when we uh, have difficult cases, like we don't know exactly what's going on, and we have the, the snake, we do. We do contact them <coughs> to identify the snake. So keep, keep those snakes preserved if you can. Mm. Make a museum, keep those snakes preserved, whatever you can get, because that will help you. So, so, um, is that, is that right what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Because if you keep those snakes preserved, at least later on it can be used to teach, show the clinician, you know, what you see on the picture sometimes, uh, if, you know, and what you see, real snake, mm. maybe a little different. Different. Yeah. As do, do any center or any one of you have already a file to collect the data? Yeah, I do. do you have? I do. I'm using the. Do you have? We have a, a Data to uh, a file to collect the data. Like a database for snake elimination. Yeah, yeah. so a file to, to collect the data. <coughs> maybe, maybe, maybe we can take all the files, okay. compare them, mm -hmm. and make a common file oh, yeah. and send them to everybody. So that everybody has the same <coughs> kind of data. That same kind, yeah. you know? Yeah, so that's what we will And then we can start. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's what we should start with, is, is to unify yes. the, 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 the form to collect this data. The, sh the sheet of this the data. Sheet. To, to that's correct. Collect. So I think somebody has to collect all the sheets and, and make it uh, And then look at them. And we can do it in a year, we can do it on a regular basis. We can create it. Uh, so whenever, can you meet, whenever you meet at Mina Talks. Yeah. Actually, I found a nice article recently published uh, about all the terrestrial medicines in the Middle East and toxicon. So it combines different, all the different areas in the Middle East. And uh, it's an excellent article that uh, I found through research case. I told him, can you share? Because he cited my article. So, and they talk about different, like Amman, like in Jordan, like all the different areas. Yeah, but but this is not based on. Uh, oh, right. The article was written by um, actually people from the UK and Jordan by Zuhair Amir, Hamad Abu Bakr, and David Warren. Oh, and David it was published in Lucy, no. Kenya. Uh, when was it published? It was just published, actually. Like is, is, is 2020 this now, and I asked him to share the article. Yeah. And do they have a, a list of parameters to collect? Or Everything. No? I mean, they have literally I mean, that a lot of all the comments. Yeah. Uh, all the with pictures with anti-venom from where they're getting it, the complications even. Uh, 
in certain yeah. cases. So I that's, uh, that's a theoretical. 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 Yeah, yeah, I got very it. interesting. David Rohn, I met with him in Australia. I don't know if anybody knows David Rohn. You yeah, know him, uh, David Rohn. David Rohn. David Rohn. David Rohn. You know him, but yes. who's, yeah. who's written this article? David Rohn. David Rohn. Yeah. The, the, the person from Middle East. Jordan. Jordan. Jordan one. Is he a physician? Is he a herpetologist? Yeah. Uh, the biology department. Uh, and the Department of Biological Sciences, so I would, I would think he's a... So he's not a doctor, doctor of that's, that's what I'm... That's Very the deep. point I'm trying to make. Yeah. No, but, uh, I, but, but I think uh, Bruno was right on the spot. This is a theoretical... It's a theoretical... A theoretical thing. view. Yeah. It's not based on data. No, data. No, no. There's no data. It's based on the published articles and data from other places. And there, is no, uh, there is no For example, I published about Lebanon, all what we know about our space. Yeah. And then he used Lebanon, Lebanon, Lebanon. And he used similarity from different I'll places. tell you an example. Uh, I'm Lebanon. not trying to... Over, there is no data. There is no, a, data. there is no data. I'm telling you. Lebanon you have, and I know you have, and I've read your article. Saudi Arabia they have. Oman they have... Uh, 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 two. Uh, two. two. To, so they have some. The rest is nothing. I mean, so that's 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 uh, the, the see the, the 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 point which I'm trying to make is you are a clinician. I'm a clinician. If a person comes to me with a snake bite which is resembling viper bite, I'd say this is the viper bite, and that's it. It's correct, right? I haven't seen this snake. What viper? You know, I'm, why I'm trying to make this is issue is because we believed for for donkey years that we have only four toxic snakes, but now we have found that there are more. Interesting. You know, there are at least four more toxic snakes, and we have no antivenom for them. Um, that's probably uh, tally with what. That's what she was trying to say. That we found, we end up with patients who have persistent coagulopathy. We will still label it as viper. So when we publish it, it'll get published as viper, and somebody who quotes it will quote it as viper. Yeah. But it's, what kind of viper? That is where the herpetologist would come in and tell you, you know, what kind of snakes are prevalent in that particular area. I understand. And then you go from there. What uh, do you think? Yes. I'm right because if I if I write neurotoxic, and I write that it is cobra. Look, it's it it will it will get recorded in the medical sheet as cobra. It will be cited as cobra. It will <coughs> but are you will just go as cobra everywhere. Yeah, but you need will be like cobra is causing cardiovascular disease. Yes, uh, yes, but you need both. Yeah. So but you need both. That's what I'm trying to mm -hmm. tell you. This yeah. is the problem. No, but you need With both. Uh, uh, most you of need, the time. You need both. You need you both. You need the clinicians and you need somebody. You need both, but you need someone who will identify what snakes are. Yes, we had we we had Ian Simpson who worked with us on this project, uh, and uh, Bob Norris from Stanford. So they went all over the country. They didn't only meet the physicians. They went to the villages. They went. They met these snake charmers, these snake catchers. You know, looked at what snakes were. And then they came out that there are more, which you don't know. So, so I think the, the best step now is, I think what we do, we will start with this data sheet with the, the, the guys, mm -hmm. we start with this data sheet. And we send it and people start to collect. And whenever you have the opportunity to ask a hematologist, uh, get them to identify or get, take a picture. Mm -hmm. You can take a picture also if you, if you have a dead snake. Yeah. And you not can't smashed, store it. Not smashed snake. No, even, even see, for them, smashed, even if it is smashed, even, smashed, even if the head is smashed, no, no, they can the, identify the, 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 the by the yeah. scales. Yeah. So if you have a good picture, they can sometimes, but obviously if you have a snake in front, then it's, <coughs> it's better. But we have to start from mm. one point. At one point. Okay. If we don't start, we, you, so you just keep yes, discussing. We'll, we'll
will be at the same <coughs> next year. So you know, but one, of, one of my I think yeah. the easiest is to start by shaking and yeah. Like some so maybe you Asha, I will start it and I will send it to everybody yeah, everyone. to edit it. I have it, so I'm just gonna send it to send you. It yeah, but, but maybe first all the people can send you their own shit. Okay. Okay. You, you Adria, do you wanna send me yours? Yeah, the sheet. Saudi and Kutan. But you have one used. Uh, I have one with a person our center. Okay, can you send it to me? Can you send it to me? Yeah, it's, uh, I already I have the article that it is. Send it to me. So all, all, all will send you their own sheet. Yes. And then you, you can make a common sheet okay. by taking all the parts. Variants, yes. And then send you send it to everybody. We, we criticize, we, yeah. we give our opinion, and yes. we send it back to you. And then you make we the final to. version and you send it to everybody. Yeah. So that collect data. Yes. So the ones that we, I, I know it's limited because one center, but this is the, was done in collaboration with herpetologists, yeah. which is the best one in Lebanon. And we know about all our like spiders or snakes or lizards. Or, so. No, probably it's good, but but he has to say it's applicable everywhere. Correct. That's that's the important thing. What you what you just said, applicable everywhere. Now, if you write that you want to do. Uh, uh, some fancy coagulation parameter as a data collection may not work. So you, you need to know what is available where and what can easily be done across the board. So that is again uh, important. Yeah. I mean, let, let's say somebody says thromboelastography for every patient who comes with coagulopathy who may not be available. No. It's true. Okay, so it was a good introduction. That's very good introduction. Actually. So now we can maybe start the <coughs> lectures, <coughs> make them more interactive. So we'll make it uh, so how it Yeah, take your time. Um, so welcome everybody. Just um, for the state of animation, um, um, this is the second year we do this, and hopefully we'll carry on doing it. Um, every year it's an important uh, issue that's not only in the Middle East but worldwide, as you're probably, probably aware. Um, but there are more than 3,000 uh, species of snakes, 250 are of medical importance, and WHO classified them of category one and category two based on um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 whether they're high or low venomous snakes and the encounter with human and the effect that they cause on human category one, category two. And as just we tried to discuss earlier, <coughs> the Middle East in somewhere between, we have every country have between four and nine medically important snake species. So we are not as bad as Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa or South America, but nonetheless, we have our own uh, share of uh, bad snakes. Um, so, in terms of the types of venomous snakes, I'm going to concentrate today on the lapid and the bridi because this is what we have mainly here. So, the lapids, as you know, the cobras, the mambas, the coral snakes, they are typically neurotoxics, but not exclusively neurotoxics, short frontline snakes. The bridi eyes, you have two, the true vibers and the pit vibers, shallow, long, Hollow, uh, hollow long hinged uh, fangs that inject and withdraw. They are commonly necrotizing, hemotoxic, and anticoagulant. However, you do have the, your, uh, the sorry, anticoagulant uh, necrotizing and hemotoxic, but you do have the neurotoxic ones. <coughs> Example, <coughs> the Mojave rattlesnakes. <coughs> So in terms of just a bit of definitions, the venoms is a mixture of toxic proteins and peptides. And the toxin <coughs> is a pure toxic substance with natural origin. Snake venoms is a product of protein synthesis and it's a mixture of enzymes and toxins. <coughs> and there are about 20 types of toxin known, and there are so many unknown yet, of uh, toxic enzymes. 
Some of them are very specific. They go and target specific areas in the body and they don't touch others. While others have effect on different areas. <clears throat> and it's, so the snakes, so the, the, the function of this venom is three things. Acquire the prey, digest the prey, and defense against enemies. So this is extremely important because in no way in the evolution of the snake that the venom being produced to cause consumptive coagulopathy, that does not serve the snake purpose in any way, shape, or form. Because what you need, the snake need, uh, to, if you need to kill, to eat. So the effect of that uh, 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 hemo hemotoxic effect of the snake bites compare it on a small uh, prey like a bird, it's completely different from a bite on a human. The, the effect on a, s on a small prey is sudden thrombotic effect that will kill the, the, the prey instantly, while in human it can be a consumptive coagulopathy which should carry on <coughs> for, for days or uh, hours and days. So the effect is different, so that's a that we need to understand. Um, the other things which is important, like some classifications, we say elapids are neurotoxic and um, uh, vibridiides are hemorrhagic, which is a completely wrong uh, uh, definition because some elapids have uh, both local, uh, the uh, local toxins uh, and uh, hemotoxics and uh, vice versa, some of the vibridiides have neurotoxic uh, uh, neurotoxins. So the, the notion that elapids and neurotoxin and vibridiides are uh, hemotoxic, hemorrhagic, is, is, is a completely inaccurate classification. So uh, neurotoxins uh, mainly are elapids, uh, but as we said, they are in the vipers, like the Sri Lankan Russell vipers and some European adders, um, uh, the multiplayer snakes, um, they have neurotoxins, and it's very, uh, unique. It, it is very important to understand what sort of neurotoxins that you have in your region because the management is different um, uh, um, because of the mechanism of action is different. So if you look at, so we have two types, either presynaptic neurotoxin or postsynaptic neurotoxin. So the presynaptic neurotoxin, which is mainly phospholipase A2, um, and the postsynaptic, which is mainly polypeptides, so, talks about the presynaptic neurotoxin. What they do? They come, uh, attach to the presynaptic membrane, enter into the cell, damage the, syn the synapses, release the acetylcholine, causing a surge of acetylcholine, deplete it, followed by paralysis. That process is irreversible. As soon as it starts and the damage happens, it is, as much as you give antivenom, it's not going to work. And you just need to wait for the axons to start to repair, which just takes days, weeks, or whatever. In reverse, the postsynaptic, they block the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, so they stop the acetylcholine from working. So displacing the acetylcholine from that receptors will give you a recovery, so giving Antivenom, anticholine steroids, which some people <coughs> try, will help, will be, will, will, is a, a form of a treatment. So that's an extremely important distinction that one has to make when, the, when looking at the neurotoxins. So presynaptic neurotoxins take, usually take more than an hour to develop by the toxin to reach the motor in the plate and start to work. And as we said, this is... <coughs> Uh, the damage cannot reverse, if, if damage starts, you can't reverse it. And good your example, your crates, your tiger snakes, and type out. Um, the postsynaptic neurotoxins, which are mostly talking about the cobras, uh, they are polypeptides, bangarotoxin and cobra toxins. Uh, and as we said, they attach to the postsynaptic membrane and they block the, 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 the receptors. You displace them, you, you get uh, some recovery. Um, now it's been, I don't know from experience of the panel here, but it's been 
postulated that the, the paralysis you get with the presynaptics are uh, the, the tend to be worse and more severe, and probably that has some something to do with the way that they they damage the the the, 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 the synapses uh, completely. However, there's published data now with uh, the cobras uh, that they are life-threatening. Paralysis has been documented with, with the postsynaptics uh, neurotoxins. Uh, there are other two types of neurotoxins, dendrotoxins and fasciculins. And a good example for those is the mamba, the black mamba, the, the African black mamba, where they, they, <coughs> they work syn synergetically. So the dendrotoxins will do the presynaptic effect, they will go into the cells, they damage the synapses, they release acetylcholine, and the fasciculins will block the anticholine esterase. So they will, the surge of the acetylcholine will continue, continue, and continue, and that will give you the paralysis. It augment the paralytic effect. Um, there is the, the Taiwan, the Chinese branded crate, has a unique neurotoxin. Anybody knows what is it? It has both the pre and post synaptic neurotoxins. And this is a unique thing for the Taiwan uh, branded crate, the Chinese branded crate. Time of onset of paralysis, as we said, it may take more than an hour. She usually starts with tingling, numbness, sensation, then the cranial leg first to start to, to get affected. Bit of ptosis followed by ophthalmoplegia. Six nerves usually start to affect first and it progresses from there on. Um, if it's, and then it starts to lose your reflexes and you start to have respiratory depression and, and, and death. Um, and this is the best example how to, so it started the ptosis, your ophthalmoplegia left um, the sixth nerve uh, palsy, faceless or expressless faces, and then fixed dilated. Uh, so that's pretty much about neurotoxins. Then you have the myotoxins. And the myotoxins, you have the two types. So that you have the local, and you have the systemic. Systemic is associated with potential. It's devastating and lethal. <coughs> and the locals, it works on different effects. Um, uh, sorry, before that, we ought to say uh, not only skeletal muscles get affected by, the, the, by, by my toxins. Although smooth muscles very rarely get affected, you have the cardiotoxins. I've been documented cases of severe cardiotoxicity and cardiomyopathy <coughs> following, the, the following snakes and venomation. Though it's not clear whether that's a direct effect or indirect effect of being sick and etc. Um, having said that, uh, so the, you have the local myotoxin and the systemic myotoxins. The local myotoxins, with the most important, the snake venom uh, methyl proteinases, which we're going to talk about later, which have both direct and indirect effect. So it causes damage to the muscles by <coughs> this, um, uh, myotoxicity, plus the edema and the ischemia surrounding it, and the hemorrhagic effect on the capillary leak, it will give you the indirect uh, 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 myotoxic effect. Local myotoxin cause damage to the basement membrane. The systemic myotoxins, they don't do that, and there's some uh, differences, and we'll show you it later, how that's important. Um, and then you go to the systemic myotoxin, and there are two types here. The, the ones which are uh, pure myotoxins, they, they, they go systematically, but they don't affect anything else apart from the, the, the muscles. And the phospholipase A, which affect both the, the, pre, uh, toxic, uh, the presynaptic neurotoxin, also have an effect of the muscles. Now, it's been postulated that the pure myotoxin is more uh, associated with more severe um, uh, rhabdomyolysis and muscle damage effect uh, because of the other, the presynaptic, the, the mix, uh, they, they have the diluted acceptors of the, enzy the, 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 the enzymes are different, so, uh, and they don't cause damages on other, on other organs or other tissues, so you get a diluted effect on the muscle. Not sure how, how true is that. Um, so chemical types of myotoxins, we said there's some cardiotoxins, the phospholipase A, and non-neurotoxin myotoxins. Um, not going to dwell too much on that. And this is an interesting slide, uh, uh, Tiger, I think. 
Yeah, attack snakes that in Fusula um, Vase 2 injected into a rat's skeletal muscles. After three hours, the, the damage, uh, 24 hour t t transverse section, and 24 hour uh, uh, longitudinal section. Um, yeah, so we discussed this that the, the, some of the myotoxins, if they don't specifically attach to spe certain acceptors and attach to many acceptors, but the damage only on skeletal muscles, uh, acceptors or receptors, and you end up with a systemic m muscle effect, but that not uh, necessarily a, a severe one. The ones who are attached specifically to certain acceptors on skeletal muscles, they tend to cause more uh, systemic effect because of the concentration. Uh, no, no. Uh, with systemic effect, the basic membrane remains intact, so regeneration is uh, uh, muscles can occur. However, you get a regeneration only of slow, slow twitching muscles, and this is an effect of see the the the, the long lasting effect of the systemic myotoxic of uh, the snake bite. And when we talk about myotoxins, you talk about rhabdomyolysis, which can be severe, very, very severe, and end up with uh, renal failure, hyperkalemia, etc. And the long-lasting effect of muscle wasting if the inflammation was severe with systemic effect. Um, your lipids, um, many Australians, lick traits, sea snakes. Uh, do you see? Uh, Ashish in, in India? Sea snakes? No, we don't. No, so the, the, your crates, uh, do, do, do they cause myotoxin? myotoxin? No, no, we haven't seen any myotoxin. No. Uh, the vibridi eyes, the, some Americans, uh, rattlesnakes, uh, or American colleagues, myotoxic effect is uh, a lot. You see it, yeah. Mm. You actually can see myokemia with lots of the, even the non Mojave rab snakes. They do. Yeah, and you see muscle breakdown. CK goes up all the time. Yeah. Talking about the hundreds of thousands of this list. What was that? The, the CKs. CK goes actually in the tens of thousands, uh, not hundreds of thousands. Okay. It's uh, not uh, a And the long lasting, is there the systemic long lasting dis uh, disabilities effect of muscle wasting? Very uh, few chronic uh, effect that we see. There's some local effects in terms of. If it's your fingers, toes, you see some okay. uh, waste that's there, you can see some... But that's most of the probably a necrotic right. effect. Yeah, um, it's not. And very rare you see like neuropathy here and there because post-acute post, post -acute Yeah, that's correct. Okay, uh, interesting. So um, the quadrupathy, and this is the, and the interesting subject. And uh, as I was saying earlier, um, the snakes in their evolution they did not attend, attend <coughs> the evolution did not bring them to the point that they wanted to cause coagulability in their prey. It does not serve them any purpose. Um, the, the, the effect of the same venom on the small prey is completely different on a human. Um, uh, they wanted to paralyze the prey and get, get it eaten. Uh, they're not interested to let it go or uh, bleeding for, for a day or two. So your conceptual coagulopathy, thrombotic, anticoagulant, antiplatelet, and direct hemorrhagic effect. And you can find a single venom, single toxin which has two different effects and augment its, it's augment its action. We'll talk about it in a minute. Most species have, uh, have uh, hemorrhagic um, effects, um, hemorrhagic uh, 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 toxins. Um, so, for example, uh, <coughs> the the methylproteinase protromine activator of the ET species has also a hemorrhagic um, effect. So, the the concept started the concept of coagulopathy. That activate the protro uh, protromine uh, activators that the coagulopathy the consumption. Meanwhile, the hemorrhagic cause the damage to the to the wall, to the blood vessel wall, give you a shear stress effect. And that will augment the bleeding. So you get worse bleeding. And in a study, they compared the, the efficacy or the, the, the potency of the protein activators of the Australian elapid and the ACUS found that the, um, the 
the potency of the proton beam activators in the ich is much more potent than the australium. However, the bleeding is worse with the ich is than with the, with the, with the australian lapid, and they they um, they put that down to the effect of the augmenting effect of the both uh, the the concept of coagulopathy and the hemorrhaging effect. Um, it's used to be called BIC, which is wrong uh, descriptions, and it's, it's, it's basically that you activate the coagulation cascade to the point that you consume all of your coagulation factors. Um, and you have three types of uh, uh, um, activators, uh, the prothrombine activators, the factor 10 and 5, and thrombine-like enzymes. And you end up into that circle until you consume all of your factors. Um, and it's give you somehow clinical uh, biochemical picture similar to the uh, IC, but uh, it's not the IC because, as you know, the IC is associated with multi-organ failure and it's associated with much more, uh, much worse um, prognoses. Um, so th we discussed that earlier. Uh, don't want to go through it. Now, anybody has any uh, experience using point of care I know for um, for snake elimination? Um, uh, I don't know. It's just interesting to to mention it here. It should not be done uh, in snake elimination because of the fact, um, and this is proven. There's a couple of studies on this because of the fact is the <coughs> laboratory tests on I know test the clot formation. So um, you get the blood, you get the plasma, you add to the tissue factors, and then measure the time to form a clot. And that's, an, that's what you need. But when you use the point of care, um, it will give you, the, it, they will add the tissue factor, and then they will add um, a substrate, which will electro, uh, uh, electro substrate, something substrate. And then <coughs> they see the cleavage, the thrombine cleavage, uh, of that substrate, and they measure that. And that's the wrong way of measuring INR in this situation, because thrombin is always there. But you don't want the thrombin, you want the clot. So it gives you a wrong reading, and it tells you it's normal, why it's not normal. Uh, so point of care of INR is, is uh, pointless. Um, sorry to mention that as well. I thought it was a bit of an interesting point. Uh, Although it's a, you might be bitten by a snake so has um, uh, uh, hemorrhagic or uh, hemostasis effects, not all of them can give you the, 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 the clinically uh, significant bleed. Uh, some of them get, get unseen. And um, um, the, 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 this activity of the bleeding um, um, might cross over with the necrotic effect, the cytotoxic effect. You get bitten here, there's some necrosis. You have direct effect on the blood vessels and start the oozing. Uh, and as soon as the systemic effect of coagulopathy on the antithrobotic or the antiplatelet aggregation, you start this get, get worse and worse. Uh, in terms of necrotoxicity, not well understood. Uh, but it probably it's related to phospholipase uh, A2 and the metalloproteinases, which has uh, several um, reaching effects, so we're going to discuss briefly in a minute, um, and also the secondary effect. It used to be thought that the necrosis or the local effect is not of a significantly clinical importance, um, but that was, again, a misconception. It has a major devastating effect on the life of the person who's getting bitten by uh, venoms, which has a local uh, necrotic uh, effect, not uh, only from an immediate clinical point of view, where you, you have a fluid shift and you have your hypotension and shock infection, which can be devastating. Um, you end up with severe morbidity and morbidity mortality and for these areas where the most snake information happen, um, the, the, these people are manual labor and any form of disability is a devastating effect on, the fa on them on, and in the, on their family. Uh, um, yeah, so, and as you know, there are several snake species who are uh, linked with local 
uh, injuries, and that's spanned the whole four species that we have. Um, yeah, so the hemorrhaging uh, metalloproteinases, <coughs> uh, SDM, uh, there are four classes, and the effect is they have a wide range of effects, some of them locals and some of them uh, not local, and it, it is in, in, in a way, um, main effect is to immobilize the prey and digest the prey. And another interesting fact is that the viber and uh, uh, the vibers and culprits uh, feed on what they call type 3 prey, which is uh, big and heavy body. So they need an enzyme which can digest the prey. So they have a large, uh, they have prominent SVMPs in their venom. The elapids, they usually tend to uh, uh, feed on elongated lower volume surface to ratio. And for that, they don't need to, uh, a potent uh, SVM to digest the, 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 the prey, so it's not a prominent in, uh, toxin. Um, and we talked about the effect of the CMV. They damage the basic membrane, cause local hemorrhage, shock and secondary effect to ischemic change, and direct and indirect injury. <coughs> um, I think finally the renal toxicity, again, there are some renal toxins um, and it's been proven that there are some renal toxic uh, enzymes. However, from, from anecdotal evidence and from some literature uh, data, uh, the most prevalent is a secondary effect. Uh, because of uh, the, 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 uh, the shock, the, the, the infection, etc. And the pathology, pathology is varied between acute brain necrosis to bilateral cortical necrosis in severe uh, envenomation. Uh, I don't know if we have a Turkish. No, we don't. So, uh, just for interest for the people here, uh, they have in Turkey. You have, they have mainly the, the vibers, I think they have 11 vibers types, and they have the uh, one cobra, more than the uh, cobra. Um, in terms of the vibers, the procoagulants and hemorrhagins, uh, that's, that, that's the main uh, toxins, and their neurotoxic is postsynaptic neurotoxin. <coughs> Just the last couple of slides, just worth to tell. I, uh, this, is, this was not intended for you guys. It was intended for general physician or AR physician. But I just want to tell them not every bite is a wet bite. Not every bite is going to give you information. There's some studies suggest up to 80% uh, of so scale viber uh, envenomations are dry bite. Uh, and that's, there's a lot of various reasons why can that happen. So not every bite has to be given antivenom. And unfortunately for our colleagues from the West, the cultures in the Middle East and here is, uh, you, when a patient comes, you want to do something. And you show the family that you're doing something. And this is a huge impact on the decision making for the doctors. Uh, uh, so when somebody comes with snake, to come to the family and give it to, to teach them, oh, there's a dry bite, there's nothing, we'll wait and see, you are unlikely you're going to get somewhere with that. And if anything happened later on, it's not like you've evidence-based your decision. You made a mistake. And that has an influence to, uh, on decision-making. I was with Patria just recently in the emergency uh, the Society of Emer Emergency Society, the Emirates one? Emirates. Emirates Society of Emergency Medicine. Yeah, we did a track on toxicology and we talked about envenomation. And after that, three people came to me, three doctors who works in the peripheries of the cities, and they told me that they had same same experiences, copycat. Uh, Envenomation, dry, no symptoms, what else, whatsoever, whatsoever, and all three of them they gave them the antivenom. All three of them, and then I asked them, all three of them, and then I asked them, I mean, I just tried to elaborate, and they all say the same. It's, it's a family pressure or something down, down, down that line. So it's a way to go. 
Um, I think we've discussed this. I don't need to dwell about this too much. Anaphylaxis, uh, that's a very important uh, aspect that can happen with any snake inflammations. And the management is, is, is following your SELS. And it is a feature of systemic inflammation and its indication of human antivirals. A topic which Dr. Ashish will uh, talk to us about it. Thank you very much. I'm sure you don't have any questions. I'm sure you don't. just going to kind of sum the slides I'll rapidly skip to through. Uh, touch our life in Southeast Asia every possible way. The worship as God in India. And uh, yesterday was uh, Mahashivratri where you know you worship actually snakes. Right? Source of living for many. Food for many wine and then lots of movies right now currently the number two ranked serial in India is on a snake right and then there is fashion jewels and tattoos and pets and this is me <laughs> much younger uh, much younger yesterday, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and the deadliest animal in the world is human. So, you know, so th this is a person who was a priest in a local temple. Probably had developed immunity because he was maybe bitten again and again and again. But why did the cobra die? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> These slides you've already seen, so I'll not show them again to you. Know about what are the four. These are the major snakes in Southeast Asia. King cobras, white birds, common crate. Uh, this is what I was talking about. This is a hump-nosed viper, which we see. This is Bangaras sindanus, which is mostly common in Pakistan. But in some parts of Rajasthan, you see these snakes. And we don't have venom uh, against uh, them. Now, this is what you were talking about, dry bite. Yes. Do we ever document a dry bite? I have not seen a dry bite till date. What do you mean by dry bite? Is that you have a person who's actually witnessed, bitten by a venomous snake yeah. and does not develop That's any... Correct. any yeah. Since I work in a tertiary care hospital, most of the time people yeah, the reach me when they have something. Mm. So what you were talking about was that people who are practicing in the periphery, that's correct. Yeah. They sh would be seeing most dry bites, and this is a wonderful uh, article. I don't know if you have seen this. No envenomation, no local sign and symptom. That's dry bite. We see this in Europe. You Europe, see it in Europe it because, because I think people go to the events quite, as quite soon common. as they are yes. yes. So we see. Uh, quite so quite so this is this is uh, uh, a review article where they have reviewed the complete literature and say that there could be a natural immunity, there could be absence of venom in the gland at the time, it could be a diseased venom gland. The fangs may be broken. Or there could be a mechanical failure. Or then one of them was, uh, one which is not here, is that maybe the snake misjudged the distance between the victim and has probably already injected it somewhere. And the second time when he bites, it's a dry bite. So uh, what are the problems? Identification, first aid, definitive management, and the supportive treatment. I don't know what happens with you guys. In India, this is the problem. At the time of monsoons, you have these kinds of growth all over. Their burrows get flooded and they come out in big numbers. And they enter your home in search of food. They are not interested in biting you because they can't eat you. You get accidentally bitten because you are in their way, right? So this is, we see 
Majority of our, I'm going to present that in the EAPCC team meeting. Majority of our snake bites are within three months. And that's it. It starts at the onset of monsoon. With the end of monsoon, it's over. And we don't see any snake bite in between. Occasionally... In the tertiary center, but in a periphery, they still see. Uh, I have not uh, any idea because most of the time they are referred to me from the periphery. So if they don't see it there, they won't send it to me. Very occasionally we get some uh, uh, viperine bites or cobra bites in the winter time from the uh, handlers. handlers. Not, not, not general public. General public is monsoon. So that's interesting because we don't. We in Arizona also have monsoon. Yes, yeah. actually call them monsoon, and we don't see a correlation with that. Oh. As a matter of fact, our season starts around mid-March and goes to about October. Whoa. And the peak of activity, snake bite activity, is peak when we see people going outside performing, which is not too hot. And usually people don't go out during the months, monsoons, and right after the monsoons because of humidity. But when it's nice and warm, but not too hot, then they get then they it. Yeah. OK. OK. Now, the first principle is identify your susceptible population. For us, it is males, rural more than urban, workers in the field. Uh, most of the time, in one study from Bavisker, most of the times, the people who are harvesting time, you know, that's where you get bitten. You either get bitten on your left hand, and he showed at one particular, uh, you know, meeting, that he got in an hour's time three women. In, uh, who were harvesting and all of them were bitten on the left because what happens is when you grab the uh, uh, wheat or rice and you want to you know cut it so you end up grabbing the snake. the snake or touching the snake and that's that's why your left hand with the right hand you are kind of so so you need to identify for us for me in uh, in Chandigarh it is this construction site workers most of the times because they have uh, area they are staying in small uh, makeshift rooms and uh, no doors no nothing they're sleeping on the floor and in the monsoon time the snakes also want to come out and be on a dry land and that's the dry area the floor where they are sleeping so that is that is where they get or workers in the forest. We don't have any big forest nearby. Uh, sometimes we get from the forest in the margin victims. And that is occasional victims during uh, the other time. So that's, that's interesting because I just reviewed about 1,000 uh, envenomations, recent envenomation. In the US, it was sexy, it, you know, what I call trash bias gets replicated all the time. And it was the, <laughs> That we had this derogatory seven T seven, you know, testosterone te intoxicated tequila uh, nonsense. Really, that because it was sexy, everybody reproduced it. Yeah. Uh, I looked at our data, and our data shows that these are people who are doing landscaping, golfers, gardeners, mm -hmm. hikers. So ours is also to a large extent people who are doing what I call industrial activity or work activity and then leisure activity. I actually presented that uh, about three years ago uh, at the, was it, uh, it was in Dubai, it was the International Society of uh, Occupational Health had that conference we presented. But in the U.S. the same trash gets recycled and yes. regurgitated all the time. But we, we have a lot of our army in the area uh, which is dealing with, and it's the, if you, if you know the Maoist area, or the right wing area in the eastern part of India, it, it, lots of forests there. And uh, the, the, the terrorists are hiding there, the police and army is behind them. So all three get exposed. So all three the terrorist comes to your hospital? We treat it. The well, we, 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 see, I don't know who you are. Right? If you are here with me as a patient, I have to treat you. You might be a terrorist, I don't, I don't care. Right? They don't have a bandana and say I'm a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now this is, this is again which is very important. I think when you're making a sheet, you should know this, that you need to include comorbidities. You know, most of the time the armies, the, the policemen, they do not, they are active people, they do not have so much comorbidities. Construction site workers, who will work at a construction site? Person who is healthy. A person who's got diabetes, hypertension, you know, coronary artery disease is not going to go and work there. So, but if you have comorbidities, then this is again important, the part between what we looked at, our data, that if you get bitten on the foot or on the hand, versus you get bitten on the ear or on the scalp, you're likely to have more severe inflammation, right? So this is uh, what we uh, realized that near the face, you're likely to have more severe inflammation. Then you have individual sensitivity, the species, and then the secondary infection. What kills most of the patients with viperine bite is not the bite itself. It is renal failure and it's the secondary infection. Uh, principle number two, snake identification is difficult. You try to identify snake whenever it is possible. They run away, they bite at night, so people, they get killed, crushed, so sometimes, but if you have a snake which is brought to your ED, preserve it. Preserve it and send it to a herpetologist or maybe a have picture had, to them. Have you had somebody brought your wife's snake? Yeah, we've got. I, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was this guy who came in, had classical symptoms of envenomation, and said, did you find a snake? No, I didn't. <coughs> He's like, okay, want to? He says, just some itchiness here. He took off his vest and there was the snake there. The live snake in my ED. Why was a small snake crate? And uh, it was chaos. Everyone just <laughs> ran here and there. It's great, the worst snake. Yeah. So clinical toxidromes sometimes do overlap. And venomous is we don't have. Uh, I don't have a venomous. I don't know whether you have a venom no. detection Australia, I don't know if in America they have. In Australia, I think they Australia, they yeah. have venom detection kits. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you why we can't use venom detection kits or very limited use uh, for us in a while. This is uh, uh, general symptoms remain the same. Uh, viperine bites, you may have uh, cardiovascular effects in the form of arrhythmias sometimes. Bleeding clotting disorders have been already talked about. This is the picture which was again shown. Uh, I had a, a picture of a real patient, a video of him, but the thing is my, my laptop crashed, so I can't put that, so I picked up. Now this is sometimes the, one of the manifestations of viperine bites. And it doesn't progress beyond that. Right. So if you have a, a kind of Russell Viper's bite, having neuroparalysis, yes, it does happen, yeah. but it does not, it just goes to ptosis and it does not have very severe respiratory paralysis as compared to the crate and the cobras, which cause very severe respiratory paralysis. Uh, this we have already seen. Uh, this happens with Russell's Viper with us quite a lot. <coughs> this is what we published. I don't know if any one of you have ever read this paper or not. We published it in endocrinology. That in the chronic phase, following a Russell's viper bite, there is something like a Sheehan syndrome, which these people develop. It's initially a hemorrhage, and then they go on to develop these kinds of manifestations. So, uh, uh, we did a study over three years' time, collected all kinds of viper and bites, followed them up, and found that there is a definitive evidence of a pituitary dysfunction. So if you don't have the venom detection kit, if you don't have anything else, how do you identify? What we use is this, paralysis, severe local envenomation is, or, or necrosis is, uh, uh, cobras do quite, uh, cause, cause tissue necrosis and severe local envenomation with descending paralysis. 
this is what I see every day, every day. You know, I, very interesting thing. Uh, I walk into the ED one day, and there's this my resident talking to uh, a family, saying that we can't do anything for this guy. He's brain dead, right? And I start talking to him and say, "What's happening?" He says, "This guy slept at night." In the middle of the night, he wakes up with severe abdominal pain, vomit. And the wife says, maybe you've eaten something you know, which was not telling with your GI tract. So you go back to sleep, gives him something and uh, goes back to sleep, never wakes up in the morning. So this patient had dilated fixed pupils, no doll's eye, cold calorie negative. And they were sending him home. That this guy's brain there. So hold on. Give him anti snake venom, put him on a ventilator, and 96 hours later, he walked out of the emergency. So, a person who was declared brain dead was not brain dead. He was just having severe ocular paralysis. And that's why you were not getting anything which was, his brain was intact. Nothing wrong with his brain. But if he was not given ventilation, he would have died. And it would be hypoxic uh, uh, kind of uh, death. We had one death in hospital in a great bite victim. We ran out of the ventilator, so we were giving them manual ventilation. The person who was doing that fell asleep for two hours and that lady went on to develop severe hypoxic damage of the brain. She was put on ventilator and things like that. She never recovered and she died of complications of ventilation rather than the snake bite itself. But she had suffered, we had an MRI done, she had a definitive evidence of hypoxic brain damage. So, are they bringing you the patients then within a period of time? I'll, I'll come to that. that they're not hypoxic? No, no. <laughs> okay. no. Uh, rhabdomyolysis, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that, talk about that also. Renal failure, rhabdomyolysis, uh, it could be snee snakes, could be Russell's viper, shock, bleeding, coagulopathy, renal failure, and severe swelling, local swelling is. Uh, Viperide and then some amount of neurotoxicity may be there, as I said earlier. This is very important. First aid, what are the guidelines? Hardly any guidelines. This is a, 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 a review article published in Tropical Medicine. It says definitive evidence is this splint, rest, and avoid movements. That's it. Just splint the limb. What, what is a natural reaction if you have somebody running after you? You run. What is the natural reaction if somebody bites you? You want to get away from that place. At, and if you know it is a snake, you want to run as far away as possible. When you start running, that's when the damage starts happening. So you have to splint, rest and avoid movement. Now this is, uh, pressure immobilization is written here, uh, but you have to be very careful. You don't want to very tightly tie a tourniquet. It is just for uh, Colin, uh, in America, it's no-no. Uh, what? The pressure immobilization. Yeah. It's a no-no. No, this is no. no, uh, this, no we, we, we still say, but no tourniquet. It's a position statement. Uh, no tourniquet. Because tourniquets can cause... No, no, even pressure mobilization. This is the Australian one. In America, they have a position statement. Yeah, we don't do it. Because of the local necrosis. Yeah, I talk about that in my... Yeah. So then there are these two new things. Topical uh, nitric oxide inhibitor and trypsin injection locally. But there's, uh, you know, as far as possible, don't do anything in the field, because you don't know what you'll end up with, right? Why I was telling you it is important to involve the hepatologist and know this is the data which has come 
from India from the snake uh, 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 park in Chennai. Now they milk these snakes and they find out how, how much is the maximum amount of venom which is there you know after a week or after a month whenever they milk them. So you find that Indian Cobra it is 60, common crate is 20, Russell's Viper is 63 and saw scale Viper is less. So maximum around 60 milligrams is with Cobra and Viper. Why is that important? It's important because when you want to device your anti-venom properties, you need to know what exactly you want to give and how much maximum. Although the fatal dose is just 12 milligrams and 15 milligrams, mm -hmm. but you want to neutralize what the snake can inject maximally. And that's where your herpetologist will tell you. And then you can decide uh, based on the calculation that how much of venom would 